This is Audible. Harper Collins presents Skullduggery Pleasant Midnight by Derek Landy. Narrated by Kevin Healy. This book is dedicated to Reggie. What is there left to be said about you, my friend? You're smart and yet willfully stupid. You're good looking yet kind of ugly. You've got wonderful hair yet you're always wearing hats. You've saved my life three times now, in contrast to the measly once that I've saved yours, and you've taught me more about Icelandic cuisine than I ever wanted to know. Seriously, dude. How cut? Seriously? But there is something that I've been meaning to tell you for years, but I've never found the right opportunity. Remember that girl, your pen pal, back when we were kids? Remember how you kind of loved her? That was me. Sorry, dude. And from the nothing came the everything. Chapter One The old castle stood dark against the star-filled sky, its tall windows empty, its battlements jutting like teeth. Upon those battlements and indifferent to the cold winds that scoured the mountain tops, stood wretchlings, monstrous things of scabs and sores, whose insides boiled with poisoned blood and decaying meat. Lying on a blanket on a snow-covered perch 809 metres west and 193 metres up, Skullduggery Pleasant put his right eye socket to the scope of his rifle and adjusted the dial. He wriggled slightly, settling deeper into the blanket, then went perfectly still. His gloved finger began to slowly squeeze the trigger, and Valkyrie raised her binoculars, training them on the closest retchling. The gun went off with a loud crack that the wind snatched away, but they were so far from the target that it took a few seconds for the bullet to hit. The retchling jerked slightly and looked down at its chest. A moment later, it started to tremble. The stitches that held it together unravelled, and the wretchling came undone, its body parts falling, its stolen entrails spilling out, and it collapsed on top of itself, a pile of meat steaming in the cold air. Skullduggery moved on to the next target and adjusted the scope once more. You think they feel pain? Valkyrie asked. Skullduggery paused for a moment and looked at her. I'm sorry? The wretchlings, she said. Do you think they feel pain? Not really, he answered, and went back to aiming his rifle. But they have brains, right? Fair enough, they might not be thinking great thoughts, but they do still think. And if they think, they might be able to feel. And if their body can feel physically, can't their minds feel emotionally? Skullduggery fired again. Valkyrie didn't bother looking to see if the bullet hit its target. Of course it did. They do have brains, Skullduggery said. They're stolen from the dead, along with the limbs and the internal organs, and they're twisted and warped and attached to the wretchling like the parts of a machine, because that's what they are. They look alive, but it's all artificial. Are you feeling guilty about what we're doing? No. She watched him acquire his next target. Kind of. They're just like hollow men. He put his eye socket to the scope. But hollow men don't have brains. I don't have a brain. But hollow men can't think. Believe me. The only thing on a wretchling's mind is the messiest way to kill someone. Valkyrie looked through the binoculars. So we kill them first. That's hardly enlightened, is it? We're not killing them, Skullduggery said. These clever little bullets are designed to dismantle, not destroy. He fired, and she watched as the next wretchling was dismantled. Black blood gushed. Skullduggery stood. That's the last of them, he said taking Valkyrie's hand and pulling her to her feet. 
He left the sniper rifle on the blanket and she handed him his hat. It was black, like his three-piece suit, like his shirt and tie. Valkyrie was dressed all in black too, in the armoured clothes made for her years ago by ghastly bespoke and the heavy coat with the fur-lined hood she wore over them. Clouds were moving in from the east, scraping over the jagged peaks of the mountains, blocking out the stars. Below where they stood, the drop disappeared into gloom. The wind nudged Valkyrie, like it wanted to tip her over the edge, send her spinning downwards into the cold emptiness. She felt an almost irresistible urge to take a big step forward. Are you okay? Skullduggery asked. Her face, numb though it was, had gone quite slack. She fixed it into a smile. Peachy, she said, taking off her coat. Let's go. He wrapped an arm round her waist. Are you sure you don't want to try this alone? If I knew I'd be able to fly, no problem, she said. But I told my folks I'd be there for roast dinner, and if I plunge to my death before that, they'll just think it's rude, so... They lifted up and drifted beyond the ledge, the world opening up beneath them. Skullduggery redirected the freezing winds so that not a single hair was disturbed on Valkyrie's head. It was strangely quiet as they flew, surrounded by the howls and shrieks of the mountains, but tucked away from it all. The thought has occurred to me that maybe you'll only start flying when you absolutely need to, Skullduggery said. Do not drop me. Indulge me for a moment. The range of your powers is still largely unknown to us, yes? You can fire lightning from your fingertips. You certainly have destructive potential, and you have the burgeoning psychic abilities of at least a level four sensitive. Plus, you have flown before. Hovering is not flying. I bet if I were to drop you, you'd fly. I'm not sure if I can emphasize this enough, but do not drop me. The prospect of imminent death could release you from the mental barriers that are holding you back. It wouldn't be imminent death, though, would it? You'd catch me. There's no threat there. You'd save me, because saving me is what you do, just like saving you is what I do. The only thing that dropping me would accomplish is to annoy the hell out of me. Skullduggery was quiet for a moment. Do not drop me, Valkyrie repeated. He sighed, and they continued over to the castle, landing beside a pile of wretchling remains. A sudden gust surrounded them with the stench of putrid meat and human waste. It filled Valkyrie's nose and mouth, and she gagged. As Skullduggery sent the foul air away with a wave of his hand, Valkyrie lunged for the battlements, sure she was going to puke over the side. But she swallowed, managed to keep it down. Sometimes I miss having a sense of smell, Skullduggery said. Tonight is not one of those times. Valkyrie spat, wiped her mouth and stayed where she was for a moment to recover. She felt sure that she'd once been told the proper names for the different sections of the battlements, but couldn't for the life of her remember what they were. The wind whipped her hair in front of her face, so she tied it back into a ponytail then took a wooden sphere, roughly the size of a golf ball, from her pocket. She gripped the sphere in both hands and twisted in opposite directions, and a transparent bubble rippled outwards, enveloped her and stabilised. The personal cloaking spheres didn't have nearly the range of their regular-sized versions, but they were just as effective and a lot handier to carry around. Skullduggery took out his own cloaking sphere, did the same, and vanished from her sight. She slipped the sphere back in her pocket and stepped closer to him. Her cloaking bubble mingled with his, and suddenly she could see him again. Sticking by each other's side, they set off down a set of stone steps, a flurry of snow chasing them into the gloom. Skullduggery held up his hand just before they reached the bottom. A tripwire glinted on the final step. Sneaky! Valkyrie said. They jumped the last few steps, 
and the moment before they landed, Skullduggery caught her and kept them hovering off the ground. Pressure plates, he said. Even sneakier. They drifted along the corridor, stopping at the end so that Valkyrie could push open the door. They touched down on the other side, took the next set of stone steps that spiralled downwards, Skullduggery leading the way. Two guards with sickles on their backs stood at the open windows in the next corridor, their heads covered by black helmets. Rippers. It was freezing in here, but they stood with their arms by their sides, as though the cold didn't bother them, keeping watch on the road leading to the castle. Which one do you want? Skullduggery asked. Nodding to the nearest ripper, Valkyrie said, This one in a soft voice, even though she knew that her words wouldn't travel beyond the bubble that surrounded them. Count to ten, Skullduggery responded, and walked away, vanishing from sight. Valkyrie moved up behind the ripper, finished the count, and stepped closer. Out of the corner of her eye, the second ripper disappeared as Skullduggery did the same. She wrapped her right arm round the ripper's throat, grabbed the bicep of her left arm and hooked her hand behind the ripper's helmet. His hands came up, trying to free himself. He put a foot to the wall and pushed out, shoving them both backwards. Valkyrie held on, her head down, her eyes closed. She kicked at his leg and dragged him backwards, laying him on the ground as his struggles weakened. She looked up, watched as the second ripper fell into view. He hit the floor and stayed there. When her ripper was unconscious, she released him and walked to the other end of the corridor. Her cloaking bubble intersected with Skullduggery's, and he appeared before her so suddenly she jumped. Sorry, he said. She waved his apology away. I'm sure I scared you just as much as you scared me. Not really. She took his hat and threw it out of the window, and was totally unsurprised when a moment later it floated in again and settled back on his head. Are you quite finished? he asked, adjusting it slightly. It wouldn't kill you to admit to being a little startled every now and then, she said. I don't get startled, he responded, walking off again. She caught up to him before he left her bubble and fell into step beside him. I anticipate and adjust accordingly. You don't anticipate everything. Of course not. Where would be the fun in that? I'm just saying you shouldn't feel like you have to keep up this unflappable demeanour around me. Has it occurred to you, after all these years together, that I just might not be flappable? Everyone is flappable, Skullduggery. Not me. They came to a door that took them to a tunnel that took them to a room, and in this room they chose an archway that took them to more stairs. Down they went, and down again until the torches in brackets were replaced by bulbs and the steady thrum of power reverberated through the floor. They avoided large groups of rippers, past rooms where white-coated scientists murmured to one another, and kept going until they came to a perspex window overlooking a large laboratory, packed with machines that blinked with volatile energy. Dr. Nye sat on a stool, its back stooped, working on the intricate insides of a rusted device. Nye's thin limbs looked smaller than when Valkyrie had seen it last, when it had towered over her, its head nearly brushing the ceiling. But she wasn't altogether surprised. Krengarians shrank as they got older, and their skin colour tended to lighten. Now it looked, at most, about ten feet tall, and its skin was a delicate ash. It looks old, she murmured. Good. They found the stairs, followed them down, arriving at the double doors that led into Nye's lab. Two rippers stood guard. I've got this one, Valkyrie said, walking towards the ripper on the right. She was halfway there when the cloaking sphere started to vibrate in her pocket. Alarmed, she pulled it out. The two hemispheres were ticking towards each other quickly, much quicker than they should have counting down to the bubble's collapse. She tried to twist them back, then struggled to merely keep them in place. But it was no good. 
the bubble contracted. Chapter 2 Her boots were visible. Valkyrie crouched before either of the rippers caught sight of her. There were sigils on the wall. She could see them now. She recognised one of them, a security sigil that attacked teleporters. She was pretty sure the other one was forcing her cloaking sphere to malfunction. And it contracted again. Not all the way, just enough to reveal the top of her head. Time was running out. Keeping low, she pocketed the sphere and hurried over to the ripper. The bubble contracted again. He heard her footsteps and his hands went to his sickles. Valkyrie pulled her own weapons, shock sticks held in place on her back and launched herself at him. The first stick cracked against his helmet, but he ducked the second, spinning away. Valkyrie's bubble collapsed completely now, as did Skullduggery's, and she glimpsed him throwing fire even as her ripper attacked, sickles blurring. Valkyrie knew the pattern and countered, slipped to the side and struck the ripper's knee, then spun and caught him in the ribs. His clothes absorbed the electrical charge, and he didn't seem to register the pain. He left her an opening, and she fell for it, committing herself to a swing that she regretted instantly. A sickle blade raked across her belly, would have torn her open were it not for her armoured jacket. He kicked at her ankle, swept her leg, and she hit the ground and somersaulted backwards to her feet, defending all the while. His knee thudded into her cheek, and the world tilted. He leaped at her. She dropped the stick in her right hand, and white lightning burst from her fingers, striking him in the chest and blasting him head over heels. He rolled and came up, his jacket smoking. Valkyrie picked up the fallen stick, placed it end to end with the other one. They attached, and she twisted, the staff lengthening, and when the ripper ran at her, she whacked it into his leg, then spun and cracked it against his head. He fell back, and she followed, the staff striking him once, twice, and then a twirling third time. He dropped one of his sickles. She went to finish him off, and he dodged, dodged again, dodged faster than she could strike. He jumped over to the wall and rebounded, flipping over her head. She whirled, but he was too close, and he grabbed the staff and pulled her into a headbutt that would have broken her nose had she not lowered her head. Even so, bright lights flashed, and she felt the staff being wrenched from her grip as she went staggering. The ripper let the staff drop and swung his remaining sickle towards her neck. She raised an arm, her armoured clothes saving her once again, and snatched the weapon away. It fell, clattering against the stones. Valkyrie ducked low and powered forward, grabbing him round the waist. Snarling, she lifted him off his feet and slammed him against the wall, then seized his helmet, searching for the twin releases, and tore it from his head. The ripper fell back, blinking, and she swung the helmet into his jaw and he went down, and she hit him again and again until she figured that was probably enough. She dropped the helmet and got her breath back. You got his helmet off, Skullduggery said, standing over the motionless form of the second ripper. How did you manage that? She shrugged. I adapted accordingly. Come on, we have a doctor's appointment. Chapter 3 She pushed open the double doors and Dr. Nye waved a long-fingered hand. Do not disturb me, it said in that familiar high whisper. I left strict orders not to be... It looked up then, and its small eyes widened, and its wide mouth opened as it got to its feet, the stool crashing to the ground behind it. Skullduggery held his gun low by his hip. The moment you set off an alarm... I will shoot you. I feel we ought to be clear on that from the very beginning. Nye stopped moving backwards and raised its arms. I have no weapons. Up close, Valkyrie could see that the threads that had once sewn Nye's mouth and eyes shut were still there, poking out of its skin. She walked forward. You act like you're not pleased to see us, Doctor. That hurts my feelings. I thought we'd bonded that time you autopsied me. The years have been good to you, 
Skullduggery said, coming round the table. I mean, you've obviously shrunk, but apart from that you look great. How have you been spending your time? The last I heard you'd escaped from Iron Point Jail. Who was it that broke you out? Eliza Scorn? How is Eliza? Valkyrie asked. Any word? I haven't seen Eliza Scorn in years, Nye said. I was not the only one she freed. There were others. But she set you up here, said Skullduggery. You'd lost everything when we imprisoned you. We made sure of it. She helped you. Nye licked its lips. Its tongue was small and pink. She could see the importance of my work. Valkyrie picked up a scalpel and walked over slowly. Excavating the soul, she said. How's that going for you? Found it yet? I believe I have, said Nye. So what next? Now that you've found where it hides, what are you going to do with it? Finding the soul was only the first step. Now I follow it to where it leads. I'm not hurting anyone. I'm not experimenting on anyone. You can search the castle. I have no patience here. No? Valkyrie asked. You don't have anyone strapped to a table somewhere, their rib cage open, their organs on a nearby tray while they look around, hallucinating friends and family come to rescue them? No? Well, I have to say that's an improvement. You're practically reformed. Skullduggery? You're quite sure there is no one being tortured, Doctor? Skullduggery asked. Maybe having their skin peeled off? I heard about one experiment you ran during the war where you decapitated prisoners and then kept their heads alive in jars. Nye backed up. What do you want? You're under arrest, Skullduggery said. You're going back to Iron Point. We'll be sure to request a smaller cell this time, Valkyrie said. Something snug. Or you can make it easy on yourself, Skullduggery said. You can tell us where Abyssinia is. Incredibly, Nye paled even further. Wow, said Valkyrie. Your poker face sucks, dude. That means we get to bypass the bit where you tell us you don't know what we're talking about, and we threaten you and you eventually break, and go straight to the part where you answer our questions. So where is she? I do not know. I'm just going to warn you that we've been looking for Abyssinia for almost seven months. Do you hear me? Seven months, and we haven't found her, or the flying prison she's commandeered, or any of her little anti-sanctuary friends. We're both extremely annoyed about this. Our patience has worn thin, Doctor. When we found out that she paid a visit to this charming castle no less than two days ago, well, I'm not going to lie, I cried a little. Tears of happiness. And when we learned that you were working here... It was like all my birthdays had come at once. Not only do I get to see my old friend Dr. Nye, but Dr. Nye gets to help us in our search and tell us where Abyssinia has gone. I promise you, I do not know. Then why was she here? Skullduggery asked. If, if I tell you, you must let me go. Okay. I think you are lying. Of course I'm lying. You're going back to prison, Doctor. The only choice you've got is the size of your cell. Nye hesitated, then sagged. It was not a thing she was looking for. It was a person. His name is Kaysan. And who is Kaysan? Abyssinia said he is her son. I see... Skullduggery said, taking a moment. Does he work here? Is he a scientist or manual labourer? Nye hesitated. Valkyrie folded her arms. He was a patient, wasn't he? You may not be experimenting on anyone right now, but up until two days ago you were. When I came here, this facility had already been running for decades. Nye said. I was brought in to replace a scientist who had gone missing. 
My instructions were clear. I was to continue the work of my predecessor. On my initial tour, I was shown the room in which Kason was being kept. But I was not the one who worked on him. How long had the experiments been going on for? As far as I am aware, for as long as this facility has been operational. Which is? Sixty years. Valkyrie frowned. He's been experimented on for sixty years. No, said Nye. He was experimented on here for sixty years. I do not know where he was before this. What else do you know about him? Skullduggery asked. Nothing. Experimenting on Kason was not my job. So who did the work? An associate. Dr. Quidnunc. Is he in today? Valkyrie asked. I have not seen him in a week, since Kason was removed from this facility. Kason was removed a week ago, Valkyrie said. So when Abyssinia came for him, he was already gone. Why was he moved? I do not know for certain, said Nye. But I imagine somebody learned that Abyssinia was drawing close, and we were told to evacuate as a result. Kason was the first to be moved. Then why are you still here? I and a handful of other scientists refused to leave. I can only speak for myself, but my work had reached a critical stage, and I could not possibly depart. Abyssinia wouldn't have been happy that her son wasn't here, Skullduggery said. She was not, said Nye. She killed many rippers. Did you tell her where he was moved to? I did not, and do not possess that information. Who took him? I do not know. A small team of people. The owner of this facility sent them. Which brings us back to Eliza Scorn. Nye shook its head. Eliza Scorn does not own this facility. As far as I know, she was merely obeying orders when she delivered me here. Then who's your employer? I am afraid I do not know. You're working for someone and you don't even know who it is. What does it matter? Nye asked. My work is important and needs resources. I do not care who provides them. Valkyrie sighed. <sighs> what about Abyssinia? Did she say anything that could lead us to her? Remember, you really want to make us happy. She provided no such information. Did you tell her about Quidnunc and his experiments? Skullduggery asked. Yes. Did you tell her where she could find the good doctor? I do not know where he is. Then how are you still alive? Skullduggery asked. You don't know anything helpful. You worked in the same facility where her son was being experimented on. Why didn't she kill you, doctor? Because I did to her. The same thing as I am doing to you, Nye responded. And what is that? Delaying you. The shadows converged and twisted, and from the darkness stepped a woman in a black cloak, her face covered by a cloth mask so that only her eyes were visible. Skullduggery raised his gun, and the woman's cloak lashed out, and Skullduggery ducked and fired. The cloak absorbed the bullets and whipped again, slicing through the table to get to him. Skullduggery jerked to the side, his hand filling with flame, but the cloak twisted back, covering him, and when it whipped away, Skullduggery was gone. The woman turned to Valkyrie, but Valkyrie had already moved behind Nye and was buckling its legs. It dropped to its knees and she gripped its throat, keeping her eyes on the newcomer. Have to admit, Valkyrie said, that was pretty cool, even for a necromancer. But if you try anything like that on me, I will fry the stick insect here. The woman in black didn't respond. Her cloak coiled around her. You would not kill me, said Nye, 
its voice a little garbled. Its skin felt oily in her grip. I wouldn't want to kill you, Valkyrie corrected him. I wouldn't want to kill anyone. But if your awesome bodyguard tries to kill me, I'll kill you faster than your beady little eyes can blink. Nye made a small sound, like a laugh. Then it seems that we have reached an impasse. Not at all, said Valkyrie. An impasse implies that we're evenly matched, but we all know that's not true. She glanced at the woman in black. I dabbled with necromancy. Did you know that? Solomon Wreath taught me a few things, so I know that you can shadow walk. That's what you did with Skullduggery, right? But I also know that the range for shadow walking is limited, so he's already on his way back here and he's coming mighty fast. We only have a few seconds before he bursts through these doors, and when that happens, it's not going to be pretty. All I have to do is wait, because time is on my side. But for you, the clock is ticking. Can you hear that? The tick-tock in your head? I am not going back to Iron Point, said Nye. I only have a few years left in my life. I will not spend them in a cell. Whisper. Kill her. Whisper. Wait, Valkyrie said, tightening her grip. Why is it always killing, huh? Why is it always fighting? Why is violence always the default position? Nye held up a hand to whisper, even though the woman had not moved. You offer an alternative. It asked. Give me Quidnunc, and I'll let you go before Skullduggery gets back. I do not know where Quidnunc is, Nye said. But I do know one thing that could possibly lead you to him. Did you tell this one thing to Abyssinia? I did. So we'd be playing catch-up? Yes. Valkyrie considered her options, of which there were none. OK, she said. Deal. Fast. You must release me. I don't trust you enough to release you, Doctor. Then you had better make a decision before the skeleton detective gets here, Miss Kane. Time is ticking away. Valkyrie almost smiled. She took her hand from Nye's throat and stepped back as it stood. It turned, looking down at her, as Whisper came up behind it. Her cloak swirled around them both. Quidnunc suffers from liquefactive necrosis, Nye said, and the shadows convulsed and Valkyrie was left alone. Huh, she said. The doors burst open and Skullduggery stormed in, gun in one hand and fire in the other. Where are they? he demanded. Gone, said Valkyrie. You just missed them. Skullduggery stood there for a moment, then shook the flames from his hand and slipped the gun back under his jacket. That's annoying, he said. Are you OK? She shrugged. Grand. Quidnunc has, um, liquid active necrosis. Do you mean liquefactive necrosis? Let's say that I do. What is it? a form of organic rot that Mevolent had weaponized during the war. That the same thing Tesseract had. So Quidnunc wears a mask like him. Perhaps, Skullduggery said. In any case, he will need the same serums that kept Tesseract alive. And those serums are hard to come by. If we find who makes them, we'll find Quidnunc. Cool! Although Nye told Abyssinia, you know, about the liquid factor thing. Liquefactive necrosis. He told her about that, too. Then we have no time to waste, Skullduggery said, stalking to the door. He spun round. Unless you're hungry. Are you hungry? You haven't eaten since noon. I'm pretty hungry, yeah. Then we'll stop for pizza, Skullduggery said, and marched out. Chapter 4 Education, Omen darkly mused as he examined the test he'd just got back, may not have been the area in which he was destined to excel. While Corrival Academy was indeed a school for sorcerers, 
That didn't mean all the lessons were about throwing fireballs or shooting streams of energy out of your hands, eyes, mouth, although there was a fair bit of that stuff. Mostly it was sitting at desks, reading textbooks and scribbling answers. Pretty much the same experience Omen had had when he'd gone to a mortal school back in Galway. A lot of the time, in fact, things at Carrival were worse. Because there were more subjects to cover, Omen not only had to study history and science, but also mortal history and mortal science, the school day was longer. P.E. wasn't just about combat training and self-defence, as tough as those things could be. It was also about picking a sport and playing it, magic not allowed. Students were taught to be the best sorcerer they could be, but they were also taught how to live, behave and thrive in the mortal world, which meant more work more tests and more opportunities to fall short. Omen folded the test paper, hiding the big red E from view. It wasn't that big a deal. It had been a difficult test. Everyone said so, even the smarter kids. What chance did he have, really, when even the smarter kids were finding it tricky? Sure, they still technically passed, as did just about everyone else in his class, but he wasn't a big believer in grades anyway. He preferred to get his education out there, on the streets, where it mattered. Omen chewed his lip. That said, his parents were probably going to kill him if they found out. He stuffed the test paper down into his bag. That was one of the good things about Carrival being a boarding school, he supposed. Less exposure to disapproving parental figures. Of course, there was a pretty fair chance that they wouldn't actually care about a failed test. Omen had, quite by accident, cultivated a relationship with his folks that depended entirely on their low expectations. He sidled along in the background of their lives while their focus was on his twin brother, Augur, the subject of an actual prophecy, destined to face the king of the Darklands in a battle to save the world. In order to aid him in this battle, Augur had been born strong, fast and smart, not to mention naturally talented, extremely hard-working, courageous, decent, resourceful, charming, funny, tall and good-looking. Because being good-looking was obviously a vital quality in any self-respecting chosen one. Omen had missed out on being the chosen one by virtue of being born second, so he didn't possess any of Augur's attributes. What he did have, however, was a plucky demeanour and a never-say-die attitude. But he didn't really have them, either. Life was one bitter disappointment after another. Sure, there had been glimmers of hope along the way. His best friend was pretty cool for a start. And seven months ago, he'd helped Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane stop an ancient evil from being reborn. Well, sort of. No! He had helped. He had been right there, sharing in the adventure. He'd come away with the bruises to prove it. The problem was that the ancient evil hadn't actually been stopped. Abyssinia, after all, had succeeded in coming back to life. Taking this into account, he supposed that meant he had helped Skullduggery and Valkyrie fail in their mission, which may have explained why they hadn't called on him since. What made things worse was that word of his involvement hadn't spread through the school like he'd expected. A few people knew a little of what happened, but it was as if his fellow students couldn't be bothered to spread cool rumours about him. There were no whispers in the corridor as he passed, no wide-eyed stares, no clusters of girls giggling whenever he smiled. After a brief spell as an adventurer, he was returning to being that insignificant little speck of a boy he'd always been unless he did something about it. His stomach in knots, Omen went over what he was going to say once more in his head. He'd practised this conversation again and again, planning for all possible contingencies. A part of him wondered about the grade he would have got in the test if he'd devoted as much time to it as he had to rehearsing how he'd ask out Axelia looked. But he easily swatted such thoughts from his mind. He had more important things to worry about. Axelia sat in the common room, chatting and laughing with her friends. 
She was so nice, so smart, so pretty. And she had the loveliest accent and the happiest laugh Omen had ever heard. He could have listened to her laugh all day, as weird as that would have been. Omen stood up, took a deep breath and walked over. He bumped into October Klein and mumbled an apology, turned round and went back to his corner. He took another deep breath and another and another. He went lightheaded and collapsed back into his chair. When he felt certain he wasn't going to faint or fall over, he got back to his feet. Focusing on breathing normally, he made his way across the common room without bumping into anyone and was about to open his mouth when a firm hand gripped his elbow and steered him away. Hey, said Augur, all smiles today. How'd you get on in the test? Um, said Omen. Augur nodded, and then, in that casual tone he always used when he was hiding something, said, That's cool, that's cool. Hey, have you seen Mahala around? I saw her right before breakfast, said Omen. Everything all right? Augur's voice dipped. Yeah, yeah, just... When you saw her, did you notice anything different about her? Anything unusual? Like what? Augur shrugged. Like, was she acting any different? Was she talking any different? Did she have glowing green eyes? Did she appear confused? It's funny, said Omen. Out of everything you just said, it was the glowing green eyes thing that stood out. She's kind of... Slightly possessed right now, Ogre said. If you see her again, let me know. Stay away from her, but let me know. You need any help? I could help. No, really, it's fine. I've got case. We'll sort it out. If it gets too much for us, though, I promise I'll give you the nod. Sure, said Omen. That sounds good. Anyway, sorry for interrupting. You looked like you were talking with Axelia. He steered Omen back, depositing him in front of the most beautiful girl in the school and her friends. Hey, girls, he said. Hi, Augur, they chorused. Augur nodded to Omen and walked quickly away, and Omen froze. Axelia looked at him and smiled. Hi, Omen. Hi, he said. His mouth was suddenly so ridiculously dry. Could I talk to you for a moment? He managed to say. Maybe go for a short walk? Axelia's friends widened their eyes, like Omen had just dumped a dead bird at their feet. But Axelia had the grace to keep her smile. Sure, she said. Omen smiled back, and they walked out of the room side by side. This was good. She hadn't yet said the word no, and neither had she laughed at him. If he could keep that going, he was in with a chance. What do you think of all those refugees? She asked as they walked. Yeah, Omen said. Oh, it's really... It really makes you think, doesn't it? Like, who... Who are they? Um, we know who they are. Well, yes, but what I'm asking is, um... You haven't heard about them, have you? I'm not really sure what you're talking about, no. Her beautiful blue eyes widened a little in surprise. You didn't hear about the portal that opened up yesterday, right outside the city walls? It's literally just over the west wall, Omen. It's been on the network all day. It's all anyone is talking about. A portal to where? To the dimension where malevolence still rules? Seriously? How have you missed this? I really don't know. We spent all of last class talking about it. You were there. I was daydreaming. And there are people coming through. Thousands of them. All mortals. Do we know why? They're slaves over there. Wouldn't you want to get away from that if you could? I mean, it's malevolent. Omen nodded. He's pretty bad, all right. Do you think he'll come after them? Axelia hugged herself. I don't want to think about that. 
we got rid of our malevolent. We shouldn't have to deal with someone else's. Anyway, that's all I know. You really should start paying attention in class, Omen. Especially after the result you got in the test. You, um, you know about that? I sit behind you. I saw your mark. Sorry. But I'm not the only one who failed, right? Like, there were a few of us. That was a hard test. Was it? Not for you, maybe, because you're really smart and stuff. But for us ordinary people, it was hard. I'm not that smart. Yes, you are, Omen said. You're dead brainy. She laughed. What did you want to talk about, Omen? They stopped walking. There was no one around. It was all suddenly very still and very quiet. Omen nodded again. He was aware of how much he was nodding. It was a lot. Well, he said, trying his best to keep his head still. In the last few months, um, I'm really glad about how we've become friends. You know, with our little jokes and things. Axelia's brow furrowed a smidge. We have little jokes? Yes, don't we? The little jokes, the little... His mouth was dry again. Jokes? That we have? You don't notice them? I'm afraid not, Omen. His laugh sounded panicked. Uh, that's okay. It's not important. Basically, what I wanted to say was... We're friends, aren't we? Of course. And that's so good, he said both hands covering his heart. It's so good to have friends, real friends, you know? And I I think you're great. I, I think you're funny and smart and, like, so cool. Oh, thank you. You're way cooler than me. No, I'm not. You so are. You're cool too. Well, I'm not, but thank you for saying so. He laughed, and so did she. This was going well. Omen felt the time was right for the part he'd rehearsed in the mirror. I'm really glad you're my friend. That means so much to me, you have no idea. And I don't want to ruin that. I really don't. And what I'm about to say... Well, it's risky. But I couldn't live with myself if I didn't at least try. Axelia nodded. OK. You're probably going to say no, he said veering away from his script. And that's fine. Saying no is absolutely fine. It's expected, actually. I'd be, to be honest, I'd be stunned if you said, you know, yes. So I, I realise that's not going to happen. So please, please don't feel bad. The last thing I want is to make you feel bad. Thank you, Omen. He laughed, even as the pit in his stomach opened wider. <laughs> no problem, he said. But again, I have to... You know, at least try. Of course. So, um, the thing I was wondering was maybe, and not expecting a yes to this at all, in the slightest, but the thing I was wondering was maybe you would, um, like to, you know, yes? His heart burst into fireworks in his chest. Yes, he repeated, laughing. Really? Axelia reached out touched his arm, a look of grave concern on her face. What? No, I was just... I said yes. His laughter died instantly. Right. I didn't say yes, she said. I said yes, you know. Although it may have come out as yes, without a question mark after it. I'm sorry, Omen. English is not my first language. You're really good at it. Thank you. You know so many words. I interrupted you, she said. I'm sorry. Please say what you need to say. Omen chewed his lip and nodded. Uh-huh, he said. Right. Ah. Uh, I think we both know how it's going to go, though, don't we? I think we... I think we do. Probably, Axelia said. We could stop, if you like. 
Omen nodded, doing his best to consider it even though his brain appeared to be broken. Then he shook his head. Actually, I feel I have to try. If I don't at least say the words, then... then it'll be hanging over me. Are you okay with that? Of course. Go ahead. He forced a laugh. <laughs> hey, Axelia, will you go out with me? No, she said sadly. His world crashed down and he said, Yeah, I do like you, she said, and I don't want to say as a friend, but... As a friend, Omen said, and nodded again. That's fine. I expected it, I really did. I hope this doesn't make things weird between us. Does it? Of course not because it means a lot to me that we're friends. I know. It means a lot to me, too. Well, um, I suppose I'll see you around. I suppose so. Axelia smiled, gave his arm a squeeze, and walked away. Omen went round the corner, sat on a bench, and was sad. Chapter 5 they came through, three abreast, the adults laden down with bulging bags and the children clutching raggedy dolls and carved wooden animals. Their footsteps were heavy, their shoulders stooped, their spines curved with exhaustion. They weren't too tired to look scared, however. Their eyes flickered over everything, trying to spot the differences between this reality and theirs but avoided the gaze of Valkyrie or anyone who stood watching. This was a battered people. All they wanted was to stop walking, to lay down their packs, to get some sense of a journey completed. But that wasn't about to happen just yet. As they came through the portal, the doorway sliced from their universe to this one, they were directed to follow a trail of flags to the makeshift town of Tents, that had sprung up along the outside of Roarhaven's west wall. Shrinking away from the grey-suited cleavers on either side, the mortals trudged onwards in a broad, unbroken line. Thirteen thousand and thirty-six hours, Skullduggery said. What are we going to do with them? Valkyrie asked. China wouldn't send them back to their own reality, would she? We send them back and Mevelin's army will either execute them or use them as slaves. Maybe they could stay in Roarhaven. There are plenty of uninhabited districts, loads of empty houses. Roarhaven is a city for sorcerers, Skullduggery said. I don't know how welcoming its citizens would be to mortal families moving in beside them. What's wrong with them moving in? We're supposed to live in peace, aren't we? That's why sanctuaries exist. Roarhaven has a sanctuary. Skullduggery pointed out. It isn't itself a sanctuary. I don't think we have a choice, she said. It's not like we can send them to live in Dublin or London or anything. They're mortals, but they're not like our mortals. They've lived their entire lives in a reality ruled by sorcerers. Skullduggery nodded. It would definitely require a period of adjustment. I think China's going to do the right thing. She knows she has to set an example as the supreme mage, so I reckon she'll hand over all those empty houses to these nice people from Dimension X. That's not what it's called. We can't call it the Leibniz universe. It's boring, and nobody knows who Leibniz is. He was a German philosopher and physicist back in the late 17th... Exactly, said Valkyrie. No one's ever heard of him. And I think I should be the one to name it because I'm the one who discovered it. You didn't discover it. Well, OK, maybe not discovered it, but I found it. It wasn't lost, Valkyrie. It had billions of people living in it. And I found them, too. He shook his head. Silas Nadir shunted you over there. By your rationale, he should be the one naming it. He's a serial killer. He'd pick a stupid name. Temper Frey walked through the portal saw Skullduggery and Valkyrie and immediately started over. One of the cleavers moved to block his way, 
but he flashed his city guard badge and the cleaver backed down. What did you find out? Skullduggery asked. Temper frowned. No hug? Oh, I'm sorry, said Skullduggery. Valkyrie, hug him. I'm hugging him with my mind. You two are weird, Temper said. It's telling that I get back from a twelve-hour trip to an alternate dimension, and you two are the strangest things I've seen all morning. How was your little joint to the mountains, by the way? Meet anyone interesting? And by interesting, I mean anyone tall, green, and ugly. Not quite so tall or so green any more, Valkyrie said. But Nye is still as ugly as I remember. We chatted, yes. We have a lead. A man named Quidnunk. Never heard of him. Neither have we, Skullduggery said. We're hoping once we get to him, he'll lead us to Abyssinia, and then we'll be able to stop her from doing whatever it is she's planning on doing. You still haven't found out what that is, huh? Not even close, Skullduggery said. But I've known her a long time, and whatever her master plan is, it will not be good news for the rest of us. Temper frowned and looked at Valkyrie. Is he damn playing it? I think he's damn playing it. Temper nodded. There's definitely some damn playing going on. Come on, Skullduggery. You had a thing with her. There's no need to be embarrassed. I'm not embarrassed. She's a very good looking lady. You know, once she grew her body back and all. I've always found that ex-girlfriends with bodies are better than ex-girlfriends who are just internal organs locked away in a box somewhere. But I'm old-fashioned like that. Skullduggery sighed. Can we stop talking about this? We can, Temper said. Once you accept that there is no shame in dating a murderous psychic who sucks the life out of people. No shame at all. Thank you, Tamper. There's a bit of shame in losing her to someone like Lord Vile, though. I mean, that dude was evil. Are you finished? Tamper grinned. Not even close. But for right now, yeah, I'm finished. Thank you, said Skullduggery. We just got back into the country a few hours ago, and we were going to follow up on this quidnunk person but decided to take a little detour here instead. Correct me if I'm wrong, Temper, but this portal wasn't here when we left, was it? It was not, Temper said and clapped his hands. Okay then, first things first. That is one messed up reality they have back there. Seriously, why anyone would venture into it, I have no idea. You ventured, Valkyrie said. I'm a city guard now. I have my orders. I heard you volunteered. It's a portal to another dimension, Temper said. What am I not going to go through? Anyway, there are thousands of people lining up on the other side of that thing. More coming every hour. With anyone else, I'd be expecting a stampede, but these folks are just so beaten down, I doubt they could muster the energy to panic. Did you see any of Mevelin's men? Skullduggery asked. Temper shook his head. Not a one. We were told there's a device that's sustaining the portal. Is that true? Temper scratched his jaw. Never seen anything like it. It's a metal box, roughly the size of a car battery, with all these sigils carved into it. I don't know if the device did it all. Or if a shunter opened the rift and this device is just keeping it open, I don't know how it works. And no one knows how to shut it down. But then I guess the sorcerers in the Leibniz universe have gadgets we don't understand yet. We're calling it Dimension X now, Valkyrie told him. No, we're not, Skullduggery said quickly. Have you spoken to the people? Have they said anything about the resistance? They won't talk to me, Temper answered. You gotta understand. These folks are almost as afraid of the resistance as they are a Mevelin's army. 
To them, all sorcerers are super-powered psychopaths who topple buildings onto innocent mortals. Then hopefully we can show them a new, warmer kind of sorcerer, Skullduggery said, as a child dropped her doll. He stepped forward, using the air to lift the doll into his hand, and presented it to the little girl. She looked up at him and screamed, and her parents pulled her away. Sometimes I forget that being a skeleton is unusual, Skullduggery murmured. He tossed the doll to the girl's father and returned to Valkyrie's side. Do you have any idea what the best course of action might be? He asked Temper. For me, the best course of action is a shower and bed, Temper answered. For the situation, I'd send a squadron of cleavers through to make sure the mortals are protected while they wait. I heard stories of bandits closing in. As far as we know, China's not sending any cleavers, said Valkyrie. Temper sighed. Then maybe you could talk to her. She's got a soft spot for you, Val. Everyone knows that. If we could actually get in to speak to her, maybe, Valkyrie replied. But we've been trying to arrange a meeting with China for weeks to discuss our progress, or lack of progress in this Abyssinia situation, and all we hear is how busy she is. Temper chewed his bottom lip for a moment. Those refugees are easy targets. They need someone to keep them safe. He sighed. I guess the shower can wait. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. You're going back through? Looks like it. Can't you send some of your city guard friends through instead? Temper smiled. I've been a raw haven cop for five months, and in that time I have discovered that the city guards are not friendly people. Commander Hawk has changed things since you were in charge, Skullduggery. We report only to him, and he reports only to the Supreme Mage. My colleagues don't trust me, probably because they see me talking to the two of you so regularly. They think you're our spy. Skullduggery said. Yes, they do. Good thing you're our spy, then. It certainly keeps things simple. Temper looked back towards the portal. Either of you want to join me? Valkyrie held up her hands. I have things to do today, and bad memories of that place. Thanks, but I think I'll stay in this dimension. You mentioned bandits, Skullduggery said. Temper nodded. Bands of them. Bands of bandits? That doesn't sound good. It really doesn't. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. Good God, she said. You don't have to ask me for permission to go play with your friends. It's just there are bandits, Skullduggery said. I like bandits. There's no guilt involved when you hit them. When have you ever felt guilty about hitting anyone? Go! Battle bandits, have fun! I'll make a few calls, see if anyone can help us track down the guy who makes Quidnunc's serum. She held out her hand. Keys! Skullduggery tilted his head. Sorry? Car keys, you drove us here, remember? But can't you get a taxi? Back home? That'd cost a fortune. Have Fletcher take you. It's a school day and Fletcher's busy being a teacher. Come on, keys! He hesitated, then handed them over. The Bentley is a special car. I'm not going to crash it. I'm going to make a copy of the key, by the way, just so you know. Drive very slowly, especially round corners and along straight roads. Can you please trust me? I trust you with my life, Skullduggery said. Just not necessarily my car. Chapter 6 Decorum. That's what it was all about. Cadaverous Gant insisted on doing things the way they were supposed to be done. It may have been an old-fashioned philosophy to live by, but it was clear-cut, and he appreciated that kind of simplicity in this world, a world he increasingly disapproved of. When he'd been a young man, he hadn't approved of progressives. When he'd been a professor... 
He hadn't approved of the lackadaisical approach his students took to their studies. When he'd been a serial killer, he hadn't approved of people interrupting the murders of said students. It was why he built his house, after all. A wonderful house in St. Louis, built to his own design by a succession of contractors who didn't know what the others had worked on. Piece by piece, the house had come together, a labyrinth of corridors and traps and doors that opened onto brick walls. The perfect lair for a serial killer. His father had taught him all about the proper way to do things. Here's how to chop down a tree. Here's how to catch and skin your dinner. Here's how to take a beating. And, when his father was gone, it was institutions that had taken over, reinforcing this work ethic, carving him into the man he had become, a man who understood decorum and the proper way to do things. Which brought him to Abyssinia, the princess of the Darklands. Over the past few months, ever since she had been reborn, she had been wearing a variety of flowing robes and elegant dresses, garments that worked well with her delicate features and her long silver hair. Cadaverous had watched, approvingly, as she experimented with styles and fashions, searching for herself in mirrors and in the admiring eyes of her devoted followers. But the dresses and robes, it seemed, had only reminded her of the centuries she had spent as nothing more than a dried-out heart in a little box, so she had abandoned them and gone for something new, a red bodysuit, tighter than necessary and more than a little garish. Cadaverous didn't know where the Darklands were, but he doubted this was appropriate attire for their princess. And that was another thing that annoyed him, this lack of a straight answer. She'd been calling herself that for years, back when she'd been a voice in his head as he lay on that operating table, guiding him back from death, giving him a purpose, a focus. His mortal life had ended with that heart attack, and it had come crumbling down around him with that illegal search warrant, but he had seized the focus her voice had given him right when he'd needed it most. His old life was nothing, his career in academia had been a waste. Those young people he'd killed, mere practice. The sharpening of a blade, the loading of a gun. Preparation for what was to come. The magic that had exploded within him had altered his perceptions in ways no mortal could possibly comprehend. Suddenly his life was so much bigger. He no longer needed his old house of traps and dead ends. Now he could transform the interior of whatever building he owned into whatever environment he could imagine. His newly found magic allowed him to distort reality itself. If only he'd experienced it as a younger man. If only he'd grown up with magic, cultivated it, the possibilities could have been infinite. Who would he have been, he wondered. What would he have become? He would have stayed young, that he knew for certain. The magic would have rejuvenated him. Instead of looking like a seventy-eight-year-old man, he would have looked twenty-two. He would have stayed strong and healthy. His back wouldn't have twisted. His shoulders wouldn't have stooped. He'd still be tall and handsome, and his body wouldn't ache and fail him. The others around him were far older, but looked a third of his age. Razia, the tuxedo-wearing Australian, as beautiful as she was insane. Nero, the arrogant whelp with the bleached hair. Destrier, the little man, fidgeting in his ill-fitting suit. They were all damaged in their way, but the faces they showed to the world hid the worst of it behind unlined skin. For all his irritations, he did appreciate Abyssinia for opening his eyes to a world beyond his old one. The question that weighed heaviest on his mind, though, was why she had taken so long. She stood at the floor-to-ceiling window of Cold Heart Prison's control room, looking down at the tiers of open cells as the convicts, the ones who had elected to stay, huddled in small groups. 
Discontent had been spreading through this floating island like a slow-moving yet incurable virus. It was not an easy thing to keep hundreds of people fed on a daily basis, and it had fallen to cadaverous to somehow deal with the problem. Do you think my little army is plotting against me? Abyssinia asked. Probably, Razia answered. They wouldn't dare, said Nero. That's what I would do, said Abyssinia. I would lead a charge and overthrow the people standing right where we're standing. Then I'd take this flying prison and use it like a pirate ship, plundering whole cities around the world. She sounded almost wistful. We freed them, said Nero. They owe us. And they could have left with the others, but they chose to stay. That shows loyalty. He looked around. Right? Destrier was too busy muttering to himself to reply, and Razia just shrugged. Cadaverous, said Abyssinia. You've been unusually quiet of late. What do you think? He chose his words carefully. I think they are unhappy. Because we have failed to feed them. She didn't mean we, of course. She meant cadaverous. That is undoubtedly part of it, yes. She turned to him. And what is the other part? He could have said anything. He could have demurred. He could have made it easy on himself in a hundred different ways. Instead, he said, When we freed them, we made promises. We promised them purpose. We promised them revenge. We promised them power. We have yet to deliver on any of these things. He didn't mean we, of course. He meant Abyssinia. You think I have been distracted by the search for my son? She said. Before he could respond, the door opened and Skairi and Avatar strode in. Skairi was a slip of a girl, dark-skinned and serious, while Avatar was muscle-bound, handsome and eager to serve. They had emerged from their cells all those months ago, and Cadaverous could see a time in the not-too-distant future when Avatar, in particular, was the one issuing the orders, much like Lethe and Smoke had done, and Cadaverous would have to obey. Again. They held someone between them, a man with blood dripping onto his shirt, his wrists shackled, his magic muted. Avatar and Skairi stepped back as Abyssinia approached. The prisoner narrowed his eyes. They were remarkably piercing eyes. I'll never... Shush, said Abyssinia. Listen to me. I want you to resist. I'm going to enter your mind and find out where you're keeping case on. And I want you to try to stop me. You're one of Seraphina's top people. You'll know how to keep a psychic out of your head. Use all your training. Use all the tricks. Give me a challenge. The prisoner's jaw clenched. It was a remarkably square jaw. You won't get anything from... That's the spirit, Abyssinia said, and the prisoner's face contorted. He clutched his head and let out a whine, his knees buckling. He dropped to the ground, face still stricken, and then, as soon as it began, it was over, and he sagged. My son is in a private ambulance, Abyssinia said. They're keeping him sedated and moving. Right now they are somewhere in Spain. He's accompanied by five of Seraphina's sorcerers. She looked down at the prisoner. You disappoint me. That was far too easy. He shook his head, the colour returning to his face. He murmured something, and Abyssinia hunkered down. Pardon? she said. What was that? He met her eyes. I wasn't ready. Oh, she said, I do apologise. Are you ready now? He cried out, face twisting, hands clutching at his head. You're 314 years old, 
Abyssinia said. You watched your childhood friend die in a freak accident. The smell of tequila makes you physically sick. You've had a song you hate running through your head for the last three days, a song called Uptown Girl. The prisoner gasped and fell forward, and Abyssinia placed her hand on him. Were you ready for me then? She drew the life out of his body, his skin cracking, his bones creaking, and his strength flooded her, and she stood, kicking the empty husk of him to one side. She took a moment, shivered with her eyes closed, and calmed herself. She looked at Avatar. Find this ambulance. Do not act until I say so. Yes, Abyssinia, Avatar said, bowing. She walked back to the window. Cadaverous? She had a task for him. He was surprised. He straightened. Yes. She waved a hand. The body. He frowned. Yes. Get rid of it. Chapter 7 Chicken or fish? The man in the hairnet asked, tongs hovering. Omen pursed his lips, looking closer at the options available. The dining hall was filling up. There was a queue of students waiting behind him. He knew they were getting annoyed, but he couldn't help it. Lunch was one of the most important meals of the day. He had to get it right. What kind of fish is it? Omen asked. The dead kind, said the man in the hairnet. Is it fresh? Does it look fresh? I don't know, said Omen. You've covered it in breadcrumbs. The man in the hairnet shook his head. We didn't do that. It swims around in the ocean like this, covered in breadcrumbs and missing its head. We just catch them and cook them. I, uh, I don't think that's right. I wouldn't lie to you, boy. I'm a food service assistant. We take an oath. Hurry up, said someone in the queue. Yeah, said the man in the hairnet. Hurry up. Make a decision. Short stuff. Fish, chicken, vegetarian or vegan. What's the vegan option? Spiralised Asian quinoa salad. And what's the vegetarian option? Vegetables. Omen's stomach rumbled. I don't really like vegetables. Then it's a good thing you're not a vegetarian. I'll, um... OK, I'll have the chicken. The chicken? After all those questions about the fish. Well, you see, I don't really like fish. Then why did you ask about it? I thought I might try it. Then I changed my mind. You're the reason I hate my job, said the man of the hairnet, and he dumped Omen's lunch onto a tray and handed it over. Next! Omen sat at one of the long tables. Across the hall, Axelia was chatting with her friends. They laughed. He wondered if they were laughing about him. Never joined him at the table, sitting opposite. She had her hair down and she was wearing a hint of makeup that really brought out her eyes. Lunch guy does not like you, she said, digging into her salad. You were in the queue? Omen asked. I'm the one who told you to hurry up. Oh, cheers for that. I made a promise to myself to interact with you in public at least three times a day. I figure it'll make you more popular with people. So I can expect a third interaction this evening. Never took a swig from her bottle of water. This is our third interaction. Me telling you to hurry up was our second. The first one was when I threw that ball of paper at your head this morning. That was you. You should have opened it up. It had a picture inside. A caricature of Mr. Chicane that was quite satirically brilliant, if I do say so. What do you think of him anyway? Omen asked. Chicane? His eyes are a bit too close together, a feature I captured splendidly in my artwork. But he's OK. You don't think he's a bit... off? In what way? Like, he only teaches for a few weeks every year. Because he has a speciality, Never said. He only gives a few modules every couple of terms. I think he's up to something. Never put down her fork. Omen? 
as your only friend, I have no choice but to be the one to tell you, stop. Stop what? Stop this, said Never. Stop looking for bad guys and conspiracies. Yes, Lilt was working for Abyssinia, but that doesn't mean any other member of the faculty is involved. Yet you think there's something about Chicane, just like you thought there was something suspicious about Peckant, and before him it was, what, the ground staff, wasn't it? For the last seven months, you've been searching for an adventure. Omen blushed. No, I haven't. I get it. You were part of something huge. We both were, but it's over. Omen gave a little laugh. No, it's not. Skullduggery said he'll call me when he needs me. Why would he need you? You're 14 and you're not exactly at the top of your class, are you? They don't need us, Omen. That could change at any moment. Yes, said Never. It could. And if it does, awesome. But the problem is that you're waiting for it like it's a sure thing. It's not. Adventure happens to some people. Skullduggery and Valkyrie, your brother. It intrudes upon their lives whether they want it or not. But the rest of us don't live like that. I wish we did. I'd love to be off adventuring with Augur or Skullduggery. Maybe not Valkyrie, because she's responsible for murdering thousands of people, including my brother. Never. You know that was Darkess. I didn't say Valkyrie did the murdering, did I? I just meant she bears some responsibility for her evil dark side going nuts and obliterating a quarter of the city, that's all. Anyway, I admit it, like you, I'm waiting for the call to adventure. But unlike you, I'm not putting everything else on hold while I wait. I'm not putting anything on hold. How did you do on that test yesterday? We got the results back, didn't you? I did fine. Did you? Yes. Did you pass? Almost. And how many assignments have you started? Omen folded his arms. That's a trick question. We haven't been given any assignments. We've been given four, said Never. Oh. Never sighed and leaned forward. I know you, Omen. I look across the room and you're sitting there daydreaming and I know exactly what you're thinking about. No, you don't. It's always the same two things. The first is Axelia looked. Well, obviously. I heard about that, by the way. Tough luck. Yeah. And the second thing you're daydreaming about is Valkyrie kicking the door open and saying she needs your help to save the world. Am I close? Omen said nothing. See? Knew it. That's not going to happen but you want to believe so much that they're going to swoop in and take you away from all the normal stuff that you're not actually doing any of the normal stuff. Omen picked up his knife and fork again and started cutting into his chicken. Can we stop talking about this? I know you mean well, but you're starting to annoy me. I don't want to annoy you, Omen, Never said gently. I don't want to be the serious one in any friendship I have. I really don't. I hate being the serious one. I'm the funny one. I'm the quirky, gender-fluid friend with a heart of gold and abs of steel. You don't have abs. That's only because I don't like to sweat. My point is, I don't want to be the one to give you bad news, but no one else cares enough. They ate in silence. Once they'd finished, never reapplied a little lip gloss. How do I look? Omen sighed. <sighs> Low-key glamorous. This got a smile. That's what I'm going for. Are you mad at me? No, said Omen. You can, you know, tell me whatever you think you need to tell me, just like I can choose to listen to you or choose to ignore you, because we're friends. We are friends, Never said, smiling. But you can't ignore me. Nobody ignores me. I'm way too cool. Yeah, you are. So what do you think about all this Leibniz universe stuff, eh? Isn't it crazy? It is crazy. Omen, do you know what the Leibniz universe is? Not really. It's Mevelin's universe. Well, why don't they call it that? I'd remember it if it was called that. Who's this Leibniz person anyway? Nobody knows. Do you think he'll come through? Mevelent, I mean. 
never brushed a strand of hair away from her eyes. Nah, I don't think so. He can stomp around his own dimension as much as he wants because there's no one there to oppose him. But here, we have a whole world that'd fight back. Yeah, said Omen. Maybe. But you know the way all the wildlife, all the deer and rabbits and squirrels and stuff, run out of the forest when there's a wildfire? What if it's like that? What if the mortals are just trying to get away from what's following along behind? You're worrying over nothing, said Never. We don't know what things are like over there now. All we have are the reports Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane made after they got back. And that was, what, eight years ago? Besides, we already killed our own Mevolent. If the other one shows up, we'll just do the same to him. How exactly? No one knows who or what killed our Mevolent. Skullduggery killed him, Never said, shrugging. Everyone knows that, just because it's not in our textbooks. If Skullduggery killed him, he'd talk about it, said Omen. He talks about everything else. Never sighed. Because you know him so well? I don't claim to know him well. I'm just saying that he wasn't the one to kill Mevolent. It doesn't make any difference. If we get invaded, we'll still send them packing. They have magic, but we have magic and technology. So do they. But we have nukes. Seriously? You'd nuke them? Of course, wouldn't you? I don't know. It's a bit drastic, isn't it? War is a drastic thing, said Never. Ooh, that should be on a bumper sticker. I think I'd keep the nuclear bombs as a last resort, said Omen. We have the scepter of the ancients, don't we? Skullduggery and Valkyrie stole it from Mevelin's dimension too, so using it to push back his army would be... Uh, the word you're looking for is ironic, is it? OK, it'd be ironic. That's a good plan, Omen. Ignoring the fact that no one's been able to even find the scepter since Devastation Day, that's a wonderful plan. Well, like, we have other god-killer weapons. One little nick from the sword and even Mevolent drops dead. The sword's broken. Then the spear! Omen said irritably. Or the bow or the dagger, whatever, it's the... What? Nothing. I'm just quite impressed that you could name all four god killers. Really? Three-year-olds can name the god killers. Yeah, but they're three, Omen. Omen nodded. Because infants are smarter than me. Yep, I get it, that's funny. Never grinned. Feeling overly sensitive today, are we? I wouldn't blame you. Tell you what, I won't tease you again until you really, truly deserve it. I promise. Come on, tell me more about how you'd beat Mevolent. No. Never laughed. Oh, please, I was really enjoying that conversation. Tough. So, you'd use the god killers on him and... Omen shrugged, looked away, happened to glance at the door just as Miss Wicked walked in. Tall, blonde and terrifying, he watched her look around and immediately glanced away when her eyes fell upon him. Oh, God, he said. What's wrong? Never asked. Miss Wicked caught me looking at her. She's coming over, is she? Coming straight for you. Are you joking? Please tell me you're joking. Omen, Miss Wicked said, and Omen yelped and swivelled in his seat. Hello, Miss he said. I mean, I mean, hi. I mean, yes. She looked down at him. Omen, you have been summoned. He blinked. I have? Tomorrow morning, she said. Ten o'clock in the headmaster's office. He paled. But tomorrow is Saturday. It is. But there's no school on a Saturday. The school is still open at weekends, Omen. But there aren't any classes, correct? Which means I shouldn't be coming in, and yet I am. Is... is this because of the test? Why would I be coming in if this was because of a test? No, Omen, this is not about a test. Grand Mage Ispulin of the Bulgarian Sanctuary is visiting Corival Academy, and he has requested that both of us be present when he arrives. Yenin's dad... 
Why would he want me to be there? Yenon has yet to return home. I'm sure the Grand Mage wants to discuss the events that led to his son running away. Um, am I in trouble? I really don't know, Omen. Are you in trouble? Grand Mage Ispulin is probably going to try to have me fired. But why? You didn't do anything wrong. Your vote of confidence will go a long way, I'm sure. Ten o'clock, Omen. Don't be late. I have no truck with tardiness. She walked away. This, Omen thought, was not at all the call to adventure he had been hoping for. Chapter 8 Valkyrie didn't get the headaches anymore. That was one good thing about working on her sensitive side, as Skullduggery liked to call it. The more Valkyrie practised, the easier it got. And she had been practising. But not even Skullduggery knew just how much. She'd been eighteen when her true name had walked away from her, when Dark S had become a separate entity, a person all of her own. When Dark S left, she'd taken Valkyrie's power, leaving her dulled and weak, and once again, mortal. Nature abhors a vacuum, however, and a new kind of magic had rushed in to fill the void. Valkyrie had just turned twenty-five, and they still couldn't explain how she could control that strange energy, or how she could see people's auras, or how she could do all those things and be as sensitive as well. They didn't even know what to call her. She was a one-off, she'd been told, an oddity. In a world of weirdos, she was a freak. She tried not to take it personally. The truth was, her power scared her. She felt it in her blood, twisting in her veins, eager to become whatever she needed it to be. But for all its destructive potential, it also allowed her glimpses into the future a future of darkness and pain that had lodged itself in her thoughts. Sometimes it was all she could think about. Sometimes it was all there was to think about. Death was coming for the people she loved, unless she could learn enough about the future to avoid it. And so here she was again. She pulled up and got out of the Bentley, Standing beside the door to Cassandra's cottage was a piece of Darkess that Darkess had left behind when she'd departed this universe. Tall and strong and dark-haired, physically identical to Valkyrie in every way, she had taken to calling herself Kess. Hey, said Valkyrie. Sorry I'm late. I was in the Alps yesterday, doing a thing. And then we got back this morning to find out that there's this portal that opened up at Roarhaven and... Anyway. Sorry. Have you been waiting long? Only a few hours, Kess said. Well, a day. Seriously? I am so sorry. It's okay. How did you pass the time? Oh, that was easy, Kess said. I was standing over there for a few hours. Then I stood over here. The time flew by. We really need to get you a phone. If you can find one I can hold, I'm all for it. Ah, it's fine. It's not like I have anything better to do with my time. You are literally the only person I have to talk to on this entire planet. I can't interact with anyone else in any meaningful way. I can only do tiny amounts of magic before I fade away and recharge. I'm... I'm bored. Valkyrie smiled. I thought you told me last week that gods didn't get bored. Well, as you took delight in reminding me, I'm not a whole god, am I? I'm a splinter of a god. A fragment of a god. I believe the term I used was crumb of a god. Whatever I am, I get bored, okay? But you're here now, so let's get to it. What do you say? Ready to see the future? Valkyrie sighed. I suppose I am. She took the key from beneath the old pot and led the way into the house. The first time she'd come here after Cassandra died, 
when Skullduggery had wanted to test her burgeoning psychic abilities, she had taken a few minutes to process her feelings about being back at such a warm and welcoming environment. Today, she just walked straight through and took the stairs down to the cellar. This was her seventh time here without Skullduggery, and she had settled into a new, simpler routine. She stood in the middle of the cellar. The floor beneath her feet was little more than an iron lattice, treated with magic to prevent it from heating up when the flames burned through the bed of coals beneath. The walls were brick and reverberated with psychic energy, making Valkyrie's mind vibrate like a tuning fork. The ceiling was crisscrossed with pipes, designed to spray water. Months ago, Valkyrie had had to project her visions onto the clouds of steam that billowed upwards. But she didn't need to do that any more. She closed her eyes, let her thoughts scatter, and worked to find the peace within that chaos. When she found it, the quiet place, she let it grow and expand and fill her up until it pushed the noise away, and, for a moment, for a single blissful moment, there was nothing in the world but her breathing. She opened her eyes. The vision filled the cellar, dissolving its walls, and she was suddenly outside, in the refugee camp, surrounded by the displaced and the scared. She felt their relief at escaping Mevelin's army, but also the rising fear of once again being at the mercy of a society of sorcerers they had no reason to trust. Valkyrie drifted through the camp, alert for any new deviation, but there were no extra details for her to absorb today. Satisfied, she allowed her mind to move on, and the camp vanished and she was in darkness. Here he comes, Kess said from somewhere to her right. They'd taken to calling him the Whistler. He signalled his arrival with a tune. Most of the time it was dream a little dream of me. Twice it was blue moon. Today he was whistling as usual, and for only the second time Valkyrie could see his outline. He was maybe her height, maybe six foot and slender, but that was all she could discern. His outline was solid, but everything within that swirled and flipped too quickly to identify. Bring him closer said Kess. I can't, Valkyrie answered. She took a few steps towards him, but the whistler stayed at the same distance. Out of all the elements in her visions, all the bloodshed and death that was to come, his presence was the thing that unnerved her the most. The vision moved on. You actually think you're going to win, someone said behind her and she turned, and a burning town built itself up around her. Dead bodies littered the streets, car alarms wailed. Augur darkly fell to his knees in front of her, clutching his shoulder. Blood soaked his shirt. Omen ran out, picked him up, his brother gritting his teeth against the pain. Together they hurried on. They were being chased. There were people chasing them. People with guns. Valkyrie moved in. This time she'd see their faces. This time she'd find out who they were so she could stop them before this happened. They came round the corner, guns up, and passed right through her. Dressed in black, wearing body armour. Helmets, no insignias, moving like soldiers or SWAT teams, relentlessly tracking their prey. She watched them spot the Darkly brothers. They opened fire. Bullets punched Omen in the back and he flopped onto the pavement as Augur went stumbling. Valkyrie did her best to ignore it. It was a scene she knew well and it tore at her insides each time. But today she didn't curse or cry out. She just listened. Waited. Waited for one of them to say something. Anything. Target down. The vision swept away and Valkyrie was confronted with the plague doctor who held a child in his arms. Valkyrie stepped closer and the child vanished and the plague doctor's hands went to his mask and he pulled it off. 
but before Valkyrie could see his face, he was gone, and Saracen Rue was lying dead on the ground. There's Tanith, Kess said softly, and Valkyrie turned to watch her friend back away from an unseen enemy, her sword in her hand. Then Tanith was gone, and China was lying in that field of broken glass Valkyrie had seen again and again. Just a flash of that, and then they were standing in the circle in Roar Haven. Smoke and flames billowed from the high sanctuary, and the dark cathedral was in ruins, and marching towards them was an army with Mevolent leading the way. Valkyrie had glimpsed this before, but the vision stayed with Mevolent longer this time. She didn't know what that meant. Was this future more likely now? Was it closer? The army was almost upon her, and her heart hammered in her chest. She looked away, and Cadaverous Gant walked by, holding a rag doll in a blue dress. A house appeared, tall and pointed and radiating darkness, and Cadaverous went into the house and the door stayed open, like it was inviting Valkyrie to follow. Valkyrie started to walk, but Kess pointed. There, she said. A figure was slowly coming into focus on the other side of the room. A woman with silver hair, standing with her head down. Leave, Kess said. Not yet. You have to. There's something about that house. Valkyrie, Kess said. Leave now or she'll see you. Valkyrie hesitated. But she knew she had no choice. She let it go, let it all go, and the house vanished and the vision washed away and the cellar came back. Kess looked at her. You okay? No, said Valkyrie, walking for the stairs. I hate seeing the future. Chapter 9 For a solemn occasion such as an execution, the mood in Cold Heart Prison was something approaching a festival. The convicts lined the tears, eager for the show and struggling to contain themselves. Every so often an excited whisper would drift down to the broad dais that hovered above the energy field. On that dais, the teenage members of First Wave stood in the costumes that Abyssinia had ordered to be made for them, black, with shiny belts and polished boots, to give them the false sense that they were an elite military unit. To Cadaverous, they were scared little children, no matter what they happened to be wearing. He stood with Razia and Destrier and Nero. Beside them, and yet apart, were Avatar and Skairi. Abyssinia's new favourites, the up-and-comers. Cadaverous despised them even more than he despised First Wave. The only member of First Wave not dressed in her finery was the annoying girl with the habit of constantly flicking her hair out of her eyes. Dressed in civilian clothes, she stood on the very edge of the dais, a mere step away from a lethal plunge to the force field below. The bracelet she wore was cheap but solid and needed a key to remove it. It also bound her magic. Please, she said through the tears that were streaming down her face. I just want to go home. Abyssinia stood beside Parthenius' lilt, their heads down, seemingly consumed by disappointment. They didn't answer the girl. That wasn't down to them. That was down to First Wave's leader, the arrogant whelp Yenon Ispulin. He strode forward awkwardly, as if his knees had locked. The bravado that he usually carried with him, even here in Coldheart, surrounded as he was by genuine threats, seemed to be missing at this moment. He was pale and afraid, and he looked as young as he was. Isidora Splendor, he said, his voice trembling slightly. You have been found guilty of betraying your true family. Isidora shook her head. I didn't betray you, I swear. Yenon continued. We are destined for greatness. We have been chosen to change the world. This is the highest honour. Yenon, please. And yet you jeopardise this sacred mission with your cowardice. She turned. I don't want to kill anyone, 
she sobbed. None of us do. Mr. Lilt, please. You're my teacher. Please help me. Lilt shook his head sadly. Abyssinia, Isadora tried. I'm begging you. We don't want to do this, but we're too scared to tell you. Please don't make us. We're only children. We don't want to hurt anyone. Abyssinia looked to the rest of First Wave as they huddled together. Is this true? she asked gently. Have you reconsidered? Have you had second thoughts? We are training you, making you stronger, better, more powerful. Your old classmates would barely recognise you. You have advanced so much. You have evolved. You are my dream made flesh. Her smile faltered. But if this traitor's words are true, if you do indeed see yourselves as only children, you must tell me. Please, I beg you, be honest. Open your hearts. If you doubt me, if you doubt my plan, and you have lost faith in our future together, a future that is on the horizon, now is the time to make this clear. Speak, my loves. It was as if the entire prison held its breath and was silent. Isadora fell to her knees, crying. Abyssinia nodded slowly to Yenon. Continue, my loyal warrior. The boy's chest puffed out ridiculously, and he looked down at his weeping friend. Today you tried to leave, he said. You knew the punishment for that. Isadora shook her head again. I didn't know, she said. We were never told that. Please, give me another chance. This isn't fair. The boy hesitated, then reached down, took Isadora's hands, and pulled her gently to her feet. For a moment, Cadaverous thought he might give her a reprieve. But then he saw Abyssinia close her eyes, and knew she was in Yenon's head. Yenon put his hands to Isadora's shoulders and pushed. And Isadora shrieked and toppled from the dais. The other members of First Wave looked away, covered their mouths, gave little cries of shock, and Yenon stepped backwards, a look of horror on his face. My loves, said Abyssinia, come to me. She spread her arms and they walked to her hesitantly at first, but Cadaverus could feel the waves of empathy Abyssinia was giving out, even from where he stood. When they huddled around her, they were safe and warm, and they belonged, just like he used to. Cadaverus followed Abyssinia back to her quarters. When she saw him, she sighed. Do you mind coming back later? she asked. We just had to execute one of the children. I was there, Cadaverus said. You handled it well. She sat. Thank you. Do you think they'll be ready? Of course, she responded. You're putting an awful lot of faith in a group of scared teenagers, Cadaverus said. You have hundreds of followers now most of whom would be all too eager to engage in some mindless slaughter for you. But it's not mindless, Abyssinia said. There is a point to it all, even if you can't see it. You could help me see it. You could explain it to me. When you're ready, I'll tell you. Is there another reason you're here, Cadaverous? There is. But now that I have you alone, I almost don't know where to begin. He took a breath. We believed in you. We brought you back. And I love you for it. We love you too. I can say that with absolute certainty. Because before you, I didn't know what love was. I knew it as an abstract thing. Something other people said. Something other people felt. But your voice in my head, 
lying on that operating table. That was the voice of love, and I was hearing it for the first time. That's sweet of you to say. You're here because of us, and we're here because of you, because of the mission. The mission, Abyssinia said. Yes. Cadaverous hesitated. Only, only I think the search for your son has distracted you in recent months. The good humour drifted from Abyssinia's face. Do you indeed? I have to be honest with you, Abyssinia. That's what love means, isn't it? Honesty. I feel, since you returned that your focus hasn't been on the mission. I see. The rest of us, the ones who brought you back, we're starting to feel. Yes. Starting to feel what, cadaverous? Neglected. A ghost of a smile. Huh. Like children, I suppose. Everyone's vying for the mother's love, jealous of anyone she dotes on. Is that what you are, cadaverous? Are you a child? Should you be in first wave, too? He didn't answer. What would you prefer? Would you like it if I spent more time with you? Is that it? Would that be enough for you, I wonder? Would that coddle you? Cadaverous bristled. I'm not asking to be coddled. You're not, because it seems like you are. You made promises. She rose. You dare make demands of me, cadaverous Gant. After everything I have given you, after I called you back from death itself, after I gave you purpose, now you want more? You think you deserve more? I think I deserve the truth. Abyssinia was upon him in an instant, pressing him back against the wall, her open hand hovering in front of his face. You insubordinate little nothing, she whispered. You deserve only what I tell you you deserve. You have grown disillusioned with me, have you? Well, I have grown disillusioned with you, cadaverous. You are not the man I hoped for. I have watched you shrivel in these last years, ever since your precious Jeremiah fell from that walkway. Your hatred of Valkyrie Cain has turned you from the path I had set you on. All those murderous urges you gave into when you were mortal. I allowed you to make peace with them, to channel your rage. I calmed the demons in your head so that they no longer control you. And how do you repay me? She stepped away. By doubting me, by questioning me, by betraying me, I have not betrayed you, he snapped. You betray me every day, she shot back. With every disappointment you betray me. You were my loyal soldier, my favourite. Cadaverous snarled. I was never your favourite. Smoke was your favourite. And then Lethe, when he came along. I'm always there, but always pushed to the back by the bright and the new. I should be your second. I should be your lieutenant. Instead, I arranged the food for the convicts and the criminals, while people like Avatar and Scary waltz in and catch your eye. Abyssinia shook her head. Jealousy does not become you, cadaverous. You've kept us in the dark long enough, Abyssinia. We're starting to feel as if we're not on this mission you've told us about. We're starting to feel that you've lied to us. Get out, she said quietly. Chapter 10 Tea and biscuits were already laid out when Sebastian Tau crept into the house through the back door. It was all back doors these days. Back doors and skylights and narrow windows and a lot of sneaking around. Dressed as he was, 
all in black, with the curved beak mask and the wide-brimmed leather hat and the flowing coat. It was difficult to walk down the street, even at this time of night, and not attract curious stares or invitations to fight. Sebastian didn't like to fight. He hated violence. He'd had enough of that growing up. He stepped into the living room. Hello, he said. The small group turned, smiling and nodding. Welcome, plague doctor, said Lily. Cup of tea? They laughed. Sebastian chuckled politely. They knew very well that he couldn't take his mask off. Not that he needed to. His suit provided him with all the sustenance he required, although he eyed the biscuits on display longingly. What he wouldn't give for a taste. But no, he had a mission. Let's hurry this along, Tantalus said, standing up from the floral couch. Some of us have lives to get back to. The others went quiet. Tantalus was the unofficial leader of their little group of Darkess worshippers, primarily because he lacked any identifiable sense of humour. He just seemed like the kind of man people would take orders from, although Sebastian had yet to witness any actual leadership abilities. Tantalus cleared his throat. <clears throat> I hereby call this meeting of the Darkest Society to order. Blessed be her name. Blessed be her name, the others echoed. We have gazed into the face of God and we found love. Sebastian repeated it along with everyone else. All right then, Tantalus said, scowling at Sebastian. Why are we here? Tantalus didn't like Sebastian, and he wasn't shy about letting it show. Sebastian nodded to Forby. Tell them what you told me, he said. Forby, a small man with fantastic hair, cleared his throat. Um, OK, so the portal. The portal that all these Leibniz people are coming through. The mortal portal, I call it. He laughed. <laughs> anyway, I'm on the team. The investigating team. Congratulations, said Bennett. That's pretty high profile. It's good to see you getting recognition in your job. Thank you, said Forby. It's a real boost to my confidence, I have to admit. I've been working at the High Sanctuary since it opened. Before that, I was at the old sanctuary for 18 years. I mean, I've put in the time, you know. i put in the work. It's just really nice to have... Tell me we're not here just to congratulate Forby for doing his job, Tantalus said. We're not, Sebastian assured him. Forby, get to the bit about the box. Tantalus frowned. What box? A device, said Forby. I was part of the team that went through the portal to examine it. I'm fairly certain that the device opened the portal. Tantalus folded his arms. So? If I'm right, and I think I am, once we reverse engineer it, once we figure out how it works, I can use the device to open a portal to wherever Dark S happens to be, and we won't even need a shunter to do it. This is good news, said Lily, her eyes widening. This is great news! Tantalus held up a hand for silence and kept his eyes on Forby. That is good news, I agree. Or it would be if we knew where Dark S is. But we don't, do we? Not yet, said Forby. He glanced at Sebastian and Sebastian stepped forward. We've been talking about this, he said. Tantalus scowled again. Who's we? Forby and me, Sebastian said. And what exactly have you been discussing? Sebastian chose his words carefully. I don't know a whole lot about this stuff, but I do know that while it is possible to track energy signatures through dimensions, to go looking for one, even one as powerful as Darkesses, would be a waste of time. Forby nodded. That's true. But then I asked Forby, Sebastian continued, if it would be easier to track the faceless ones instead, seeing as how there's a whole race of them. Tantalus's eyes narrowed. Why would we want to do that? We all know that Dark Hess left this reality to find a new challenge. Fighting the faceless ones was that challenge. 
the plague doctor posited the idea that Dark Hess might very well still be fighting them. Forby said, so to find them would be to find her. And apparently that's entirely possible. Sebastian paused. We just need some faceless one's blood. Tantalus laughed. Oh, is that all? Well, I'll nip down to the shops, shall I? Anyone want anything else while I'm picking up a jar of faceless one's blood? How are we for milk? I know where there's some blood, Lily said. They all looked at her. There's a scythe in the dark cathedral, she said. I saw it on a tour I took there. They have it sealed off with a bunch of other stuff. The little sign said that it was splattered with the blood of one of the faceless ones that came through at Aaron Moore. Would that do? Sebastian looked back at Forby, who shrugged. I don't see why not, he said. So what are you suggesting? Tantalus asked. That we break into the dark cathedral and steal this scythe right from under their noses? Do you have any idea of the amount of security they have? Do you have any idea what they'll do to us if they catch us? Probably kill us, said Lily. I don't think I should go. No one's going, Tantalus snapped. The only way this wouldn't be a suicide mission is if someone knew a secret way in. Do you? Do any of you? Beneath his mask, Sebastian smiled and raised his hand. Chapter 11 Valkyrie woke and lay there, scrabbling for the last threads of a departing dream. It was almost within her grasp, a normal dream this time, when her thoughts tumbled in, filled her head, sent the dream scattering. She reached for the bottle of water by the bed, found it empty. Her throat was parched. She got up. It was cold. She pulled on her bathrobe, tied it and hugged herself as she unlocked her bedroom door. The landing was dark. Her fingers trailed across the wall, finding the three light switches. She pressed the middle one. The light came on downstairs. Hugging herself again, she went down, narrowing her eyes against the glare until she was used to it. She left the light, walked through the gloom to the kitchen. She could see well enough. Zena raised her head when she stepped in, just to check, and then went back to sleep. Valkyrie smiled at her, opened the fridge as quietly as possible, took a bottle of water and turned to go. Abyssinia stood watching her. Valkyrie yelled in shock and dropped the water, white lightning crackling around her fingertips. Zena leaped up, barking, came running over, ignoring Abyssinia entirely to sniff at Valkyrie's legs, tail wagging with sudden excitement. Abyssinia looked away, her mouth moving, holding a conversation Valkyrie couldn't hear with somebody she couldn't see. Valkyrie let the energy die. Abyssinia was looking down, not at Valkyrie at all. Valkyrie was seeing her, but she wasn't seeing Valkyrie. She started to fade. In seconds, she was gone. Valkyrie slid down to the floor, her back against the fridge. Zena came and sat beside her, then laid her head across Valkyrie's lap. Her fur was warm and soft and reassuring. Good girl. Valkyrie whispered. Everything's going to be all right. Good girl. She reached for the bottle of water and took a swig. She stayed like that until the sun came up. Chapter 12 Omen was a morning person. He didn't like getting out of bed, but when he did, he was invariably bright and optimistic. Mornings, he often thought, were bursting with potential. Every morning was the start of what could become the best day ever. True, the brightness tended to dull a little once the day began to beat him down, and his optimism never lasted that long when faced with the disappointment that came with being who he was, but that didn't change how much he liked mornings. Especially a Saturday morning, when half of the students went home for the weekend and the other half chatted and hung out and bonded as people he imagined. 
This Saturday, however, was determined to squish him before he'd even had his breakfast. His roommates had snored. This was not unusual. What was unusual was the sheer determination they displayed, as if they were working together to deny him sleep. From then on, it was one minor catastrophe after another. He dropped his toothbrush in the toilet. His phone hadn't charged. Grendel cast sneezed on his breakfast. And now here he was, sitting outside the principal's office. Filament Sclavy walked by, then stopped and turned round. He sat down next to Omen. I erred, he said. Erred what? Omen asked, even though he knew. You asked out Axelia looked, and Axelia looked said no. Ah, said Omen. That's what you heard. I'm surprised people care enough to gossip. People gossip even when they don't care, said Filament. It's what people do. So how are you? How is your art? Is it broken? No, said Omen. It's ever so slightly dinged. It's fine. I'm fine. Filament looked at him. You don't have to be brave in front of me, Omen. I'm not, I swear. Filament patted his arm. I can see that you are fighting back at the tears. I'm really not, though. Filament smiled sadly. Then why is your lower lip a-quivering? I think that's just what it does. You know what? You should ask her again. You think she's changed her mind? Not yet, but she might if you pursue her. Have you never seen a romantic comedy? Have you never seen the nerd get to the hot girl? How does he do it? He proves himself worthy of her affection. He devotes himself to wooing her. Am I the nerd? Well, you're certainly not the hot girl. Omen laughed a little. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. My sisters. I grew up with the sisters. They love the romantic comedies. Have you seen Ten Things I Ate About You? Eat Ledger pursues a Julia Stiles. You should sing to Axelia during a morning assembly. That's a terrifically bad idea. A Partridge family song, maybe. I'm not sure who they are. They were a musical group. One of my older sisters, she loved David Cassidy when she was a teenager. David Cassidy was in the Partridge family. According to my sister, he was the main Partridge. Did they have costumes or... I don't know if they dressed up as Partridges. I just know the David Cassidy song. But you can't do that song. That was used in the movie. You want another one. A song that may once have been cheesy, but now is sort of cool. I don't think I'm going to sing to her, though. That's a pity, said Filament. It would work. I'm sure of it. But there are other ways to woo a lady. Send flowers every day. Write her poems. Or appear at her door one evening with cue cards professing your love. Is that wooing, though? Or is it, you know, stalking? Filament frowned. How can it be stalking? It's for a love. I get that. I do. But everything you've just mentioned sounds a little like harassment. I'd really prefer to be the guy who, you know, is rejected and then is kind of cool about it. I don't want her to regret knowing me. That's basically what I'm trying to say. I don't want to be the bad guy or, or the guy who can't take the hint, you know? Filament didn't respond. Filament? Your words have made me sad, Filament said. Oh, all of those romantic comedies I watched. It's fine for movies. No, said Filament. No, I shall never watch another. From here on out, it will be horror movies and only horror movies. Not even the musicals. Musicals are okay. Maybe one or two musicals, like Grease. Grease is funny. It was nice talking to you, Omen, even if you did make me sad. I'm really sorry about that. I will try to be as brave as you. I'm not being brave, though. Miss Wicked approached. Filament, she said. It's a Saturday morning. Do something better with it than sitting outside the principal's office. 
Yes, miss, Philemon said and hurried away. Miss Wiggett frowned at Omen. It's ten o'clock. Why are you out here? I, um, I haven't been told to go in. Our appointment is for ten, she responded, striding to the door. We go in at ten. She walked in, and Omen hopped up and hurried after her. He'd never been in Principal Rubik's office before. He was immediately struck by the number of books on the shelves and the huge window behind the desk. Rubik himself sat at his desk, an elderly man with a face that longed for a beard it didn't have. Standing before him was a tall man with dark hair, swept back off a high forehead, a man who looked just like his son. Ah, Miss Wicked, Omen, said Rubik, waving them in. I was just about to call for you. Of course you will both recognise Grand Mage Ispolin here from the Bulgarian Sanctuary. The Grand Mage is very naturally concerned about Yenin's well-being. It's been seven months, Ispolin said, and nothing has been done. His accent, like that of so many sorcerers, was both distinct and soft, the result of hundreds of years of living. My son remains missing and this woman is still teaching at this school. I'm here to demand answers. Of course, Rubik said, of course, your concern is understandable. For seven months I have been met with nothing but excuses from the high sanctuary. Rubik nodded sadly. Investigations of this nature do, unfortunately, tend to take a lot of time, Grand Mage. I am aware of the amount of time investigations take, Ispolin said slowly. What I am interested in learning is why this woman is still employed here. I believe you know my name, Miss Wicked said. Ispolin looked up. What? My name, she said. I believe you know it. Please use it. Every time you say this woman, I look around, wondering who you're talking about. I am here, I gather, because of the altercation outside the boys' dormitories. Is that right? That's right, Ispolin said. When you attacked Yenin? Is this the type of teacher you have here, Mr. Rubik? One who goes around assaulting your students? Omen cleared his throat to speak, but could only croak. Ispolin glared at him. Yes. You have something to contribute? I am sure Omen was about to remind you that the altercation began when your son attacked him, said Miss Wicked. Ispolin sneered. So he claims. Now, now, said Rubik. We have no reason to doubt Mr. Darkley's version of events. Yannon attacked me, Omen whispered. Ispolin folded his arms. And I say that you are a liar. Omen flushed red. Look at his face, Ispolin said. Only the guilty blush. Nonsense, said Miss Wicked. Omen blushes at the mention of his own name. Please don't make my student feel any more uncomfortable than he already does, Grand Mage Ispolin. Blushing means nothing, and Omen is not a liar. How can you be so sure? Ispolin fired back. His brother is the chosen one, isn't he? Yenon told me all about him, and from where I stand, this is a boy who has been starved of attention his entire life. His brother is the one people know. His brother is the one people remember. But this boy here is so desperate for a moment in the spotlight that he has fabricated this entire story. I didn't, Omen said, shaking his head. You're a liar! Grand Mage, Rubik said, rising slightly in his chair. I must ask you to calm yourself. I want him expelled. Rubik frowned and sat back again. I, Grand Mage, I cannot do that. I want him expelled and I want her fired. Grand Mage, please. Miss Wicked adjusted the sleeve of her blouse. Are we done with this nonsense? Rubik held up a hand. Just a moment. Miss Wicked ignored him and focused on Ispolin. I walked by and found Yenon choking the life out of Omen. I intervened. Yenon proceeded to physically attack me. I restrained him. 
You nearly broke his arm. It could have been far, far worse. Headmaster, you realise this, do you not? I could have hurt Yenon far, far worse than I did. <sighs> of course, Rubik sighed. In which case, I restrained him with an admirable amount of, dare I say it, restraint, for which I should be thanked. Of course, I don't do this for the thanks. I do this for the love of teaching, of moulding young minds. If this happened the way you say it happened, said Ispulin, then you won't mind the sensitive verifying it to be the truth. Miss Wicked smiled. No sensitive is going to poke around inside my head, Grand Mage. You are just going to have to take my word for it, as an educator. I'm afraid I can't do that. I'm afraid you don't actually have a choice said Rubik. Miss Wicked has been before a review board, and we have cleared her of any wrongdoing. Grand Mage, we have taken this meeting with you as a courtesy, but please don't be under any illusion that you have any sort of jurisdiction here. Ispelin glowered, and Rubik turned to Omen and Miss Wicked. Thank you both for coming. Miss Wicked gave a curt nod and led the way to the door. Not the boy, said Ispelin. Omen turned. She can leave, but I haven't finished with the boy. Omen looked to Miss Wicked for help, but her face was impassive. Very well, said Rubik, sighing. Omen, stay behind a moment, would you? I will take my leave of you, said Miss Wicked, opening the door. But as I had foreseen something like this occurring, I have arranged for someone to come in and speak on the boy's behalf. She left, and Omen frowned. Then he heard footsteps, familiar footsteps. They entered the room with a flourish, Emmeline Darkly and Caddock Sirocco, grand and good-looking and imperious. The room seemed to shrink around them, like a lens being refocused. Rubik stood up quickly, and even Ispolin diminished slightly in their presence. Hi, Mum, said Omen. Hi, Dad. His mother threw him a sharp glance, but his father was too busy looking furious to acknowledge him. We were listening, Caddock said, turning his gaze on the Grand Mage. So you haven't finished with the boy, have you? The boy? Ispolin bristled. I have a legitimate grievance to. The boy is our son, Emmeline cut in. The boy is a darkly and his brother is destined to save the world. You should be thanking him. You should be thanking us for our very existence. Instead, Caddock said, we find ourselves being dragged from our commitments at the weekend to defend our son for what exactly? For surviving your son's attempt to murder him? How dare you? How dare we? Emmeline shot back. How dare we what? How dare we side with the truth? Yenon did not attack anyone. Yenon is part of the first wave, Emmeline said. That's what they're calling themselves now, is it not? This little group of terrorists formed here at the Academy by Parthenius Lilt. The headmaster has enough questions to answer about how he allowed this man to teach here, how he allowed this rot to fester in his own school, and they are questions that he will answer. But today, Mr. Ispolin, we are focusing on you and your son. Ispolin smoothed down his tie, though it looked perfectly smooth from where Omen was standing. Yenon is easily led. His friends pressured him into joining. It's this teacher, this Lilt, who is responsible for what happened. I don't think you're giving Yenon enough credit, Caddock said. Everything we've heard indicates that he's a natural leader, and now he's with this Abyssinia person in a flying prison populated by convicts and criminals. He's the enemy, Mr. Ispolin. We didn't do that to him. Our son didn't do that to him. He did that to himself. Ispolin glared. It's Grand Mage, he said. Grand Mage Ispolin. You will refer to me as such. Emmeline observed him with a sneer on her lips and turned to Rubik. I presume we are done here, Mr. Rubik. It was not a question. Uh, of course, Rubik said, nodding quickly. 
Thank you for coming in. Omen, would you see your parents to the gate? There's a good lad. Chapter 13 I'm sorry about that, Omen said to his parents as they walked away from Rubik's office. I know how busy you are. We are very busy, said Emmeline, examining everything that they passed. Please tell that teacher not to call on us again. I will, said Omen, though he knew he wouldn't. Where's Augur? Caddock asked. We were hoping to see him before we left. I'm not sure, Omen said. I can pass on a message if you like. We don't have a message, said Emmeline. We just wanted to see him. Never mind. I could show you around, Omen suggested brightly. If you have time, like, if you're not rushing back. We are rushing back, Caddock said. Oh, OK. I I'll walk you out then. They walked on, Caddock a few steps in front. Silence descended. How are your classes going? His mother asked eventually. Good, Omen responded. He wondered for a moment if they'd heard about his failed test. But no. His parents were formidable people, but they weren't omnipotent. Really good. They're all going well, even maths. And I'm terrible at maths. Are you? Um, uh, yes. I've always been terrible at maths, remember? Uh, of course, Emmeline said in a tone that let Omen know she didn't. Not at all. And that's going well for you, is it? Yeah, I mean, I still don't understand most of it, but I don't think that's too important. Caddock looked back. You don't think understanding maths is important? Omen shrugged. Not really. As long as the numbers fit, that's the only thing that matters, isn't it? Caddock sighed irritably, a sound Omen knew only too well. <sighs> Understanding a subject enables you to master the subject. What you're doing is skating along the surface of your education, Omen. It's time you committed. It's time you took it seriously. OK, Omen said quietly. Augur takes his studies seriously, Caddock continued. Wouldn't you like to be like that? I suppose. There you go again, humming and hawing. You've got to be more decisive. You can't go through your life like this. Be definite. Do something. Commit to something. I'll try. Caddock turned, and Omen had to stop quickly to avoid bumping into him. You're not listening to me at all, are you? I am. You're hearing me. You're just not listening to me. I'm going to be late. Emmeline said, glancing at her watch. Omen, do something with your life, will you? Augur volunteers for things. He gets involved in extracurricular activities. He puts the work in at school, but he also has so many outside interests. Be more like that. Now, we have to go. OK, said Omen, watching them walk on without him. Then they turned a corner and they were gone. And, as usual... He was left feeling curiously empty. He didn't know what to do, so he went walking. He should have been used to it by now, his parents' ability to rob him of himself. In the same way that Ispulin had seemed diminished around them, Omen became lesser in their presence. Smaller, even more insignificant. He wished it had gone on longer, their defence of him. Even though he knew their outrage was actually about Ispulin's assault on the family name, he had enjoyed listening to their words. It had almost been like they cared. It had almost been like they approved of him. But of course they didn't. Their approval was reserved solely for Augur, who, Omen admitted, more than deserved it. Not for the first time, though. He wondered what he'd be like as a person if he'd had his parents' approval. Would he be more confident? Would he be more popular? Would he be more daring? Miss Gnosis was setting up a table outside the dining hall, a table with a blank clipboard resting on it. He liked Miss Gnosis. She'd made him rethink his attitude towards necromancers. Sure, her discipline was death magic, and she wore black like all necromancers, but she was bright and fun and a really good teacher. 
Plus, she had red hair and she was in her twenties, and she still had her strong Scottish accent. Good morning, omen, she said. She pursed her lips and turned her head slightly, looking at him from a new angle. Everything okay? You look a little down in the dumps. I'm fine. I, I was just... No, I'm fine. I heard about Axelia. Seriously, said Omen. Even the teachers have heard. Staff rooms are sad places, unless we have something to gossip about. Guys like you, Omen, they get the girls later in life. You just wait till you hit your twenties. He blushed and tried to hide his smile by nodding to the clipboard. What's this about? Miss Gnosis held it out. We're collecting food and blankets for the Leibniz refugees. Would you like to sign up? We're going down to the camp on Monday to distribute whatever we've got, and we need all the help we can get. You interested? Would, uh, would this count as, like, an extracurricular activity? It's practically the definition of the word. And signing up for it, that would be a commitment, wouldn't it? It certainly would. Yes, said Omen, and paused. Then he said, yes, again, more forcefully. Good man, said Miss Gnosis. I'll do it. All right, then. I'll help. I have to tell you, Omen, this sounds like it's a bigger deal to you than it is to me. Put your name down there like a good lad, and I'll explain what you'll have to do. Chapter 14 Valkyrie was curled up on the couch with Xena, watching Saturday evening TV, when she saw Skullduggery drop slowly from the sky and land outside the window. She moved the dog to one side and got up, padded on bare feet to the hall, and opened the door. Skullduggery's jacket had bullet holes in it. You look like you've had fun, she said, leaning against the door jam. I punched many bandits, Skullduggery responded. Amber did too, but I punched more. Not that it was a competition, but if it had been, I'd have won. Well, I'm proud of you for winning what wasn't a competition. Have all the refugees passed through the portal? Not even close. By the time we were returning, there were perhaps two thousand waiting to go through, with plenty more arriving every few minutes. China finally sent in a battalion of cleavers to offer protection. Well, that was nice of her, said Valkyrie. Any sign of Mevelin's army? Not so far. Well, you know, be grateful for small mercies, or whatever it is that people say. Also, have you seen your jacket? Ah, he said. Yes, most unfortunate. Do you even have anyone to fix it any more? Of course. Ghastly wasn't the only tailor in town. Just the best. I see, by the way, that the Bentley is in one piece. Naturally, said Valkyrie, taking the car keys from the side table and handing them over. When I borrow something, I return it in pristine condition, and I am shocked that you would ever doubt me. I never doubt you, he replied, and handed her a key in return. She raised an eyebrow. What's this? A spare he said, for the Bentley, in case I ever lose my own. You're giving me a key to your car? Just to mind. Does this mean we're now sharing the Bentley? Skullduggery stiffened. Dear me, no, not in the slightest. She clutched the key to her chest. You mean I now own the Bentley? You're giving her to me? Okay, I'm changing my mind about this whole thing he said, and reached for the key. No, take back, sees, said Valkyrie, and shut the door. Chapter 15 The President of the United States was in a bad, bad mood. Martin Maynard Flannery had been elected fair and square, and try as they might, the leftist losers and the liberal media couldn't take that away from him. His presidency was beyond legitimate. 
He had won the Electoral College on a scale no one had ever seen before or even dreamed possible. Yet he had done it because he was smarter than everyone else, shrewder than everyone else and smarter than everyone else. He was a winner. I'm a winner, he said to the Oval Office. But the Oval Office didn't respond. There was a knock on one of the doors. Not now, he called out. Beyond that door was a line of people, all with demands on his time, with reports and briefings and files and folders that would clutter up his perfectly bare desk. He didn't want to let them in. He could feel them hovering out there, full of nervous energy that would get under his skin. Even thinking about it made him uncomfortable. Flannery stood, went to the window, stared out through the bulletproof glass. From here, he could see the Secret Service agents, sworn to protect him, trained to give their lives for his. But would they? Would they die to protect him? He narrowed his eyes. He couldn't trust them to do what they'd sworn to do. If his time as president had taught him anything, it was that he couldn't trust anyone. He had enemies everywhere. There was a knock on the other door, and before he could order them to go away, the door opened and Wilkes slipped in. I'm not to be disturbed, Flannery snapped. Oh, said Wilkes, freezing in mid-step. He looked around, eyes flicking to the empty desk. What? What are you doing? Rage boiled. You don't ask me questions, Flannery snarled. No, sir, said Wilkes, immediately wilting. Sorry, sir. Flannery gripped the back of his chair. I'm thinking, he said. I'm planning. I'm deciding. I'm doing many things. Yes, sir, said Wilkes. Um, I've received requests from a few members of staff. They really need to speak to you on some pretty urgent matters. It was pitiful the way he stood there, riddled with weakness. Flannery hated weakness. He hated Wilkes. Have you handled the witch? Flannery asked. Wilkes winced. He didn't like talking about the witch in the Oval Office. He'd even proposed they use code words. Flannery enjoyed seeing him squirm. Uh, she is under control, yes, sir. How can we be sure she won't refuse my orders again? I, uh, I made it very clear what the repercussions would be. What did you say? I, uh, relayed, uh, what we had discussed in, uh, Flannery blurted. I relayed what we, uh, the, the. Why can't you just answer the question, eh? Why can't you do that? What did you tell her? Wilkes swallowed. Uh, I, I told Magenta that if she ever disobeyed your orders again, she'd never see her family. And what did she say? She... She started crying, Mr. President. She apologized and said she would do as she was told in future. Flannery pursed his lips. She cried, did she? Yes, sir. He smiled. I'd have liked to have seen that. I bet that was something to see, this high and mighty witch reduced to tears. Was she on her knees when she was crying? Um, no, sir. Next time, make sure she's on her knees. Uh, yes, sir. Flannery sat behind his desk again. I want you to call Abyssinia, he said. Tell her I've decided to move up the operation. Wilkes went pale. Sir? Flannery pretended not to notice his shock. The mainstream media are producing more fake polls saying I'm the most unpopular president in history. They're turning the people against me, Wilkes. The people love you, sir. I know that, Flannery snapped, his anger rising again. But they're being lied to. They're being misled. We need to do something to unite the country behind me. So move up the operation. Wilkes hesitated, and Flannery glared. Well? Mr. President, Wilkes said, that might not be possible. Uh, the plan is... is delicate, sir. 
we have to get our people in place, and Abyssinia has to get her people in place, and the, the timing has to be just right. They're calling me the most unpopular president in history, and you want me to wait on timing? Sir, Abyssinia's plan requires... Flannery leaped up, and Wilkes flinched. Abyssinia's plan? Flannery roared. Abyssinia's? This is my plan. I'm the one who thought it up. I'm the genius here. She's nothing but another witch. What do we do with witches, Wilkes? What do we do with them? We make them get on their knees and weep. Isn't that right? Yes. Yes, sir. And then what do we do with them? I'm... I don't know. We burn them, Wilkes. We burn the witches. Yes, sir. The same goes for the freaks and weirdos and sorcerers and whatever else they're called. They're all going to burn, Wilkes. And when they do, the entire country will stand behind me and they'll shout my name and they will love me. Yes, sir. Wilkes wouldn't meet Flannery's eyes. Chapter 16 The fifteen-minute drive to Haggard took over twenty minutes. Valkyrie decided on the scenic route, right along the coast, the road clinging to the shoreline like the hem of a dress. There was a boat on the water, somebody parasailing. It looked fun. She could have driven for hours, but Haggard reached for her, pulled her in, and no matter how slow she went, her childhood home drew closer until she was suddenly parked outside. She turned off the engine and took a breath. She was excited to see her family. She wanted to see them. But there was a part of her that crouched in the shadows of her mind, and that part whispered to her, telling her to turn round, to leave them in peace. They'd be happier without her, it said. They'd be happier if she left them alone. Safer. She'd killed her own sister, after all, just so that she could use a weapon. It didn't really matter that she'd resuscitated her immediately afterwards. What kind of person, the voice whispered, could bring themselves to do that to someone they loved? Valkyrie got out of the car, slammed the door shut. She wasn't going to let the voice win today. She wasn't going to let all those bad feelings come crashing down on her, like they had so many times in the past. She was getting better, she walked up to the front door and paused, immersed in a feeling she still hadn't become familiar with. This was her home, and yet it wasn't. Her childhood lived here. The young girl called Stephanie Edgley lived here. This was where she'd watched TV and read her books and done her homework. This is where she'd listened to her mum and dad crack jokes and riff off each other. This was where her little sister hurtled around the place. This was the house where Normal lived. She walked in. The house was warm and smelled of good food cooking. She went immediately to the kitchen. Her mum was chopping carrots, her back to her. Valkyrie opened her mouth to say something and realised she didn't know what that something should be. She waited for the chopping to stop. Then she just said, Hey, yeah. Her mum looked round, and a smile broke out, and she hurried over. Sweetheart, she said, wrapping Valkyrie in her arms. Valkyrie spent so long trying to figure out how much pressure to apply to her own hug that it was over before she'd really committed to it. Do you want a cup of tea? Her mother asked. Sit down, I'll put the kettle on. Valkyrie nodded and smiled as her mum busied herself with the mechanics of tea-making. The kitchen looked exactly the same, apart from the refrigerator. The refrigerator was different. You got a new fridge, Valkyrie said. Hmm? Oh, yes. Well, three or four years ago. Didn't you see it when you were here for your birthday? I don't think I came into the kitchen. Oh, well, there it is. The sort of new fridge. Now, dinner won't be ready for about a half hour or so. Are you hungry? I think we have some biscuits, unless your father ate them. I'm OK. You sure? They're chocolate chip. I'm fine. The front door opened and closed. 
There's a strange car parked outside, came her father's voice. We should be on the lookout for odd people acting oddly in the neighbourhood. He walked in, grinning. Hi, Dad, said Valkyrie. Hello, oddball, her father replied, coming over to give her a hug. Good God, it's like hugging a statue. Melissa, you gotta try this. We've already hugged. It's like hugging a statue. Yes, dear. Obviously a statue that I love very much, and a wonderful statue full of life and warmth and all those other things. But holy God, those are some hard muscles. He poked Valkyrie's arm. Ow, Dad. Sorry, he said, then poked again. Ow! Sorry. Des, stop poking her. Right, yes, he said, and stepped away. He poked his own arm, and his face fell. Why don't I have muscles like that? Valkyrie's mum passed her a mug of tea. Because you don't work out like your daughter does. But why can't they be hereditary? That's not how hereditary works. Things are passed down, not up. Stupid DNA, he grumbled. Do I at least get a cup of tea? You do if you make it yourself, said her mum. I made one for Stephanie because she's a guest. No, she's not. This is her home, and I, for one, refuse to treat her any differently. Stephanie, fetch me my pipe and slippers. No. Ah, go on. You don't even have a pipe, Valkyrie said. My slippers, then. I don't fetch, Dad. I'm not a dog. Where is your dog, by the way? Did you bring her? She's at home, guarding the house. And how is life up where you live? Up there in foreign climes, which are strange customs and language and everything. It's fifteen minutes away. Which begs the question, why haven't you been down to see us more? I've just been busy, that's all. Too busy to call in on your way past. Des, her mum said. She keeps unconventional hours, remember? Her dad shrugged. Ah, yeah, but we've barely seen her in six months. How's work? It's okay. I mean, yeah, it's okay. I've been easing back into it. Saved the world lately. Not quite, but working on it. Her mum leaned forward slightly. You are keeping safe, aren't you? You wouldn't do anything silly now. No, mum, I'm keeping safe. Because I still have nightmares about... Hey now, her dad said. We had an agreement, didn't we? We don't talk about that day at the dinner table. It puts everyone off their food and puts some of us in a bad mood. Besides, we have to watch what we say around the munchkin. And right on cue... Alice came running into the room. Stephanie! she cried, delighted. Hey there, said Valkyrie, getting off her chair just in time to catch Alice in a hug. She laughed as her little sister squeezed her with all her tiny might. I love your top. Thank you, said Alice, stepping back, full attention now on her clothes. Do you like the sequins? They catch the light. They do catch the light, Valkyrie said. That's a very grown-up thing to say. They're lovely. Thank you. Do you want to see my shoes? Look at the heels. Oh, they have lights. Red lights and orange lights, said Alice. Do you wish you had lights in your shoes? I do. I really do. They don't make them for grown-ups, though, I don't think. Mom, do they make them for grown-ups? I don't think so, said Valkyrie's mother. Alice nodded. They don't. They're only for small feet like mine. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow at her mother. Mom! Melissa sighed. All the kids call their mums mom these days. I think the young moms kind of encourage it. Do you want to see my dolls? Alice asked. I have princess dolls and soldier dolls. Today the princess dolls rescued the soldier dolls from the evil dragon. Sounds exciting said Valkyrie. It's very exciting. Would you love it very much to play with me? I would love it very much. Hold on, hold on, Desmond said. Don't rush off yet. You can play dolls with Stephanie after dinner, OK? But can I show Stephanie my room? Desmond sighed. Of course you can. Alice took Valkyrie's hand and led her upstairs to Valkyrie's old bedroom. 
The walls were light blue, with interlocking rainbows traced along the borders. It was the same bed with brighter sheets, the same bedside table and dresser, the same wardrobe. Valkyrie opened the wardrobe. There was a new mirror on the inside door to replace the smashed one, the one her reflection used to step out of. That was one of the main secrets Valkyrie still kept from her parents. The fact that they had had a duplicate daughter living with them for years and they never suspected she wasn't the real thing. Do you like my clothes? Alice asked. I do, said Valkyrie and closed the wardrobe. This used to be my room. There were books everywhere and weird posters on the walls. You keep it a lot tidier than I ever did. Alice nodded. That's what Mom says. She picked up a small doll, dressed in green with wings and pointed ears. This is Sparkles. She's my fairy. I like her wings. She uses them to fly. When there are no humans around, Sparkles comes alive. But when humans come back, she has to pretend to be a toy again. That's pretty cool. Valkyrie said, sitting on the bed. Is she your friend? Alice nodded. My best friend, along with Molly and Alex in school. Wow, you've got a lot of friends. It's important to have friends. They like me because I'm always happy. Valkyrie smiled. Always? You never get sad? Alice frowned. I don't think so. Molly and Alex are sad sometimes. Sometimes they're not friends and they get sad because of that. But I never get sad, even when people aren't friends with me. You're a smart girl. Do you get sad? Sometimes. You should be happy like me. I should, shouldn't I? What do you get sad about? Different things. But it all goes away, isn't that right? Even when you're really sad about something, you always feel better after a while. I don't know said Alice, looking puzzled. I'm always happy, I said. Valkyrie laughed. Of course. Sorry, I forgot. Do you want to see my other toys? Sure. They stayed up there until they were called downstairs. In the kitchen, the table was already set and Melissa was carving the roast chicken. Valkyrie's stomach rumbled. Oh, wow, that smells amazing. How amazing! Desmond said, his eyes narrowing. Very amazing. Then would you be interested in a trade? This dinner for a teeny tiny favour. Des, Melissa said, she's getting the dinner anyway. She doesn't have to do anything for it. She's our daughter. What favour would that be? Valkyrie asked, tensing despite herself. Her parents exchanged a glance. We were wondering if you'd be free to babysit on Thursday, Melissa said. It's our anniversary and we thought we'd spend the day getting pampered in the Lakeview Hotel. Valkyrie hesitated. Babysit? If you're not too busy. She looked at Alice. Babysit this squirt? I'm not a squirt, Alice said, frowning. You'd have to pick her up from school at quarter to three, Melissa said and we be gone until the next morning. So I pick up this squirt from school and then I get to spend the rest of the day with her and she gets to spend the night at my house. Alice's eyes widened. Your house? Would I have my own bed? You'd probably have to, wouldn't you? Alice nodded quickly. Valkyrie grinned and shrugged to her folks. I think I could manage that. Yay! Alice cried, thrusting both hands in the air and dancing. Melissa laughed. Everyone sit. Hope you're all hungry. I'm starving, said Valkyrie. I'm starving too, said Alice. Valkyrie sat at the table in her usual spot. It felt strange, especially with Alice settling into the chair beside her. But as soon as Alice was seated, she hopped up again. I forgot sparkles, she said and ran upstairs. Have you met Sparkles? Her dad asked, helping Melissa serve dinner. I have. All her school friends have them. They're like that elf, you know, at Christmas that comes alive when all the humans leave the room. Creepy little things. Expensive too. You never had anything like that when you were a kid, did you? Nope, said Valkyrie. No elves, no fairies. I didn't even have an imaginary friend. 
I did, said Desmond. His name was Barry. He was always getting me into trouble. I didn't have time to have an imaginary friend, Melissa said. I had a very full social calendar, even back then. I've always had lots of friends, actually. Then I got married, and they all kind of drifted away. Desmond grinned. That's the effect I have on people. I know you're joking, Melissa said, but you can be quite rude. It's not me, Desmond protested. It's Barry. Melissa sighed. Gordon was the same. A wonderful man, such a big heart, but completely oblivious. Yeah, said Desmond. We edgely men are great. There was a knock on the door, and Desmond went to answer it. Melissa put a plate of food in front of Valkyrie. Roast chicken, roast vegetables, peas, and the most perfectly roasted potatoes. Thank you, said Valkyrie. Um, said Melissa. Yes? Her mum winced. We should have told you. I thought it'd be a nice surprise, but I regret now not telling you. Not telling me what? That was a lie. I didn't tell you because I wanted it to be a surprise. I didn't tell you because I thought you might say no. Say no to what? Desmond came back into the kitchen and Skullduggery stepped in after him, his hat in his hand. Sorry I'm late, he said. Chapter 17 Valkyrie frowned. I don't get it. We invited Skullduggery, Melissa said. You did? Skullduggery tilted his head. You didn't know. Valkyrie held up a hand to him. Hold on, you. Then to her parents. How did you invite him? We called him last night, said her mum. How do you have his number? You gave it to us, remember? In case you weren't in contact with us for any length of time. Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. You are only supposed to use it in case of emergencies. This is an emergency, Desmond said. A social emergency. We thought it was important that we all sit down and chat about things. Do you mind? Melissa asked. Skullduggery is such a big part of your life. We want to get to know him. And we want to get to know you. Does that make sense? Is that weird? It's not weird, no, but it's... Valkyrie shrugged. It doesn't matter. Skullduggery, take a seat. Thank you, Skullduggery said. I thought you knew. It's cool. I haven't been invited to dinner in about 300 years, so I said yes without even bothering to check. People don't invite you to dinner, Desmond asked, putting a plate of food in front of him. I don't eat, Skullduggery said, and Desmond nodded and took the food away. Alice came down the stairs and Skullduggery activated his facade, turning to her when she ran in. Hello. Hello, she said. Skullduggery tilted his head. Why are you so short? I'm only seven, Alice said. That's no excuse. When I was your age, I was twice as tall as you. You should grow taller. I will, when I'm older. You're not just being lazy, are you? No. Do you promise? I promise. Come over here. Without hesitation, Alice crossed the room. My name is Skullduggery, Skullduggery said. It's a big word. Can you say it? Skullduggery. 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 Very good. And you are Alice. We've met before when you were even smaller than you are now. You were a baby the last time I saw you. Now I'm seven. That's right. You're a little girl now. It's very good to meet you again, Alice. It's very good to meet you. Are you joining us for dinner? Yes. She turned to Valkyrie. I can't find sparkles. Valkyrie looked thoughtful. 
Well, she does come to life when we're not there, so she's probably playing hide and seek with you. If you were a fairy, where would you hide? In the clouds. OK, but I don't think the window's open, so she's probably still in your bedroom. Maybe in your bed. Under the blankets or... Or under the pillow! Valkyrie clicked her fingers. I bet that's where she is. Alice ran upstairs again. I have questions, Desmond said, as he and Melissa sat down. Go ahead, Skullduggery said. Is this your actual face from when you were alive? No, Skullduggery answered. It's a random selection. Sometimes they repeat, sometimes they're brand new. Do you have magic toilets? Valkyrie sighed. Dad. What? I just want to know if there are magical versions of everyday items. A magic toilet would be a good idea, wouldn't it? Maybe the pee disappears before it hits the bowl. Des, said Melissa, shaking her head. What? I'm curious. If the pee disappears, where does it go? Does it evaporate? Or is it, I don't know, transported to another dimension? When we spoke last night, you said you just got back from a parallel dimension. Is there an entire dimension that is just filled with our pee? Or is there a parallel dimension that is just like ours, but our pee is their rain? Every time we pee, are we peeing on millions of people? No, Desmond, Skullduggery said. That doesn't happen. Desmond nodded. That's probably a good thing. There aren't magical versions of every household item. Sorcerers use the same things mortals do. We live side by side, after all. Not any more you don't. You live in Roarhaven now. Not all of us, Skullduggery said. Desmond leaned forward. What about wands? We don't use wands, Dad, said Valkyrie. Then how come they're a thing? Why do they become associated with magicians? A few hundred years ago, Skullduggery said, some sorcerers did indeed use wands. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. I didn't know that. It was a passing fad, he explained. Embarrassing to all who witnessed it, and, as it turned out, quite damaging. In much the same way that necromancers use an object to channel their power, sorcerers of different disciplines used wands to focus their abilities. Necromancers, however, need to use objects as their power is too unstable. How was using wands damaging? Magic is instinctual. As such, it's affected by our moods. If a sorcerer panics, their control is diminished. Channeling their magic through wands meant they were unconsciously limiting their own potential. It's called the wand principle. That makes sense, Desmond said, nodding. The wand principle, I like that. Alice hurried in, sparkles in one hand. She sat at her place. Nobody was eating. Well, I'm hungry, said Valkyrie, and picked up her knife and fork. Please, all of you, begin, Skullduggery said. Don't mind me. The others started to eat. The food was everything Valkyrie had remembered. So, Melissa said, what have you been up to for the last five years, Skullduggery? Stephanie told us that an ex-girlfriend of yours has been brought back to life. That's an unusual situation. I suppose it is, Skullduggery said. Yes, Abyssinia and I have a history, but uh, that was hundreds of years ago. A lot has happened for both of us since then. Wasn't she just a heart in a box for most of that, though? Asked Desmond, his mouth full. Well, yes, you're right. Which brings to mind some intriguing questions about how internal organs perceive the passage of time. But... Abyssinia managed to communicate with people and entities telepathically while she was in there, so I think it's fair to assume that she experienced at least some growth as a person. Still, anything involving an ex is bound to be awkward, especially one that you, um... K-I-L-L-E-D, Skullduggery finished, glancing at Alice. Yes, that brings with it its own unique complications. We still haven't spoken, though, since she was resurrected, so I'm afraid I can't give you a definitive answer. I don't want peas, said Alice. 
Just eat a few of them, Melissa said, before turning back to Skullduggery. What are you working on now? Anything exciting? Just the usual, Valkyrie said, before Skullduggery could answer. People with strange names doing strange things for strange reasons. Anything dangerous? No, not really. Not what I'd call... Skullduggery, what do you think? I wouldn't call it dangerous. Would you? No, said Skullduggery. Not dangerous. Not at all. Valkyrie nodded and went back to eating. It's not exactly safe, either, Skullduggery continued. But dangerous is... I've always felt that it's a word loaded with unhelpful connotations. Valkyrie chewed faster, but Melissa was already asking a follow-up. Just to clarify, how not safe is it? Stephanie, could you get hurt doing whatever it is you're doing? Valkyrie swallowed. I could get hurt crossing the road, Mum. Which is why you were taught to look both ways. She still does that, Skullduggery interjected. She's very good at crossing the road. Thanks, Valkyrie said, giving him a glare before smiling reassuringly at her parents. I'm safe. I'm taking care of myself. I'm not in any danger. What about this ex-girlfriend? Anyone that can come back from the dead sounds like she might be trouble. The High Sanctuary has people working on that, Valkyrie said. That isn't what we do anymore. We're arbiters now. We're not sent out. We're not assigned anything. We get to pick and choose the cases we work on. And I'm still easing back into things, remember? I'm taking it nice and slow. Melissa put down her knife and fork. Skullduggery, do you promise to keep our daughter safe? Valkyrie closed her eyes. She knew what was coming. I'm afraid I can't do that. Skullduggery said. We have no way of knowing where a line of investigation will take us, or how dangerous it will get. But you can rest assured that I will do my very best to keep your daughter alive. My very, very best. Valkyrie's parents looked at him. So how's Fergus and Beryl? Valkyrie asked them quickly. Melissa hesitated, reluctant to move to a different subject. They're doing fine, we think. We don't really see them much. They've been having some trouble with the girls. What's happened? Ah, it's nothing. People change. They grow up and they grow apart. Even sisters, even twins. Carol got a job in a solicitor's office and she's moved into her own apartment. She's doing fine. I think she even has a boyfriend. Crystal is still living at home. Desmond frowned. She had a bit of a nervous breakdown, he said. She's been to see a psychiatrist, the poor mite. She started thinking that Carol was an imposter. There's a name for it, some kind of delusion. Capgrass delusion, Skullduggery said. It's a misidentification syndrome, commonly found in paranoid schizophrenics. Or people whose sisters had been murdered and then replaced by reflections. Valkyrie looked down at her plate. Is she okay? She's got pills she takes, Melissa said, and she talks to her psychiatrist once or twice a week. She's perfectly fine apart from... apart from when Carol's around. Valkyrie's throat burned. Maybe I'll call in, she said quietly. I'm sure she'd like that, Melissa said. Skullduggery's phone rang. I do apologise he said, taking it from his pocket. Ah, it's temper. I'm afraid I'll have to take this. I'll talk to him, Valkyrie said, whipping the phone out of his hand as she stood up. She walked into the hall and then out of the front door as she answered the call. I have news, temper said. Tell me. Valkyrie? Is everything all right? Is Skullduggery in trouble again? No, she said. He's fine. He's having dinner with my parents. I just... I needed to get out of there. What do you have? The chemist who makes Quidnunc serum? I found out his name. Gravid Caw. He's got a house in Black Cat Drive. Don't have a whole lot more on him, I'm afraid. If he's a bad guy, he stay clear of the city watch. 
Grab it, call. Black Cat Drive. Got it. Thank you. You want me to have someone haul him in for you to question? No, it's okay. We only have a limited number of times we can do that before your city guard buddies get annoyed at being used to pick up our suspects. Besides, we prefer to catch bad guys in their natural environment. It's more fun. Valkyrie went back into the house. We have to go, she said, handing the phone to Skullduggery. Already? her mum asked, standing. You can't stay a little longer, even just for dessert? We really can't, Valkyrie said. Mum, thank you so much for dinner. I haven't had food that good in ages. Dad, thanks for asking about magic toilets. She gave them both a kiss. And thank you for inviting me, said Skullduggery. It was very nice of you. Valkyrie hugged Alice. I'll see you on Thursday, OK? We'll have the best day. I can't wait, Alice said, grinning. Valkyrie and Skullduggery left. The Bentley was parked at the corner. Valkyrie unlocked her own car. Gravit Caw is the chemist. He lives on Black Cat Drive. Meet you there? Of course, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie, are you all right? Your parents called me after I'd arrived home yesterday evening. I wouldn't have come if I had known I'd be interrupting. You weren't interrupting. I know how much you were looking forward to spending some time with your family. Believe me, I understand. She smiled. Thanks, but you're never an interruption, you got that? Now quit being considerate, it's weird, and it makes me want to laugh nervously and run away. You are an odd woman. Yep, she said. Chapter 18 Even in Cold Heart, a scream so full of terror was a curiosity worthy of further investigation. So Cadaverous hunted it down like he'd hunted all those idiotic co-eds through his house of horrors, finally turning a corner to see Razia leaning over the barrier. Are you throwing people off again? he asked, walking up to her. She didn't look round. He's the last one, she said. Did you get him to apologise? He got down on his knees and begged me to forgive him. He said he got confused in all the excitement. You didn't forgive him, obviously. We let them out of their cells to attack Valkyrie and the skeleton. They should have known better than to attack me, too. Her voice was low, her face expressionless. Then she brightened, her unhinged smile returning. You should have seen the way he evaporated, Caddy. The moment he hit that energy field, he just went zap. And she clicked her fingers. I'm sure it was lovely. It was, actually. Very pretty. I might write a poem about it later. What rhymes with evaporated? Not much. Maparated. Is that a word? Not a real one. It's not easy being a poet. Stick to what you're good at, Razia. Extreme violence and making people uneasy in your presence. She sighed unhappily and took a crumpled ball of foil from her pocket. I want to try new things, though. I want to stretch myself. You're bored, aren't you? Dunno, she said, opening the ball. I've never been bored before, so I don't know what it feels like. I've always had someone to kill, or hunt, or torture. I don't even view it as work, you know. Is it even work, when you're doing what you love? It's a vocation, is what it is. But even someone like you needs direction. And I don't think you've been getting that lately. The foil contained a few small pieces of raw meat. Razia brought her other hand close. Things are different, she said. Before we got Abyssinia back, it was non-stop, you know. We were always busy, always focused. But now that's all changed, Cadaverus said. We still have our plans, though. Abyssinia has her people in place, and first wave are getting ready to strike. 
Razia's palm opened slowly and the parasite poked out. A black tentacle with a head slightly thicker than its body. It had no eyes, but plenty of sharp, tiny teeth. It hovered over the foil, then dipped down, snatching the meat into its jaws. Cadaverus couldn't take his eyes off it as it fed. But is that enough to keep life interesting, Razia? No, it ain't. She won't even send me on the simple jobs, because she thinks I'll do something crazy and kill a bunch of people for no reason. I know. I always have a reason, Caddy. I know that too. But she sends scary instead, because apparently she has more self-control. What's so good about self-control? Nothing that I can see. I hate scary. I know. She's basically just a sane version of me. We even have the same pets. What are the odds? Her pets aren't as well trained as mine, though. And see this guy? He's longer than Scary's. And he's not even fully grown yet. And her pets are green. Can you imagine it? How ugly. Very ugly. Can I tell you something? I promise you won't tell anyone else. Cadaverus dragged his eyes away from the parasite. Of course. I am not sure that I have any friends here, like real, actual mates. Nero makes me want to stab him every time I talk to him, and Distri is always working on his little projects, and he's a weirdo anyway. For so long, Abyssinia was my friend, a voice in my head that only I could hear. But she barely does that anymore. And when she does, it just feels... weird. I'd like to think that I'm your friend, Razia. She smiled. Yeah, I reckon you are. She looked down at the parasite as it ate. But you're a psychopath. So I don't think you count. Do you want to know a secret? Cadaverus asked. I've been having the exact same thoughts as you. I'm bored. It's as if all Abyssinia wanted was for us to bring her back to life. So she filled our heads with all these wonderful ideas of an anti-sanctuary and getting revenge on the people who've wronged us. And now that she's back, all she cares about is herself and her son. You really think she was fooling us? I don't know, Cadaverus said, shrugging. I hope not, but that's how it seems. That's how it feels. The parasite finished its lunch and retracted into Razia's palm. She crumpled up the foil and tossed it over the side. I think I'm having a midlife crisis. We just need to remind Abyssinia that we're here and we're valuable. We just need some way to impress her again. Yet Avarice gave a little shrug. Oh well, if anything occurs to you. He let his words hang and started walking away. What about? Razia said, and her voice trailed off. Cadaverus turned. Yes? Nothing. No, go on. What were you going to say? She hesitated. Well, if all Abyssinia cares about is getting Kaysen back, then she'd be like super happy with us if we found him. Cadaverus frowned. But she's assigned Avatar to that job, and from what I gather, he is mere hours away from finding the ambulance route. He's going to get all the praise. He's going to get all the fun jobs. Yeah, but we could, you know, kill him. Kill him? Just a little, Razia said quickly. Just slightly. So what you're suggesting is that we wait for Avatar to find the ambulance's route 
and then we kill him, sneak off ourselves and rescue Kason. Well, I mean, yeah, said Razia. Why not? We bring her son back. Abyssinia's gonna love us. Cadaverous smiled. You're not as insane as you seem, are you? Razia laughed, then turned deadly serious. Oh, no, I am, but I really am. Chapter 19 It was late evening by the time they found Gravid Kaw standing with a small group of people at the steps of the High Sanctuary. They were chanting and waving placards, calling for the refugees to be sent home, while impassive cleavers stood so still they might have been carved from granite. Alkari walked up and stood beside him. He didn't notice for the first few seconds. He was far too busy chanting and waving his placard. I like your sign, said Valkyrie, and Gravid turned his head to her. His eyes widened when he realised who she was. There are no typos for one thing. I've always thought, what's the point of hating someone if you can't be grammatically correct about it? I, er... Uh... I don't hate anyone, Gravid mumbled and went to move away. Then Skullduggery was on his other side. Well, he said, you hate mortals a little. No, Gravid responded, growing noticeably paler. We're just, we're here to ensure they're treated fairly. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. This will be interesting. The chanting died down once the protesters saw who had joined them. Valkyrie smiled. Skullduggery waved. The protesters glanced at each other, glanced at Gravid, and then moved away, abandoning him to restart their protest a little further on. Gravid's shoulders slumped. You were saying, Valerie prompted, about your struggle to ensure the mortals are treated fairly. Gravid cleared his throat, then cleared it again. We just don't think it's, you know, fair that they're being kept in tents and things. They're not animals, after all. They have their dignity. First of all, Valkyrie said, yes, they do have their dignity. Thanks for reminding us. That's very important. Second, how many animals do you know of that are kept in tents? Is that a thing, keeping animals in tents? I mean, cattle can be kept in sheds and horses in stables, but I've never heard of an animal that is kept in a tent. It's, a uh, metaphorical. Valkyrie frowned. Which part? The animals or the tent? I have a question, Skullduggery said, taking the placard from Gravid's hand and examining it. It says here, keep mortals out of Roarhaven. So obviously you're not inviting them in. You don't want them outside in tents. You don't want them inside in houses. So where do you want them? Gravid didn't answer. Do you think we should send them to Dublin, or Cork, or Belfast? Skullduggery continued. Do you think they could assimilate into mortal culture here? That would be troublesome, though, wouldn't it? They're from an alternate dimension. It would be quite the security risk. Gravid mumbled something. Sorry, Valkyrie said. What was that? Gravid cleared his throat once more. <clears throat> We could send them back. Send them back where? Back where they came from. Skullduggery didn't say anything. He was leaving this to Valkyrie. She joined him in silence for a moment, enjoying the effect it was having on poor little Gravid. He was practically squirming in his shoes. Do you know why they came here? She asked. Gravid girded himself. The unfortunate circumstance they find themselves in should not be our concern. But do you know? Why should we be held responsible for yes or no answer, Gravid? Valkyrie interrupted. Do you know what they're running from? Yes, but that's got nothing to do with us. So you know that they're fleeing from basically genocide, yes? I have sympathy for them, Gravid said. Of course I do. But we have to help our own before we can even think of helping others. Well, you're definitely not thinking of helping others, so you're halfway there already. Look! Look! 
Valkyrie repeated, stepping closer. Are you losing your patience with me, Gravid? Are you getting angry? Are you upset that I'm not just accepting your nasty little excuses like the rest of your sign-waving friends? What do you intend to do about that, eh? You want to bully me? Intimidate me? Tell me to go back where I came from? Gravid swallowed. We're having a peaceful protest. I'm not losing my patience with anyone. I'm losing my patience with you, Gravid. Gravid. What does that name even mean, anyhow? It means meaningful, Gravid said quietly. It also means pregnant, Skullduggery said. I didn't know that when I chose it, Gravid muttered. But I'm doing nothing wrong, OK? You can't arrest me for standing on the street and voicing an opinion. I'm entitled to it. Valkyrie frowned again. Who told you that? Who told me what? That you're entitled to an opinion, Valkyrie said. Who told you? But, but I am. So no one told you. You just heard it somewhere and decided it was true. You're not entitled to an opinion, Gravid. You're faced with right and wrong. You're choosing wrong. And because you can't defend that choice without admitting that you're wrong, you claim that you're entitled to believe in a lie if you so wish. She leaned in. I hate people like you, Gravid. I despise them. You're not even strong enough to be honest about how rotten you are. Besides, Skullduggery said, clamping a hand on Gravid's shoulder. Who said we were here to arrest you? I never said anything about arresting you. Valkyrie, did you say anything about arresting Gravid? I thought it, Valkyrie said. She'd do it too, said Skullduggery. That's the problem you face when you deal with arbiters. We don't answer to anyone. We could arrest you, throw you in a cell, and you'd languish there until we remember to ask you those questions we'd been meaning to. What, uh, what questions? It's about your day job, actually. Nothing to do with standing on pavements and waving signs about sending people back to get murdered. No, this is about your job, not your hobby. I'm unemployed. In this economy? How can that be? Roarhaven is thriving. There's work for everyone. Maybe you're not looking hard enough, Valkyrie said. Or maybe you're too busy making illegal drugs. Gravid shook his head in an unconvincing attempt at appearing unconcerned. I don't know what you're talking about. The drugs, Gravid, Skullduggery said. She's talking about the drugs you make in your basement, illegally, that you then sell to people. For money. I don't. I don't do that. You are possibly less convincing than you think you are, but I'm afraid we've just come from your basement. Gravid's eyes widened. You're not allowed to do that. You need a warrant to search someone's house. For someone who doesn't view mortals too highly, you seem to think that a lot of their laws apply to you. We don't need warrants, Gravid. We're arbiters. We knocked. You weren't home and very gently we let ourselves in. You're going to need a new door, Valkyrie said. Skullduggery nodded. It's possible you might need a new door, but that's only if you like doors. Personally, I think the gaping hole lets a lot of light in. While we were there in your house, we happened to find the hidden entrance to the basement. Well, I don't mind telling you, we were surprised. We certainly didn't expect to find the entrance in the wall, did we, Valkyrie? We did not. I mean, we thought it might be there, but we weren't sure. You're going to need a new wall, too, said Valkyrie. Just a slight wall, Skullduggery nodded. The west one. It's got some holes in it. Or small ones and a big one. Anyway, once we found the hidden basement, we found all the paraphernalia that you use to make the illegal drugs. There was a lot of it. So much, said Valkyrie. A huge amount. We told the city guard about that, by the way. A friend of ours, a nice American man. You'll like him. He's on his way to see you. I don't want to spoil anything, but you're looking at a lot of jail time. So much, said Valkyrie. A huge amount. Gravid tried to bolt, but Skullduggery grabbed his arm and squeezed his shoulder, and he rose to his tiptoes and cried out. Before all that, 
Skullduggery said. We were wondering if you could answer a few questions. It's got nothing to do with the protest, don't worry, and nothing to do with the illegal drugs either. Another drug you make, a perfectly legal one, so good for you on that, is to combat necrosis. You make that one for a man named Quidnunc. We need to find this man. Where is he? Do you know? All? All this just to find Quidnunc? Yes. Breaking into my house, finding the drugs, calling the city guard, and you just wanted to know where Quidnunc is. I would have told you. If you'd asked, I would have told you. No problem. Skullduggery nodded to Valkyrie. See? I told you he'd be nice. Where is Quidnunc, Gravid? He's staying at the Sadists Club. I've never heard of it. It's really secret. Is it a club for sadists? Yes. Clever. I don't know where it is. Quidnunc never said. Did you really call the cops? Yes. Oh, man, I would have told you. You just had to ask, like the woman did. Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. What woman? A woman in red came to see me, asking about Quidnunc. But she didn't pull any of the stuff that you just pulled. She simply asked and left. Did she have silver hair? Yes. Did she say anything about her plans? Anything that could help us figure out where she is? If you have something useful, we could talk to our American friend and he could take it into account when your charges are being filed. OK, said Gravit. OK, yeah, yeah, she did. She said, uh... True things only, Skullduggery said. Lies will result in even more jail time. Gravid sagged. Then, no, nothing. They took Gravid Caw to the nearest cleaver and handed him over. That was fun, said Valkyrie. You really got into it that time. He annoyed me. So, the Sadists Club. Any idea where it is? Not yet. But I'm sure I know just the people to ask. Would you like to accompany me? Will there be punching? Probably. Then, if it's all the same to you, I'll give it a miss. If I can go a full day without having to hit anyone or inflict physical pain, I'm going to do it. That's my New Year's resolution. You're about nine months too late. I meant my Chinese New Year's resolution. Then you're about eight months too late. Then it's just something I've decided. That's fair enough. I'll meet you here in the morning. Cool. I'll be here around nine. Skullduggery doffed his hat to her and walked towards the Bentley. Valkyrie turned and headed off in the opposite direction. Once in her car, she left Roarhaven behind her and the roads got bumpier before widening again and smoothing out. She joined the motorway. This time of night, there wasn't very much traffic. She turned on the radio, sang along with the music, allowing her mind to drift. She changed lanes and adjusted speed without giving any of it much thought. After a bit, she stopped singing and turned off the radio and just drove in silence. Her mind settled into the rhythm of the road. The drone of the tyres filled the car slowly until she was all alone in the world. Abyssinia walked across the motorway and Valkyrie cursed and braked and swerved and went right through her. The car rocked to a stop. Valkyrie jumped out, energy crackling between her fingers, crackling from her eyes, her teeth bared, ready to fight. But the road was quiet and empty, and Abyssinia was neither lying there nor standing there. She wasn't there at all. A hallucination, that's all it was. A hallucination or a vision brought on by the meditative state she'd been sinking into. So Valkyrie was either having flashbacks to psychic episodes or having psychic episodes without meaning to. She didn't know which was worse. She got back in the car, restarted the engine and did a slow U-turn. Back on track, the car drove straight and steady like nothing had happened. But Valkyrie's hands shook as they gripped the wheel. Chapter 20 Down below, the energy field hummed with power, 
its light flickering off the lower tier of cells. Cadaverous took the folded paper from Avatar's hand and opened it. Printed upon the three sheets was a detailed route through Europe, complete with timings, rest stops and distance in both miles and kilometres. Everything a group of sorcerers would need to keep a private ambulance moving smoothly and everything a certain other group of sorcerers would need to ambush said ambulance. You've done good work, Cadaverous said. Very good work, actually. But I didn't think you had either the contacts or the intelligence to pull this off, if I'm being honest. I thought you were all muscle and no brains. But it seems Abyssinia was right about you. Avatar didn't answer. Cadaverous chuckled. Don't look so surprised. I can admit when I'm wrong. Do you mind if I take this? You don't. That's so nice of you. This, this is what I love. I'm one of the originals. You started following Abyssinia after she released you from your cell. But here we both are, working together, as a team. Cadaverous folded the sheets and tucked them into his pocket, then lifted Avatar off the ground, grunting slightly with the effort. He dragged him the short distance to the balcony and heaved him over. Zap! As Razia would say. Chapter 21 It was a Monday morning, which meant that Omen had already missed a double maths class, and, as he handed blankets to a never-ending line of wary, hungry mortals, he was now missing civics. He was glad to miss maths, when was he ever going to have to add numbers in his adult life? But he regretted missing civics. His classmates were being given their first lesson on how to forge an ID. Those kinds of things would be useful to know in the next few hundred years. Instead, here he was in a sort of market, right in the very centre of the city of tents, a proud member of Miss Gnosis's volunteer team of nine. He'd never volunteered for anything before and he was starting to remember why. It was boring, for a start, and the mortals were hardly any fun, what with them hating and fearing anyone who could do magic. He wondered how they felt about people who could barely do magic, like Omen himself, but decided against asking. He probably didn't know them well enough to make jokes. Someone tapped him on the shoulder. Miss Gnosis says I'm to relieve you, Axelia said. Oh, said Omen, and blushed, and stepped aside, and Axelia started handing out the blankets. She'd been weird with him all morning. Everyone had. Probably because they all figured he'd only volunteered because she'd be here. He wandered over to Miss Gnosis, who was supervising the food distribution. Um, Miss, what'll I do now? You're on your break, Miss Gnosis said, flicking through the pages of her clipboard. Go mingle! Omen didn't really know how to mingle. He'd watched Never do it, but hadn't ever come close to mastering that particular skill himself. Two of Axelia's friends were giving him the side-eye and whispering to each other, however, so he plunged into the crowd of mortals to escape and found himself jostled and jumbled and then spat out the other side, nearly colliding with a stall lined with pots. The girl behind the stall narrowed her eyes at him. Omen looked at her then decided to smile. He may have overdone it, because the girl recoiled slightly. Hi, said Omen. Um, hello? Hello, said the girl. Omen stuck out his hand. My name's Omen, he said. Omen Darkly. She observed his hand for a moment before shaking it. Ornia. Hi, Ornia. Very good to meet you. You're the first person from another dimension that I've ever actually spoken to. She didn't say anything to that, so he continued. I mean, obviously I spoke to the people when I was giving them blankets, but it wasn't anything that you'd call a conversation. It was mostly just, hello, here's a blanket, and then they'd walk away, so... He cleared his throat. <clears> throat> it's a school thing, the food and blankets. 
I volunteered. Do you have schools where you're from? Yes. Yes, of course. Who doesn't have schools? Omen laughed. They're all the same, no matter which universe you're from. It's all a drag. I hate school, you know. Well, it's okay. Some of the teachers are nice, but I think I'm just not very smart. He was saying the wrong things. He didn't know what the right things to say were, but he was not saying them. So, what do you think of our universe? He continued. Pretty cool, right? It's warm enough. Sorry? It's warm. It's fine. Oh, Omen said. Oh, oh I get it. Um, when I say cool, I don't mean cold. It's an expression we have here. It means something good. You know, hey, that's cool. I'm cool. You're cool. It's an expression. Do you have expressions where you're from? Yes. Cool. Well, it was very good to meet you. He waved and backed off and battled his way through the crowd. Making friends? Miss Gnosis asked. I don't think so, said Omen. She didn't look very happy to talk to me. She's been through a lot. They all have. Remember that their culture is vastly different from ours. And also she probably sees you as evil. Right. Which probably explains her reluctance to chat. I suppose. I don't think it's anything personal. Maybe it's my face. Your face is fine. I don't think girls like it, though. She passed him a badge. Here, invite your new friend to be one of the ambassadors. Let her see that you're not a bad guy. The crowd had thinned by this stage, so Omen returned to Ornia's stall without making a fool of himself. Ornia, he said. Um, I was wondering if you'd like to be an ambassador, maybe. We're giving out these badges to people that we'd like to talk to, going forward, to come up with ways to help out. We're interested in hearing what you need, what your concerns are, that kind of thing. She eyed the badge suspiciously. What we need, she repeated. Yes, if that's more food or more blankets or medicine or whatever. We want to open a dialogue with your people. I don't speak for them. But you can, said Omen. That's what this little badge does. It lets you speak. I mean, it doesn't let you speak. You don't need it to speak. But it kind of puts you in a position where you can get heard. If you like. If that interests you. That little button does all that? Yes. He held it out to her. If you want it. Ornia considered it, then took the badge. My people are scared, she said. We didn't know what was on the other side of the portal. All we knew was that if we stayed in our homes we'd be killed. Now people are saying if we stay here we'll be killed. No, said Omen his eyes wide. No, no, we don't kill people. God, no. You're innocent and you're unarmed and you're mortal. We don't kill mortals. Sorcerers protect mortals. From what? Uh, mostly from other sorcerers, like Mevolent. Yes, Omen said. We had our own version of him in this dimension. We stopped him. He's dead here. If the Mevolent from your home tries to follow you through the portal, we'll kill him too. Ornia didn't appear to be reassured. What are you going to do to us? We're, um, we're not... I I'm sorry, what do you mean? If you're not going to kill us, where will you put us? To be honest, Omen said, shrugging helplessly, they're still trying to figure that out. Supreme Mage Sorrows... She's in charge. Is a very smart lady, though, so she'll think of something. You're safe now. You can relax. We're not safe, Ornia replied. We're in a strange world and we're surrounded by sorcerers. We're not all bad, said Omen. I know your experience with people like me has been pretty terrible. I've heard about what it's like over there, in your reality, but things are different here. The mortals are free and happy. Well, not all of them, but in general. Kind of. What I'm trying to say is that this is their world. They rule over you. Well, no, because they don't even know we exist. They have their own cities. 
They have all the cities, Omen said. All except this one. And Roarhaven is kind of invisible. This isn't a perfect universe and not everything is fair or good and not everyone is happy. But I'm telling you, you don't have to be scared of us. She looked doubtful. And you, she said. You promise you're a good sorcerer. I, um, uh, I promise I try to be a good person. I don't think anyone would really say I'm a good sorcerer. She gave a reluctant smile. It was a pretty one. I don't mind that at all, she said. Omen smiled back, suddenly seeing the upside of volunteering for stuff. Chapter 22 After almost crashing her car the previous night, Valkyrie decided to let Skullduggery pick her up. She left Xena outside so that she could run around and got in the Bentley. Skullduggery's facade was a tanned gentleman with a blonde moustache. Nice, said Valkyrie. Have you found out where the sadist's club is? Not yet, he said, swooping the car round and heading for the gate. But I'm expecting a call from one of my contacts who will, hopefully, relay that information. Is Temper the contact? No. He's usually the contact. I have more than one contact, you know. She shrugged and sank into a silence that lasted until they'd reached the motorway. Is everything okay? Skullduggery asked. Sorry? You seem quiet. Do I? I think I know why. Valkyrie looked at him and didn't say anything. There was no way he knew about the visions. No way. It's about the dinner, isn't it? I ruined your family dinner and you're mad at me. I'm not mad at you, she said, relaxing. You know what happens when I'm mad at you. You tend to throw mugs at me. And have I thrown any mugs? Do you even see any mugs? No. So I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at my parents either, even though they invited you without asking me. I understand why they did it. They're worried about me. They think getting more involved in my life will ease their minds. It won't, though, Skullduggery said, at all, in the slightest. If they knew more about what you did. They'd never sleep again, Valkyrie said. Exactly. But, you know, their parents. It's their job to worry about me. Just like it's my job to protect them from what's coming. She winced, even as the words escaped her lips, hoping fervently that he'd let it go. But of course he didn't. He looked at her. Do you think about that a lot? Think about what? About what's coming. The things you saw in your vision. Valkyrie tried to give a nonchalant shrug. A bit. But if I feel it getting me down, I just remind myself that we've seen the future before and we've seen the future change, so... So you're hoping to change the future? You know, yeah. That's quite a burden to carry. Is it? It's almost as if you're taking all responsibility for the bad things that are going to happen. Well, Valkyrie said, giving a little laugh, they won't happen if we change them, will they? We were able to alter aspects of the future that Cassandra Pharos saw, Skullduggery said, but it was only aspects. Are you hoping to avoid this new future altogether? I don't know, she said. I mean, it's not out of the question, is it? The future I saw only exists because certain things happen along the way. We change those things and that future vanishes. It's not like we're battling against fate or something, right? I don't believe in destiny. Augur Darkly isn't destined to face the King of the Darklands. It's just been foreseen by psychics. There's a difference. So if there's no fate and no destiny, what are we left with? God? I've seen no evidence of a higher power controlling everything. And I've been Dark S. If anyone could have sensed the presence of an uppercase god, it's her. All that may be true, Skullduggery said. But we know from experience that changing the future is not easy. In order to ensure it doesn't happen, 
we'd need to know a lot more about what's coming. You'd need to delve deeper into your vision. Well, okay, Valkyrie responded. Then let's do it. Unfortunately, that brings its own complications, as you well know. In order to safely navigate the psychic highways, you'll need training. Safeguards will have to be put in place. That'll take years. You don't know that, Skullduggery said. There's never been a sensitive like you before. The ability essentially exploded inside you. Maybe it won't take that long. You told me it'd take three years minimum before I could start exploring the vision seriously. Have you changed your mind? Skullduggery hesitated. No, he said at last. And while I'm spending the next three years minimum studying to be a sensitive, the world is going to hell around me? No, thanks. What I should be doing is just diving into the vision, head first. Far too dangerous. You don't know that. It might be fine. Or it might have huge untold side effects, he said. You could lose control. You could lose your mind. I'm strong enough to take it. If anyone could, then yes, I agree, it would be you. And I freely acknowledge the fact that this caution goes against every instinct I have. I much prefer to plunge into danger. It's more fun. But something like this is different. If you were me, she said, would you do it? Skullduggery didn't answer. The eyes of his facade remained fixed on the road. Yeah she said. See? His phone rang. She answered, then hung up and told him where the sadist's club was. They got to Roarhaven, drove through and parked, then walked a little, coming to a metal door with a shelf riveted onto it, level with Valkyrie's chest. Skullduggery knocked, and a small voice piped up. Who goes there? Visitors, Skullduggery said. Just passing through. We heard this would be a good place to meet like-minded people. There was a moment of hesitation, and then... Skullduggery! Is that you? Skullduggery frowned. Uh, it might be. Who is this? A slot opened, and a man no taller than Valkyrie's outstretched hand stepped out onto the shelf. He was wearing a green suit and orange tie, and he had wings and pointed ears. It's me! said the small man. Cormac! Whoa, said Valkyrie. Skullduggery deactivated his facade and peered closer. Cormac! The little man grinned. I thought that was you! How have you been? Fine, Skullduggery said. You look... different. Ah, yeah, I shaved the beard! That must be it. Also, you've shrunk. Cormac's face soured. The fairy genes kicked in three years ago. My ears went pointy and I grew the wings and I got all that fairy magic that had been promised me since I was a kid, but... Well, as you can see, my parents left out some pretty pertinent information. Hi, said Valkyrie. My name's Valkyrie. How are you? Could I ask a question? Go ahead, said Cormac. Are your parents fairies too? Yes, they are. Proud members of the fae community. And are they... small? He folded his arms and sighed, like this was the hundredth time today he'd had to explain this. <sighs> They're people-sized. All fairies start off people-sized. Some fairies develop the ability to switch back and forth between sizes. Some, and this is the part I didn't know until three years ago, shrink down to this size and are then stuck like this. It hasn't been easy. I have to wear modified doll's clothes. I can't form meaningful relationships with anyone taller than 20 centimetres and cats keep trying to eat me. Also, I lost my job. What were you? I was a hand model. I modelled wristwatches and photo shoots, things like that. I have good wrists, lightly haired. Right. And now I'm here, stuck doing security for the sadists club. He winced. Damn, that was supposed to be a secret. That's why we're here, Skullduggery said. Could you let us in? We're looking for someone. Can't do it, Cormac replied. Wish I could. You and me go way back and I always look out for my friends. But this is my job, Skullduggery. Do you know how hard it is for a fairy of my size to find gainful employment? 
First, I have to overcome the stigma of being a fairy in the first place. You think that's easy? That was hard even when I was people-sized. You know the problem? There are so few fairies left in the world that nobody knows a thing about us or our culture. All they have to go on are tired old tropes and stereotypes with the clapping and the fairy dust and the constant Tinkerbell references. I struck it lucky with this job. Yeah, the clientele are not exactly my kind of people, but you gotta do what you gotta do. So, um, how do we get in? You really want to do this? There's a whole thing. You want to do this? If you wouldn't mind, said Skullduggery. No, we can do it. I can pretend I don't know you. We'll go through the process, and if you pass, you get in. Fair's fair. What do we do? Cormac put his tiny hands on his tiny hips. One of you has to fight me. Chapter 23 Skullduggery tilted his head. Really? If you don't have a member to vouch for you, Cormac said. It's trial by combat, yeah? Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. Do you want to do it? No, thanks, she said. Are you sure? Not a chance. Right then, Skullduggery said. It looks like it's you and me, Cormac. Cormac flew straight at Skullduggery's jaw and swung a tiny fist that launched Skullduggery backwards. I'm awesomely strong now, by the way, Cormac called out. Skullduggery threw himself forward and Cormac met him in mid-air. Valkyrie noticed the door creak a little and with a gentle push, it opened. She sneaked in, closing it behind her. She found herself in a small courtyard with white stones gathered round three green bushes. She passed through an archway into an enclosed patio area with wrought iron tables and chairs. Upon the tables were upturned wine glasses and a menu. A waiter came out of the doorway to her left, smiling as he approached. Good morning, he said, and welcome to the club. You must be a new member. I would have remembered you otherwise. It is my first time here. Is it always this quiet? It is on a Monday morning, yes. Can I get you a drink? Actually, I'm just here to meet someone. Dr Quidnunk. Have you seen him recently? I had his number, but then Dummy here went and lost her phone, so... The waiter smiled. I've been there. I'm on my third phone in two years because I keep losing them. Wow, said Valkyrie, giving a laugh. Well, at least I'm not that bad. Quidnunk wouldn't happen to be in today, would he? The waiter rolled his eyes. Quidnunk's in every day. Apparently he's on the run. No way. Yep. He's availing himself of the facilities here and the rooms upstairs to do a little hiding out until the heat wears off. As a matter of fact, he asked that none of the waiting staff answer any questions about him, especially questions posed by people we've never seen before. The waiter's voice grew increasingly quiet and his face grew increasingly worried. Valkyrie flashed him her best smile. That's probably wise. So no one else has come looking for him then? No woman with silver hair? The waiter didn't answer. I'll take that as a no. He's upstairs, is he? How do I get to him? Now that I think about it, the waiter said, you do look awfully familiar. Then at least I'm not someone you've never seen before. I think I've seen you kill thousands of people. Ah, Valkyrie said, that wasn't me. That was Darkess. I didn't kill anyone. The stairs are through here, are they? That means you're Valkyrie Kane, said the waiter. You work for the High Sanctuary. Actually, no, I'm an arbiter now. What's that? We don't work for the sanctuaries. We're our own bosses with our own jurisdiction. But you're still a detective, aren't you? Oh, yes, very much so. Am I in a lot of trouble? Not from me, said Valkyrie. As long as you tell me where Quidnunk is. The waiter sagged. Through there and up the stairs. He's in the East Room. Please don't tell him I told you. You have my word. He took out his notepad, flipped to a blank page and held it out. Could I have your autograph? Valkyrie frowned. I'm sorry. I've never met a famous person before. I'm not famous. I've heard of you. But that doesn't mean I'm... Listen, I don't give autographs. That's weird. 
It's weird that you would ask me, and it's weird that you'd think I'd do it. There you are, Skullduggery said, walking in behind her and brushing at his suit. Who won? Valkyrie asked. We fought to a standstill, Skullduggery said. Do we know where Quidnunc is? Upstairs. Then let's go talk to him. Excuse me, said the waiter, and held out his notepad and pencil. Can I have your autograph? Of course, Skullduggery said, signing with a flourish before handing the notepad back. Valkyrie, lead the way. They left the waiter and went upstairs, followed the signs to the east room, and came to the closed door. They heard the splash of water from within, and Skullduggery waved his hand, and the door burst open. It was a good-sized room, with a large bed and a little table with flowers on it, and a bathtub with clawed feet in the middle of the floor. A naked, middle-aged man stood with one foot in the tub, his eyes wide and his mouth open. Ew! said Valkyrie. The man screeched and scrambled, knocked against the table, the vase of flowers smashing to the ground. He dropped to his knees on the other side of the bed, his modesty covered. Thank you for that, said Valkyrie. Dr Quidnunc, is it? We've been looking for you. And we're not the only ones, Skullduggery said, taking a bathrobe from behind the door and tossing it to him. Do cover up, Doctor. There are ladies present. He's talking about me, said Valkyrie. Where's your mask? I was expecting a mask. Wh why would I be wearing a mask? Quidnunc asked, pulling on the robe. Because of your thing, Valkyrie said. The liquor fat sieve thing that rots your skin. Liquefactive necrosis, Quidnunc said. I don't need a mask or bandages or anything. I caught it early. My serum keeps it under control. Oh, said Valkyrie. That's disappointing. You've got to help me. My life is in danger. Then you should have turned yourself in before now. You'd be safe in a cell. I didn't want to be in a cell, Quidnunc said, tying the robe as he got to his feet. I didn't want to get arrested. But now that you're here and I don't have a choice, arrest me, please. Skullduggery folded his arms. First, you tell us where Kason is. No, Quidnunc said. First, you take me somewhere safe, somewhere with cleavers, and then I'll answer whatever questions you have. We can stand here arguing, Skullduggery said, or you can do it our way, and we'll bring you straight to the high sanctuary and lock you in their very safest cell. Once again, where is Kason? I... OK, I don't actually know the answer to that particular question. I'm sorry. They took him away. They didn't give me any warning whatsoever. They just arrived, told me I better scram if I wanted to live, told me Abyssinia was probably on her way and that she wouldn't be too happy to learn about all the experiments I'd been doing over the last few decades. So I said, OK, I will get myself gone. And I didn't ask any questions or... Stop, said Skullduggery. You talk an awful lot and you say very, very little of any actual relevance. Who are the people who took him? I don't know their names, said Quidnunc. There were five of them, very professional, but rude, you know. They didn't have time to chat. Not that I did either. I mean, my life was in danger. It still is, Valkyrie said. Who do they work for? Who do you work for? We asked Nye, but it didn't know. Quidnunc hesitated. Um, I'm not supposed to say... Say it anyway. I really don't think I should. You don't have a choice, Skullduggery said. Abyssinia is following the same trail we follow to get here, which means you don't have an awful lot of time. Tell us who you're working for. Quidnunc sighed unhappily. She is going to be so mad with me. She has a thing about loyalty, you know. Who does? Eliza Scorn? No, no, Miss Scorn worked for her for the time, but no, I work, we all work for Seraphina. Valkyrie didn't need to ask Skullduggery who that was. She'd heard the name a few times over the years, always in passing, always related to the Faceless Ones or the war. Seraphina of the Unveiled, Mevolent's wife. Skullduggery grunted, well, that's... Lovely. OK, tell us about Kason. Um, sure, said Quidnunc. He told me all sorts of things. When you, uh, um, 
experiment on someone for that long, you build up this strange kind of rapport, you know. It's almost like a friendship. Except not really, said Valkyrie. It's a sort of friendship, where one friend is physically torturing the other. I never tortured, Quidnunc said quickly. I experimented on. What kind of experiments? Quidnunc exhaled loudly. <sighs> All different kinds. Like his mother, Kason feeds on the life force of others, which meant I could keep healing him whenever he was in danger of dying. He really was the ideal specimen, you know. He smiled wistfully. The perfect subject. This is getting disturbing, said Valkyrie. So let's get back to the questioning. What did he tell you? I'm sorry. Can I put on my slippers? There's a broken vase on the floor and I'm afraid I might step on it. You're going to have to focus here, OK? What exactly did Kason tell you? Everything. Let's get a little more specific. What did he tell you about Abyssinia? He told me about the last time he saw her, how she was attacked. He mentioned you, Quidnunc said, looking at Skullduggery. He told me you were there. He wasn't lying. He said you and the rest of the dead men, plus the Diablerie, attacked her. The battle went on for days. Abyssinia was winning. On the last day, she told Kason to sneak away, but one of you caught him. China Sorrows, she caught him, and she was going to kill him if his mother didn't stop fighting. Did he tell you what happened next? His mother surrendered. You killed her. Skullduggery towered over him. Then what? What did he do after that? Where was he raised? What's he like? Who is he? I... I don't really know how to answer. Try. He's... savage, intelligent, resourceful. I guess he's everything you'd expect from someone with parents like his. Who was his father? Quidnunc swallowed. Take me to Roarhaven and I'll tell you. How about you tell us now, Valkyrie said. I don't particularly like to hurt people any more, unless I absolutely have to, but Skullduggery still finds the humour in it. Skullduggery shrugged and pulled his glove tighter round his right hand. I'm old-fashioned that way. Don't hit me, Quidnunc said immediately. Please, don't hit me. Skullduggery tilted his head. For a proud member of the sadist's club, you seem very squeamish when it comes to violence. Just violence perpetrated upon myself, Quidnook said. It's ironic, I know, maybe even hypocritical, but if that's the worst thing people say about me... It's not, Valkyrie said, cutting him off. Tell us what we want to know. Kason's father, his name. Quidnunc chewed his lip. And then you'll take me to Roarhaven. Pinky promise. Vile, said Quidnunc. His father was Lord Vile. Valkyrie blinked. A distant part of her mind counted the blinks. She blinked four times before turning to look at Skullduggery. Well, Skullduggery said. That's interesting. Chapter 24 Valkyrie took hold of the collar of Quidnunc's bathrobe and hauled him along after her. She opened the wardrobe, shoved him in and closed the door, then came back to Skullduggery. She hesitated a moment, then smiled calmly and, keeping her voice low, said, Can I ask a personal question? Go ahead, Skullduggery said. Remember when you were Lord Vile? Remember those days? Now, I know you were dressed in armour and everything, and you were all big and scary and whispery and sinister, but... You were... you were still a skeleton, right? Yes. So, and I mean this in the nicest possible way, there is absolutely no way that you could have had a kid, right? Right. At all? In the slightest. Okay. Probably. What? Valkyrie said. There is probably no way you could have had a kid? Where did this probably come from? We're talking about magic, Skullduggery said. People do tricky things with magic. I paid attention in biology, all right. Well, I didn't, but my reflection did. And what I remember about the whole baby-making process is that eggs don't fertilise themselves. If Gwidnonk is telling the truth, then Kason was either lying to him 
or Abyssinia lied to Kason about his father. Yes, Valkyrie said. That makes sense. That seems obvious. Because you're totally not the dad, right? Totally. Okay. Probably totally. Quidnunc knocked on the inside of the wardrobe. Hello? Can I come out now? Valkyrie opened the door, pulled him out. Get dressed, she said. We're going to want to talk about this a lot more when you're in your cell. Yes, Quidnunc said, grabbing his clothes off the floor. Thank you, yes. Could I make one request? No requests, said Skullduggery. It's just, as a cooperating witness, I thought maybe I'd be granted one small request. You're not a cooperating witness. You're under arrest. Quidnunc looked surprised. Am I? Skullduggery tilted his head. Aren't you? Didn't we place you under arrest? We may have forgotten. Dr. Quidnunc, you're under arrest. Put your trousers on. You haven't even read me my rights. Why does everyone think we operate according to mortal rules? We don't have mortal trials, do we? We have sensitives who can read your mind and proclaim your guilt or innocence. So I don't have any rights? Not any we have to read to you. Haven't you ever been arrested before? No. Well, now you'll know for next time. Quidnunc zipped up his fly and pulled on a shirt. He picked a shoe up off the floor and looked around. Can either of you see my other shoe? It looks just like this one. We know what a shoe looks like, Valkyrie responded. It's under the chair. Ah, Quidnunc said, moving to the other end of the room. He put both shoes on and started tying the laces. Skullduggery held the car keys out to Valkyrie. You'd better bring the car round. She raised an eyebrow. You're trusting me with the Bentley twice in the space of a few days. I should stay with the doctor in case Abyssinia arrives. Pull up on the street outside and we'll be waiting. Do not crash. Valkyrie took the keys, went to say something bitingly funny to Quidnunc, but Abyssinia was suddenly standing behind him. Chapter 25 Nero and another woman had teleported in with her, and Skullduggery moved at once, using the air to throw Nero off his feet, but Abyssinia had grabbed Quidnunc before they could stop her. Hello, my darling, she said to Skullduggery. Skullduggery froze. Hello, dear. And Valkyrie, said Abyssinia. She was wearing red. It was tight. It's so good to meet you. Formally, I mean, when I'm not sucking your life force out of you. I think perhaps that was rude. As was instructing Cadaverous Gant and Jeremiah Wallow to remove you as a potential obstacle on my path back to life. As it turns out, you are vital to my rebirth. You have both my thanks and my apologies. Valkyrie did her best to appear nonchalant. It happens. Abyssinia smiled. It was a beautiful smile, though it did seem unsettlingly wide. Forgiveness is truly a sign of a good soul. Nero stood up, scowling. My soul is not good, I'm afraid, Abyssinia continued. I've always had a problem with forgiveness. This man here, for example. I suppose I could forgive him for what he did to my son. Yes, Quidnunc whimpered his head held between her hands. Please! But then I think about all those experiments he carried out, Abyssinia continued, and all that pain he inflicted, and I am unable to think clearly. I can tell you things, Quidnunc said quickly. I can describe the people who took him. I know who took him, Abyssinia responded. Seraphina's people, five of them. I know they have my son in a private ambulance, and they're driving through Europe in a futile attempt to stay ahead of me. I know other things, Quidnunc said. I know lots. Do you? Abyssinia asked. Quidnunc winced suddenly, and Valkyrie felt a pressure in the room, like she was on a plane coming into land, and then the pressure was pierced, and Quidnunc cried out. Abyssinia shook her head. You lie, doctor. There's nothing else that interests me in your memories apart from all those decades of torture you put Kason through. It wasn't my fault, 
Quidnunc said, crying now. I was ordered to do it. Selfina told me. I know what she told you to do, Abyssinia said. And unlike you, I know why she told you to do it. I suppose you're not the real villain here. You're the instrument she used. Yes, Quidnunc said. I'm just the instrument. She put her lips to his ear. But even the instrument must be broken, Doctor. Quidnunc gasped and went pale, then purple, then yellow, his cheeks hollowing, his eyes drying up in their sockets, his body shriveling beneath his half-buttoned shirt. Glowing with stolen health, Abyssinia allowed the husk of his remains to fall at her feet and looked up. It's so good to be around you again, Skullduggery. I missed you when I was a heart in a box. I missed our talks. I would imagine good conversation is hard to come by when you're an internal organ. You see? You understand me. You always have. She switched her gaze to Valkyrie. This is not the first time we've spoken either, is it? I saw you in my vision, Valkyrie said. You touched me. How did you do that? I am the princess of the Darklands. I can do many things. She turned slightly. Nero, scary. Leave us, please. Ah, uh, is that wise? Nero asked. You are such a sweet boy, Abyssinia said. Thank you, but I'm perfectly safe here. I'll contact you when I need you. Go on now. Nero glanced at the woman called Skairi, but she remained impassive. A moment later, they vanished. There, Abyssinia said. Some privacy. I have to admit, Valkyrie, there are gaps in my memory when it comes to you. I think it happened when I drew from your strength. You're something of a mystery to me, which I find delightful, by the way. You're a book I have yet to read. No one's called me a book before. I've sensed you since that day, haven't I? Not me, Valkyrie said. Must be somebody else. She pressed on before Abyssinia revealed too much in front of Skullduggery. So this Darklands, is that a place? Or more like a state of mind type thing? It's here, Valkyrie. All around us. To the faceless ones... This entire planet is the Darklands. It's why they sought it out. It's why they fought so hard to stay. This is their holy land. It's why they want to come back. Hmm. I hadn't heard that before. Abyssinia smiled. Of course not. You haven't read the Book of Tears, have you? You haven't listened to its sermons. I would recommend it, if you have the time. It could change your life. I don't think so, said Valkyrie. To be honest with you, I never like going to regular church, let alone crazy church. Abyssinia laughed. <laughs> you think the mortal religions sound any less fantastical? At least our gods are real. You faced them, didn't you? You were there when they visited ten years ago. I was there all right. They came back, my head felt like it was going to explode, and they killed a bunch of people, mostly their own worshippers, so that's one good thing about them. Pity you missed it. Yes, it is. I do so love a family reunion. Skullduggery tilted his head. Family? Abyssinia bit her lip. Here it comes. Everything I kept from you when we were... dating... Could you call it dating? Let's call it dating. I'm royalty, darling. My bloodline can be traced back to the faceless ones themselves. Valkyrie frowned. I don't get it. My family comes directly from the first faceless one to take human form. Not to possess a human body, mind you, but to actually become a human body. It was to be the start of a whole new species before the ancients rebelled. And I thought we shared everything, Skullduggery murmured. Oh, don't be mad with me, my love. My father swore us all to secrecy. 
If our enemies, of which there were many, learned of our heritage, they would seek to destroy us. Wait, Valkyrie said. Skullduggery, are you actually believing her? He shrugged. You're descended from the last of the ancients. Why can't she be descended from the faceless ones? Because at least my ancestors were human, not an insane god who put on a human face and went out and got lucky. Abyssinia, are you sure your family wasn't just full of it? Abyssinia's smile dimmed. Do not speak ill of my family. Sore subject. My mother was a beacon of love, and my father had the blood of gods in his veins. You have no idea how better off the people of this world would have been if my parents ruled over them. We've been to a world overrun by the faceless ones, Skullduggery said. It was not a fun place. My father had no intention of bringing them back, Abyssinia said. Why would he? They had their time, and that time ended. Now it was our turn. A thousand years ago my father was about to reveal the truth to the world and rally the righteous to our banner. We would have overthrown the mortal civilizations. We would have cured disease, ended famine, made countless lives better. So long as the mortals knelt before you. A little kneeling never hurt anyone, said Abyssinia. Your dad, Valkyrie said. Would he be the king of the Darklands by any chance? That was his title, yes. It's not any more. When I was still a child, said Abyssinia, my father was betrayed by his most gifted and trusted student, murdered on the cusp of greatness. Oh, I hate that, Valkyrie said. I hate being murdered on the cusp of things. You're quite an insolent young lady, aren't you? I have my moments, said Valkyrie. This gifted student, Skullduggery said. Who was he? Abyssinia smiled thinly. You haven't figured it out yet? I have, said Skullduggery. But I want confirmation. He killed your father, both your parents? I imagine your whole family. Maybe you were the only one who escaped. He was probably unaware of this, as he wouldn't have stopped hunting you if he'd known you were alive. So that means you, or more likely someone still loyal to you, killed a child of roughly the same age and appearance and presented the body to him as your own. Who are we talking about? Valkyrie asked. The gifted student, Skullduggery said, who went on to unite the disciples of the Faceless Ones and start a war that would last for centuries. Mevolent, Valkyrie said slowly. She looked back at Abyssinia. But then that means... Your father was the unnamed. That's what they called him. Valkyrie nodded. I don't know what to do with that information. So why does Mevelin's wife have your son? Skullduggery asked. Does it matter? Abyssinia responded. It's Seraphina. Seraphina does what Seraphina does, and she always has. Have you met her, Valkyrie? I haven't. You wouldn't like her. Would she, Skullduggery? She wouldn't like her. Seraphina is... unlikable, wouldn't you say? I've always thought so, Skullduggery said. Yes, she's beautiful, said Abyssinia. Yes, she's alluring. Yes, every step she takes is a sensuous moment to be savoured by all who bear witness. But there are more beautiful... China Sorrows, for example. A more beautiful person I have never seen than China Sorrows. There are those more alluring also, whose footsteps are even more sensuous than Seraphina's. She sighed. Even so, as unlikable as she is, she does possess a certain... something. Does she not, Skullduggery? I suppose she does. Would you say Seraphina is more beautiful than me? I would not. Abyssinia laughed. <laughs> Come now, you can be honest. With our history, with what we've shared, honesty is surely the least we can expect from each other. 
I am being honest, Skullduggery said. My criteria for judging beauty have broadened considerably since the last time we spoke. Seraphina may be physically attractive, but she's a monster. This is true. Of course, Skullduggery continued. You're a monster too. Abyssinia smiled. We're all monsters here. Such darkness I see before me. Lord Vile and Darkess. How many innocent lives have you two snuffed out? How much blood is on your hands? Plenty, said Valkyrie. Plenty, Abyssinia echoed. This is indeed true. Everyone knows about you, Valkyrie. They fear you, don't they? They resent you. They positively hate you. But Skullduggery's dark side remains a secret. It's why I sent Skeiri and Nero away. A secret is only fun when it's kept. How would the sanctuaries around the world react, I wonder, to the truth? Maybe I should tell them. Oh, Skullduggery, how I wish you had a face. I would love to see if you were scared or nervous or resigned at the very notion. Instead, all I get is this. Blank skull. Does it bother you, Valkyrie? Does it bother you that you can't tell what he's feeling? I can tell, Valkyrie said. Abyssinia looked at her and didn't say anything. Quidnunc let slip something interesting, Skullduggery said. Something Kason told him when he was being tortured. Abyssinia took a moment to take her eyes off Valkyrie. Oh? He seems to think Lord Vile is his father. Why would you lie to him about that? You think it's a lie? I may not remember every single thing I did when I wore that armor, but I'd recall fathering an impossible child. Not impossible, my love. There have always been ways to conceive a child with magic, even back then. I'm not his father. Oh, Skullduggery, you don't know what you are. What about your anti-sanctuary friends? Do they know about any of this? Do the first wave kids? They all know you're looking for Kason, obviously, but do they know he's the future king of the Darklands? Do they know of his heritage? We are united, if that's what you're wondering. You're united because you're lying to them, Skullduggery said. You sold them on a sorcerer's rule, the world idea. But what you're talking about now is something different. You're talking about you ruling the world, your son taking his rightful place on the throne, and you standing behind him. That's why you sent Nero and Scary out, isn't it? You're afraid if they find out what you're really up to, they'll leave. Abyssinia smiled. I suppose we all have our secrets. But that's not the only reason I've sent them away. I seek a truce, Skullduggery. After everything you've done? Not for me. For Kason. You murdered me before he'd even taken a name to protect himself. He's never known a mother's love, let alone a father's. He's had the cruelest of lives, and once I get him back he will assume the title of the King of the Darklands, the same king that Augur Darkly is prophesied to battle and possibly kill. I implore you, I beseech you, to talk to the Darkly boy. Convince him not to hunt down our son. In return, I will take Kason and leave, and you will never hear from either of us again. You want to negotiate? That's unlike you. Not when it comes to our son. Don't call him that. He's like you, you know. He grew up tall. Valkyrie interrupted. Why don't you go after Augur? I've thought about it, said Abyssinia. It would, admittedly, solve my problems to just kill the boy. But prophecies are complicated things. Who's to say that an attempt on the Darkly boy's life wouldn't lead him to this fateful confrontation with Kason three years from now? No. A peaceful solution is the most desirable, I think. You'll walk away, 
Skullduggery asked. You'll abandon the people who follow you. They'll follow someone else. I've given them what they needed. I've started them on the road. Some of them are already beginning to turn away from me. It was inevitable. But they refused to see it. Tell us where Coldheart Prison is, and we'll talk. Oh, no, no, Skullduggery. This truce I offer is for me and Kason only. You will have to deal with my friends on your own. Will you let us walk away? I'm sorry, Abyssinia. You're too dangerous. You've always felt that the world owes you something. Now that I know you think it owes you fealty, I can't trust you. You're a threat. You will always be a threat. Abyssinia sighed. So you are turning down my offer of a truce? Unfortunately, yes. Then you know what has to happen now. I do. Valkyrie tensed. Nero and Scary teleported in. Skullduggery pulled his revolver and Nero dived on him and they both disappeared. Valkyrie raised her arm, energy crackling, but Scary's palm opened just like she had seen Razia's do, and a tentacle, just like Razia's, except green, shot out, and that tentacle plunged right between the open zip of Valkyrie's jacket, straight into her chest. Chapter 26 Valkyrie gasped, stepped back. Both hands closed round the tentacle. It was warm, slick, it pulsed with life. She dropped to her knees. Inside her chest, the head of the parasite squirmed. Scary held up her other hand. Her palm opened. The second parasite readied itself, aimed right at Valkyrie's face. It launched, but Valkyrie caught it one-handed. It snapped at her. With her free hand, Valkyrie grabbed a shard of broken vase and slashed, severing the parasite's head from its body. Scary screamed, and both tendrils retracted into her palms, and she staggered back, clutching her right wrist, sobbing. Blood drenching her T-shirt, Valkyrie got up. Abyssinia took hold of her, threw her against the wall. A framed picture was dislodged, fell. Valkyrie's weak knees, hot blood against cold skin, Abyssinia's hand on Valkyrie's head, her mind peering into Valkyrie's thoughts. Confident. Arrogant. Vulnerable. Valkyrie's hands clutched Abyssinia's head. Chapter 27 Valkyrie drowned in memories. They overwhelmed her. She was lost to them, her own identity nothing but a drop in the vast ocean of Abyssinia. Pain and love and conflict, hatred and strength, peace and vengeance. Faces and voices Valkyrie had never known, suddenly as sharp as those of her own parents. Valkyrie went under. This was a mistake. Doing this was a mistake, but there was no way out now. She was being crushed by a life she'd never lived, where everything was new, where everything was alien. And yet, in all that newness, something familiar. She swam towards it. She was on a hilltop, hunkering in front of a dying man. Blood seeped from a wound in his belly. She prodded him in the chest with her finger. He winced and opened his eyes. Oh no, he said when he saw her. Valkyrie smiled. Hello, she said. No, it was Abyssinia, not Valkyrie. This was Abyssinia's memory. And yet it was Valkyrie who spoke. They left you behind, did they? She said. A terrible thing to leave a comrade behind. You go to the trouble of attacking a village and killing all of these fine, fine people. And at the first whiff of a stab wound to the gut, they leave you in their wake. You have my sympathies, brave warrior. Please, said the dying man. I know who you are. Help me. Valkyrie laid a hand on his shoulder and looked him in the eye. I will help you. I would be honoured to help you. But first, I am in need of some information about these friends of yours. Ask me anything, 
said the dying man. But Valkyrie shook her head. You don't have to speak, she said. Conserve your strength. Let me do the work. She ignored his look of confusion and sent her thoughts into his, like the tip of a spear sliding into soft flesh. She felt his alarm and she pushed it to one side, focusing instead on his memories. They opened before her every intimate detail of this dying man's life. But she cared little for the intimate details. She absorbed the recent memories, the moment the dying man and his eleven companions came across this village of mortals, the death they brought with steel and magic and cudgel. She watched through his eyes as one of the mortals, a desperate woman defending her children, ran him through before she too was cut down. They abandoned you, Valkyrie said, leaving his mind. After all you've done for each of them, they left you here to die alone. Please, the dying man said. Help me. Of course, said Valkyrie, and rested her hand across his forehead, drawing out what remained of his life and taking his energy for herself. The empty shell of his body toppled sideways, and she straightened. Eleven of them, she said, going north, six hours ahead of us. Skullduggery stood over another corpse, his hood up, casting his skull in darkness. The wind plucked at the tail of his coat. His sword lay heavy across his back. Valkyrie walked over. Did you hear what I said? she asked. Eleven of them, he repeated to her. Six hour head start. Valkyrie touched Skullduggery's arm. They're just mortals, she said gently. There's so many of them in the world that I doubt anyone will notice their loss. He turned his head to her ever so slightly. You think I grieve for them? You don't? Maybe once I would have. Maybe once such mindless slaughter would have stirred grief within me, or righteous fury. Valkyrie bit her lip. But no longer. Now I feel nothing but contempt, Skullduggery said, for their weakness, for their short, vulnerable lives, for the sheer pedantry of their existence. A smile broke across Valkyrie's face. My love, she said, you have finally joined me. She pulled away from the memory, heaving herself back into the ocean. She was herself again, Valkyrie Kane. And Valkyrie Kane had parents and a sister and a dog, and she wasn't Abyssinia, and she hadn't been the one to encourage Skullduggery's descent. Because, of course, Skullduggery didn't need any encouragement. Valkyrie was in darkness, watching as Skullduggery donned the black armour. Cold flame flickered off the walls. He worked slowly, methodically, with buckles and strap and belts. Piece by piece the armour went on, each segment sliding into place, covering him, burying him, sealing him away, until at last the helmet went on and Skullduggery Pleasant was gone and there was only Lord Vile. No! She didn't want to see this. She didn't want to see Skullduggery like this. She didn't want this memory. It wasn't even hers. It belonged to Abyssinia, and Valkyrie wasn't Abyssinia. She hadn't watched her father die, and she hadn't joined Mevelin's army in order to get close to the man who'd killed him. She was in the hall, in the great hall in Mevelin's castle, and she was talking making a speech while they all looked on. She was at the top table. Mevelin's wife may have been seated at his right side, but Valkyrie was seated to his left. She could see the resentment in the eyes of the gathered sorcerers, Serpine in particular. Baron Vengeus was without expression, and beside him, China Sorrows smiled, as if she was delighted that Valkyrie had been chosen as Mevelin's favourite. All her plans had led her to this point. As she spoke, Valkyrie glanced behind her to where Lord Vile stood. 
upon hearing certain words, he would strike, plunging his sword through Mevelin's back. And then, while he killed Seraphina before she could even stand, it would be she herself who took Mevelin's head. And yet... Eight had a cruel sense of humour, it seemed. Her plans, as careful as they were, as precise in their execution as their planning, had scattered before her mere hours earlier, when she had learned of the child growing within her. Suddenly her thoughts of vengeance were nothing but smoke on the wind. Mevolent had robbed her of her family, though he did not know it, and yet she had the potential for a new family. She didn't need to kill him. She didn't need to take what was his. She could slip away in the night and seek happiness elsewhere. Behind her, Vile waited for words that would never come. Valkyrie paused in her speech, took a drink of wine, and found herself with her hand on her belly. She looked down and smiled. This would be her final night in the castle. And it was. The tip of the sword slid through her chest, and Valkyrie frowned. There were cries from the crowd. She was lifted off her feet as the pain blossomed. Vile. He had betrayed her. She almost laughed. Her feet kicked feebly as he carried her to the window on the end of his sword. Mevolent and Seraphina, she noted, never even looked up from their meal. Lord Vile threw her into the glass and it shattered around her and she fell into darkness the wind snatching at her clothes and her hair, and she fell and fell, and the rocks met her at the bottom and broke her body. She blinked up at the stars. It was all she could do. Her strength had saved her from an immediate death, but that strength was leaking from her with every moment. She tried to touch her belly, but could not move her hands. Tears mixed with the blood on her face. I'm sorry, she thought, for her lips could not form words. I'm sorry, my child. Sadness overtook the pain, and Valkyrie wept, and tore herself from the memory, and gasped, and looked down at herself, and saw the hole in her chest. She was back in the East Room, back in the Sadists' Club, back in Roarhaven, and Abyssinia was stumbling away, and Valkyrie sank down, her back against the wall, while Skeiri wailed in the corner. Skullduggery and Nero came back, Nero crying out, Skullduggery kneeling on him, pressing the revolver into his head. He looked up, saw Valkyrie, immediately left Nero where he lay and hurried over. Nero pushed himself up, recognised a no-win battle when he saw it, and vanished, along with Abyssinia and scary. Valkyrie, Skullduggery said, pressing his hand against the wound. Valkyrie, can you hear me? You're going to be okay. You're going to be fine. She tried to speak, but couldn't. And as he lifted her into his arms, the world drew in, and darkness swallowed her. Chapter 28 the first classes of the day were business studies and double combat arts. Omen didn't mind combat arts. He'd been through it all before, when the best trainers in the world had taught Augur how to hit and Omen how to get hit. Now it was different. Now Omen was no longer the punch bag, and it was quite startling, to his classmates, to his teacher, to Omen himself, how much of that training he had absorbed over the years. The only thing that prevented Omen from being one of the best in the class was the fact that he appeared to possess absolutely no aggression. At all. In the slightest. Which was a problem when it came to fighting. These two classes turned out to be more theory than practical, and nobody broke much of a sweat, which meant Omen could skip the weekly torture of showering with the rest of the boys. Instead, he got dressed quicker than usual and found Never in the corridor. Hey! he said. Never looked up, hesitated and smiled. His hair was tied back today. Hey. I was thinking, Omen said, about what we were talking about on Friday. 
never frowned. Remind me. You know, we were talking about the fact that I'm sitting around, waiting for Skullduggery and Valkyrie to call me off on an adventure. That was you. I was thinking maybe... I mean, obviously you had a point. I am me. And if I reacted badly to it, then I'm sorry. I just... I don't want to be boring. I don't want to be like everyone else. And I had a taste of what it's like to have a life like that, like augurs, and I... <sighs> he sighed. Don't worry about it, said Never. Well, I am worrying about it, Omen said. And you know me better than probably anyone. And you were only trying to make me see sense. Seeing sense is good, Never said. Are we friends again? When did we stop? I mean, we haven't really chatted in the last few days and I thought you were mad at me or something. I'm not mad at you, monkey. I've just been busy. I'm a very busy person, you know. Like, right now? Right now, I'm busy. Omen laughed. Right now, you're talking to me. And I'm busy. So, like, wrap it up. Oh, said Omen. Oh, right, sorry. Um, well, that's it, I suppose. Never put a hand on Omen's shoulder. Good talk. I'm glad we did this. It's important, I think, to be able to talk about stuff. So, who are you waiting for? Never took his book back. I'm not waiting for anyone. Is it a new boyfriend? How do you know I'm not still with Wilder? Omen grinned. He's not your type at all. He's too loud. Never shrugged. Also, he'd never been out with someone as amazing as me. So, I think he got intimidated. Ah, well, his loss. So, who's the new guy? There actually isn't one. I'm off the market at the moment. I feel I need some space to reconnect with myself. To rediscover my own vitality. What kind of books have you been reading? Books with words and no pictures, so they'd be of no interest to you. He checked his watch. OK, I've got to get going. Omen, you have a good one. Omen laughed. <laughs> I'll try my very best, but I will find out what you're... And never teleported away. Omen! Omen turned as Ornia ran up. He blinked, not expecting to see her in the school corridor like this. Ornia! Hi! What are you doing here? I'm lost, she said. Her eyes were watery, like she was about to start crying. All of the ambassadors are being brought in to discuss our concerns. And I was with the group and then I got distracted. This school is... Huge! This is the biggest building I've ever been in. Back home our school is a single room in my uncle's house. So you got lost, said Omen. OK, that's cool. I can help you. Come on. They started walking, Ornia hugging herself and sticking close to his side. He noticed her shrink away from the people they passed, like a mistreated cat. Do you remember what room you were supposed to be heading to? He asked. No, she said. I wasn't really listening. I've barely heard anything that's been said since we arrived here. How does anyone get anything done here? I still haven't figured that out myself, to be honest. You said that mortals have schools here too. Proper schools. Are they as big as this? Omen shrugged. It depends. I mean, I suppose some of them are. The really exclusive ones, but most of them aren't. What was it like growing up here? She asked. Oh, I didn't. I grew up near Galway. Do you have Galway in your dimension? Yes. I grew up near there, in a small town, all very normal. My family's magic. But Roarhaven wasn't a city back then, so we lived among mortals and basically pretended to be like everyone else. We even had mortal names and stuff. I liked it, actually, being just like everyone else. I suppose I fit in better as a mortal than I do as a sorcerer. Why don't you fit in as a sorcerer? I'm just not very good at it. My brother, Augur, he's good at it. He's really good at it. But then he's so good at everything. I was never much good at anything. But you can do magic. Yes, he said. Not much, but I can. Do you want to see? Ornia looked alarmed and shook her head. OK, said Omen quickly. That's cool. She actually smiled. You use that word again. Cool. Why is cool a good thing? 
I don't really know. I suppose it came from, maybe, America, from back in the 1960s, when everything was cool and groovy and stuff. Ah, said Ornia. So that's why we don't use the word like you do. We don't have an America where I'm from. How can you not have a country? Oman asked, frowning. Well, we have it. It's there. It exists. But no one lives there any more. Mevelant killed everyone in America hundreds of years ago and poisoned it all. The land, the water, the air. Wow. Yes. So you guys don't have Elvis or Jennifer Lawrence or Spider-Man or anyone? I don't know who they are. Elvis was a singer and Jennifer Lawrence is in movies and Spider-Man swings from buildings and stops crime. Is he a sorcerer too? No, he was just bitten by a radioactive spider. It's so weird that you don't have those things. Not really, Ornia said, shrugging. From where I stand, it's normal. And actually having an America with people in it, that's, like you said, the thing that's weird. He led her up the west staircase. She was no longer hugging herself. With every step she took, she was growing in confidence. He wished he was like that. She laughed suddenly. I'm sorry, she said. I never thought this would happen. He grinned along with her. What would happen? This, she said, gesturing to their surroundings. Sorcerers everywhere and I'm just walking through them all. It's a different world. Yes, it is. Axelia passed, eyes on her phone, and Omen waved to get her attention and said, Axelia, hey! She looked up, smiled automatically. Hey, she said. Axelia, said Omen. This is Ornia. Ornia's part of the volunteer group from the camp. Do you know where the rest of them are? I was just helping out with them, Axelia said. They're in Meritorious Hall. The meeting hasn't started yet, so you'll be fine. It's very good to meet you, Ornia. And you, said Ornia. Axelia smiled again and walked on, and Omen took Ornia right and down a corridor. She's very pretty, said Ornia. Is she? said Omen. Everyone here has such wonderful hair. Is it because of the shampoo? You don't have shampoo where you're from. Maybe the sorcerers do, but mortals use soap. My family received a bottle of shampoo in one of our care packages, though, and last night I washed my hair and... And it's wonderful. Your hair does look extra shiny today. She laughed again. Thank you. The door to Meritorious Hall was open. Inside, sorcerers and mortals were finding their seats. Here we are, Omen said. Ornia clasped her hands. Thank you, Omen. Thank you so much. No probs. Problem. No problem. She looked at him for a little bit and then looked away. Well, I'd better go. Wait, he blurted. Yes? Um, would you like to do something? I am doing something. I'm walking. No, like, do something. I don't think I understand. With me, said Omen. Would you like to do something with me? Tomorrow, maybe. It's just that I enjoy talking to you and spending time with you. And I was wondering if maybe you'd like to, um, do it again? Ornia frowned. Are you trying to court me? I don't know. I think so. Huh. So, what do you think? We have strict rules for courting where I'm from, said Ornia. First, you must ask my parents. Yeah, right, that makes sense. And then my brother. He's very protective of me, though, so that might be difficult. I can do it. And then you have to seek permission from the twelve village leaders. All twelve? And before they make their ruling, you must do the love dance in the streets. <laughs> I don't have much rhythm, but, well, I suppose I could get my dancing shoes on. No shoes, she said. The love dance is performed without clothes. When the dance is over... You must sing the traditional ballads, also naked. 
Then and only then will we receive the blessing of my people and we shall be wed. My family will be expecting a child within the first year, so naturally you will have to commit to a lifetime of... She grinned suddenly. A grin so pretty it made Omen's heart lurch. I'm joking. We don't have strict rules for courting and we don't have to get married or have babies. The look on your face, however. Omen barked out a laugh and felt the tension rush from his body. That was mean. That was very mean. I would like to talk to you tomorrow, Omen. So the answer is yes. He gave a grin of his own. Cool, he said. Chapter 29 Here in this small town in Tuscany, where the streets were impossibly narrow, was where the flaw in the otherwise flawless route that Serafina's people had planned out would be exploited. This was where Cadaverus would ambush the ambulance. Sitting in the shade, Cadaverus glanced at his watch. It was just gone midday. The ambulance was almost here, and there were no mortals about. This was beyond perfect. She cut it off, Razia said. Just swish, cut it right off. Cadaverus didn't respond. Razia looked up. She deserved it, of course. Scary, I mean. Ooh, I'm so great. I'm taking Razia's place. And now she has one less tentacle. That's the moral of the story right there. Nero teleported in. They're coming, he said. Did it look like it hurt? Razia asked. What Valkyrie did to Scary? Nero sighed. Are you still talking about this? It was ages ago, okay? It was yesterday. How am I supposed to remember what happened or what hurt or what didn't? All I know is she wouldn't stop moaning about it. Cadaverus stood. In positions, everyone, he said. Nero scowled. And why are you the one giving orders? I'm the one who should be in charge. Is that so? Nero shrugged. You're all getting sidelined now that Abyssinia has her pick of people from Coldheart. I'm the only invaluable one. I should get to call the shots. If you're so invaluable, Razia said, how come you're here with the rest of us? I don't really know, Nero answered. Pity, maybe. Or perhaps, said Cadaverus, for all your stupidity, you have still managed to recognise how easy it is to fall from Abyssinia's favour. Let's be honest, you didn't exactly acquit yourself well during that encounter with Pleasant and Kane, did you? A glowering stare. I did okay. You're here to prove yourself, Cadaverus told him. And until you do, you take orders from your betters. Whatever, Nero muttered. Destria, Cadaverus said, if you would. Destria nodded and walked to the middle of the road. For a few seconds there was silence. The warm breeze kicked up a little dust on the road. It's not like I don't have sympathy for her, Razia said from behind cover. I wouldn't like to lose my guys. They're my guys. But Scary shouldn't have tried to take my place. Razia, Cadaverus said. Maybe we should focus now, if that's okay. She nodded. Fair point, mate. Absolutely. She settled, and Cadaverus readied himself. The ambulance, to all outward appearances a beaten-up old truck, came round the corner. Upon seeing Destrier, the driver immediately picked up speed. The passenger window whirred down and a gun poked out. But by then, Destrier already had his hand raised. The ambulance slowed so much it looked like it had stopped. But Cadaverus could still see the wheels turning, could still see the little pine car freshener in the shape of a strawberry, caught in time-compressed limbo as it tried to swing from the rear-view mirror. The faces of the men inside, frozen into grimaces, didn't register Razia strolling up and opening the driver's door. She reached in, unbuckled the driver and hauled him out. His fall was a fall through treacle. 
but Razia was already kicking the passenger out of the other side. Then she settled in behind the wheel and gave Destrier a thumbs up. Destrier dropped his hand, and time around the ambulance returned to normal. The driver and passenger hit the road, hard, and flipped and rolled, and Razia brought the ambulance to a gentle stop. Cadaverous approached the back of the ambulance. The driver and passenger were groaning, moaning, trying to get up. Razia hopped out of the van, broke the driver's neck, and opened her hand towards the passenger, now stumbling to his feet. Her palm opened, and the parasite shot out, spearing the passenger through the neck before retracting. The ambulance doors burst open. A woman lunged at Cadaverous, fire in her hands. Nero teleported her away before she could actually do anything, and Cadaverous climbed in. Cason lay strapped to a gurney. He was tall, thin, and malnourished. His skin was waxy, his silver hair cut short, clumps of it missing, showing his scalp. His eyes were closed. He looked dead. Cadaverous pulled away all the tubes and electrodes and undid the straps. Grunting slightly with the effort, he pulled Cason onto his shoulder and crab-walked to the door. He dropped down. I could help, said Razia. No, it's okay, Cadaverous said, nodding behind her. You're going to need your hands free. Three sorcerers stood there, legs apart and fists clenched. They looked impressively intimidating. We're going to need that back, said the biggest one. You mean Kason? Cadaverous responded as Destrier and Razia moved to stand beside him. No, 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 we're not taking him. We wouldn't take him without asking. How rude. We're just borrowing him. We'll bring him back, honest. He is the property of Serafina. Then where is she? If he's so important to her, let her come and present her case. We will absolutely return him to you if she does that. If Serafina gets on her knees and begs. The big one's eyes narrowed. You shouldn't say the things you're saying. Why does she want him anyway? Why is she doing this? Torturing someone for sixty years? That's a commitment few people would be willing to make. What's he done that's so terrible? You can ask Serafina yourself, providing we let you live long enough. I hate the talking bit, Razia mumbled. Sorry, the big one said, his irritation rising. What was that? The talking bit, she repeated. I hate it. It's boring. Can we get to the killing bit? That's where the fun is. Take it from me, beautiful. You don't want us to get to the killing bit. Razia swiveled her head. Did you just call me beautiful? The big one smiled. What can I say, sweetheart? I have a thing for lunatic blondes. Sweetheart? Beautiful? Lunatic blonde? Razia shook her head slowly. I have a name. I know I have a name because I picked it myself. Now, while I may be a sweetheart, and I sure am beautiful, and I am undoubtedly both a lunatic and a blonde, my name is Razia, and that is what you'll be gurgling as I kill you. Razia ran at them. Destria moaned reluctantly, but joined her, and Nero appeared right behind Serafina's people. Cadaverous just turned and carried Cason away from the ambulance. The breeze was picking up as he lay Abyssinia's son on the ground and once again sat in the shade. He faced away from the fighting. He didn't need to see it. No matter how good Serafina's crew were, he had faith in his own. They'd been through a lot together. For years they'd worked behind the scenes, carrying out Abyssinia's commands when she was nothing but a heart in a box. Yes, back then they'd had smoke and lethe to bolster their strength, and yes, their loss had weakened the team considerably, but they were more than a match for their opponents. Cadaverous took a gun from his jacket and flicked off the safety. It was a pity what was about to happen. 
When the last moan of pain was abruptly cut off, he stood and turned. Destrier, Nero, and Razia, triumphant as expected, walking away from the dead bodies of their enemies. My friends, said Cadaverous as they came forward, I would just like to take this opportunity to tell you how much I appreciate your talents. We may have had our disagreements over the years, we may have exchanged angry words, we may have said things we each regret. I haven't, Nero muttered. But there is no one else I would have even attempted this with, Cadaverous continued. You are some of the best, the most loyal, and the stupidest people I have ever had the pleasure to know. Nero frowned. What? Cadaverous struck Destrier on the temple with the butt of his gun and grabbed Nero before he could react, jamming the muzzle under his chin. My dear Razia, he said, if I see you raise an arm, I pull this trigger and Abyssinia loses her only teleporter. Nero tried to pull away. What the hell are you doing, old man? Shut up, boy, Cadaverous said, spinning him round and pressing the gun into his back. I don't get it, said Razia, looking genuinely confused. Sincerest apologies, Cadaverous said. But Kason isn't being returned to his mother. If she wants him, she'll have to come to me. I still don't get it. She doesn't care about us, Razia. We're disposable. She doesn't care if we get hurt. She doesn't care that Scary lost a pet. Not really. You can't see it because you don't want to see it. But she lied to us. She misled us. She tricked us into finding her heart and bringing her back to life. Those plans are hers, where we topple the sanctuaries and do as we please. That was never going to happen. She was always going to rule over us all, her and her son. She betrayed us, Razia. Kind of like how you're betraying me right now. I am sorry about that. You're not my enemy, unless you try to stop me. Are you going to try to stop me, Razia? Not when you got a gun, no. People always think you're crazier than you actually are. Oh, I'm pretty crazy, all right, Razia said. But I'm not crazy enough to steal Abyssinia's kid. She's gonna blow a gasket, mate. She's gonna rip you apart. She'll try. Razia made a face. Nero's crying. Is he? Cadaverous said. Nero, are you? You're gonna kill me, Nero sobbed. You are, aren't you? You're going to make me teleport you somewhere and then you're going to shoot me to stop me from bringing Abyssinia to you before you can escape. I don't want to die, Mr. Gant. Please don't kill me. Oh, I won't kill you, Nero. Why would I do that? After all we've shared. Remember that gentleman we killed in France? The man with the three eyes? Nero managed a happy gurgle. The three-eyed weirdo, yeah. Those are special moments for me, Nero. I'm not going to kill you. You're going to teleport Kason and me to that three-eyed gentleman's airfield. Remember it? I have a small plane waiting for me there. What are you going to do with me then? I'm going to have to render you unconscious. You're going to hit me? A near tap. You'll wake with a headache. Nothing more. You don't know that, Nero argued. You might give me brain damage. I guess that's true. But it's either that or I shoot you. Nero sagged. You can hit me. Thank you. Cadaverous looked back to Razia. Don't come after me. I won't have to. You take care now. Enjoy being alive, she said. While it lasts. 
Chapter 30 Valkyrie opened her eyes. Welcome back, Reverie Synecdoche said, barely raising her gaze from the chart at the foot of the bed. Hey, Valkyrie muttered, her tongue heavy. They were in Reverie's clinic, a building Valkyrie was getting to know well. She had a bandage taped to her chest. She was hooked up to a drip. The bed was comfortable, the pillow cool. It occurred to Valkyrie that the pillows in the clinic were always cool. Skullduggery told me to tell you that he's over at the High Sanctuary, waiting to talk to the Supreme Mage, Reverie said. He doesn't fancy his chances. Do you have magic pillows? Valkyrie asked. Why would we have magic pillows? Because they're always cool. We flip them a lot. How are you feeling? Disappointed about the pillows, but otherwise okay. She frowned. I feel drunk. That will fade. You had quite a nasty injury. Oh no. You were lucky. It missed your heart. I'm very lucky. Yes, you are. I went into her mind. Did you? Valkyrie nodded. Abyssinia's mind. I went in. Saw her memories. That's nice. It wasn't really. I'm not used to feeling drunk, you know. I don't drink. Well, I mean, I have drunk, you know. I have imbibed the alcohol. I'm just not used to it. I don't like being drunk. Of course you don't, Reverie said, coming closer and checking the drip. You're a control freak. Valkyrie's eyes widened. I am offended. I am not a control freak. How very dare you? I just like being in control of the situation at all times. Is that bad? Is that wrong? Not at all, Reverie murmured, making a note on the clipboard. Things have a habit, Valkyrie continued, of spiralling out of control. You think everything is one way, and then it goes poof, and it's all everywhere. I like to keep a handle on it. Try to keep it all together. You know what happens when things go all everywhere? Bad things happen. I've seen it. So I tried to scoop it all back into the basket. Did I mention the basket? There was a basket somewhere in this anatomy. Anatomy? Analogy. Analogy, yes. Thank you. There was a basket that I forgot to mention. The basket was holding everything and then... She sighed. Anyway, I'm not a control freak. Her eyes widened. I cut off one of Scary's thingies. That doesn't sound nice. Her thingy, her thing, with the snapping and the biting, the same as Razia. Razia has the same snappy and bitey thing. This is an interesting conversation. Valkyrie waved her arm like a snake, her hand snatching at the air. Ah, said Reverie, the parasite. Yes, said Valkyrie. I cut it off. I feel so bad. Do you think it's like I killed her pet? I don't want to kill her pet. I love animals. Reverie replaced the chart at the end of the bed, checked her watch and looked at Valkyrie. Was the parasite trying to attack you? Oh yes, Reverie, it really was. It was all... She made a scary face. Well now, Reverie said. It sounds to me like you had no choice. But I love animals. Valkyrie started to cry. Reverie patted her head. It's okay. You did the right thing. Do you think it'll grow back? The parasite. Do you think it'll grow back like a foot? Feet don't grow back, Valkyrie. You're thinking of lizard tails. The parasite won't grow back, I'm afraid. Oh, no. You were defending yourself. If this scary person really cared about her parasites, she wouldn't have sent them to attack you, would she? I suppose not. Valkyrie sniffled and wiped her nose. When can I leave? I'll have a nurse come by in about twenty minutes, take the tube out of your arm, and you'll be free to walk out of here. Cool. Can I take the pillows with me? No, they're ours. Just one of them then. This one. No. 
What about that one? No. Both? Neither. Half? A nurse will be in soon. You're mean. They're not your pillows, Valkyrie. They're still mean. Half an hour later, Valkyrie was feeling a lot less drunk. She got dressed, and the nurse gave her fresh gauze to change her dressing. Militza Gnosis was waiting in the lobby when Valkyrie walked out. I heard you'd been injured, she said. Thought I'd call round. I was going to bring flowers and grapes, but it occurred to me that you don't really seem like a flowers person. I'm really not, said Valkyrie, but I do like grapes. I should have brought grapes then. You want to go for a coffee? To be honest, Valkyrie said, I would love to. They stopped at the first coffee shop they came to and took a table at the back. So what was it that injured you? Melitza asked. Bullet? Knife? Arrow? Tentacle. Seriously? A tentacle with teeth that shot out of a lady's hand. Whoa! Yep, it's a parasite. It's called a... Well, it's called whatever it's called, but most people just call it a parasite. She hot? The parasite? The lady. Um, I suppose. Although Razzie is hotter. That's the Australian. Yep, they both have the parasites, but Razia has the most beautiful mouth. I think you'd like her. I have always been partial to a bad girl, Militza said, and sipped her coffee. You want to talk about it? About what? Getting injured? I'm always getting injured. Well, said Militza, you were always getting injured. But then you went away and you didn't get injured for years. Ah, I still got injured, Valkyrie said. I still trained. My instructor didn't exactly take it easy on me. Or you didn't take it easy on yourself. Meaning? Militza took another sip. I've known you, what, six months? Seven? Around that? I might be way off here. But when you left Ireland, you were so wrapped up in guilt over what Dark S had done, over what you yourself had done, that you were looking for exciting new systems of punishment. So you hid for five years from the people who loved you. And what? How did you spend your time? I fixed up an old house. OK. I got a talk. Good. I read a lot. Excellent. And I trained. You fought. I trained. I worked out. I sparred. And you got hurt. You can't train to fight without the risk of getting hurt. Militza shrugged. OK. I get that. Who was your instructor? Someone I found. You found someone good enough to train you after you'd spent years training with Skullduggery. That's a high bar to match. Now it was Valkyrie's turn to shrug. I get the feeling you don't want to talk about this, Melissa said. My mind's just not on it, that's all. There's a lot going on. And not just with me. Like, wherever you look, there's drama. What do you think of this whole refugees from another reality thing? Isn't that nuts? Have you seen it? The portal? Yeah. I usually view dimensional portals as a bad thing, but the people coming through just look so scared. We're helping them out at the academy, said Militza. It started with food and blankets, but the High Sanctuary seems to have handed us full responsibility for their well-being, which, you know, because they're still coming through, is a lot more than we can handle. Are you in charge? Well, I'm spearheading it, yes, but there's a load of volunteers. Then it'll be fine, Valkyrie said. So long as you're involved, they'll be all right. Thanks for the vote of confidence, Melissa said, smiling. But it is not what I signed up for. I'm a researcher and a teacher. I can barely organise my desk, let alone relief aid for thousands of terrified mortals. I keep imagining that one of these days I'll grow up and become someone who knows what they're doing. But so far that hasn't happened. Do you ever think about that? Growing older, I mean. Valkyrie shrugged. That's the good thing about magic, isn't it? Growing older isn't something we'll have to think about for another few hundred years. That's growing old, 
We don't have to worry about growing old. Growing older is different. We still do that. I suppose, Valkyrie said, her mind drifting to Alice, wondering what it would be like to watch her little sister grow up and age naturally, reaching her thirties, her forties, while Valkyrie still looked nineteen. Sometimes I look at people like the Supreme Mage, Militza was saying, or the Headmaster, or even Skullduggery. All of these people are hundreds of years old, and I don't know. I start to wonder what effect that has on them. Valkyrie drank her coffee. I'm not sure I get what you're talking about. I study magic, Militza said. It's what I do. It's what I love. But when I look at sorcerers who've been alive for centuries, I start to ask questions about whether or not it's worth it. I am so not getting this. Militza laughed. Never mind. I'm talking nonsense. No, no, said Valkyrie. Come on. What do you mean? Militza hesitated. They lose something, I think. The more lifetimes go by, the less human they become. I don't mean that in a bad way, at least not in general. But I think there's a sacrifice you make when you embrace magic. Maybe there is, Valkyrie said. But I don't agree with you about the less human thing. Yeah, OK, China's a bit of a mystery, but Skullduggery's a good person. To you? To the world, which he has saved a few times. I didn't mean to offend you. I'm not offended, really. I just think there's a price to pay. We're not immortal. And yet, compared to the mortal people we grew up with, our old friends and neighbours, compared with those poor people from the Leibniz universe, immortal is exactly what we are. And I think there's a sacrifice we have to make in order to live like that. A piece of yourself you cut away. How else are you going to be able to watch the mortals in your life grow old and die while you stay young? Valkyrie smiled and leaned forward. I do not wish to think about this right now. Militza leaned forward too. I do not blame you. Let us never speak of it again. That works for me, gorgeous. Militza blushed. A blush on a redhead was extremely noticeable. You're scarlet, Valkyrie said and laughed. Shut up, Militza replied, looking away to the front of the cafe. Oh, thank God, a change of subject. Valkyrie looked round. Skullduggery nodded to her from the door. She smiled at Militza. Be right back, she said, and joined Skullduggery outside. How are you feeling? he asked. Sore. Did you manage to speak with China? I did not. I should have stayed at the clinic. I should have been there when you woke. What for? You've seen me in one hospital bed. You've seen me in them all. I looked into her head, you know. Abyssinia. I took her by surprise, I think. She... It's like she opened the door into my thoughts. But instead of her walking through into my mind, I barged straight into hers. What did you see? Valkyrie hesitated. Skullduggery nodded. You saw me. Yeah, sorry. I kind of used you as an anchor to get through her memories. I saw you put on Vile's armour. I saw the night you stabbed her and threw her out the window. It's weird because it was me. I was experiencing her memories as her, so it was me you stabbed. Oh, that's most unfortunate. I sincerely apologise. I'm over it. That's good to know. Did you happen to see if the child is really yours? I didn't. Do you think he could be? You told Abyssinia you don't remember everything you did as Lord Vile. I didn't know that. There are periods that are hidden to me, Skullduggery said. Blank spots in my recollections. But you remember everything? Apparently not. Skullduggery, is Kaysen your son? I don't know. Would you want him to be? 
Skullduggery watched a tram pass and didn't answer. Militza's waiting for me, Valkyrie said. Call me in the morning, OK? I will. I'm glad you're alive, Valkyrie. Me too. She went back inside. Chapter 31 Omen waved frantically, but neither Skullduggery nor Valkyrie saw him, so he sat back in his seat, oddly dejected. A fellow tram passenger glared at him disapprovingly. The tram stopped at Shudder's gate, and he went the rest of the way to the city of tents on foot. Sorcerers passed without even glancing at him, and the cleavers stood silently on either side of the path. He could see his own reflection in their visors. He looked nervous, and his shirt had come untucked. He tucked it into his jeans again, tried to smooth down his hair, and fixed his eyes straight ahead as he walked. He didn't particularly like his reflection. It reminded him of what other people were seeing when he'd much rather forget about things like that. There was a fence now surrounding the camp, but he found the entrance and made his way to the market. He went up to Ornia at her stall. Hi, he said, unable to stop a smile from spreading across his face. How are you? You look really nice. Hi, Omen, Ornia said. She sounded deflated at the prospect of their date, and as much as he couldn't blame her, he did kind of feel hurt. Still, he pressed on. I was thinking that I could take you on a tour of Roarhaven, he said. There are some really cool parts, especially around the Arts District, that are just awesome. I can't go. Oh, he said. Oh, oh OK, that's fine. No, I mean, I can't physically go. They won't let me. Who? Omen asked. The village leaders? We don't have village leaders, Ornia said. That was a joke. But no, it's not any of my people. The grey coats won't let us through. The cleavers? Why not? We're not allowed to leave the camp without official supervision. I think they're worried that we won't go back. Or maybe that we'll steal something or cause trouble. But you'll be with me. I mentioned your name to the man in the uniform. He asked if you were the chosen one. Then another man in uniform said no, the chosen one's name was Augur and he didn't know who you were. Omen sagged. I get that a lot. Well, maybe you can show me around the camp instead. Maybe I could meet some of your friends. Ornia hesitated, and not in a good way. Or not, said Omen. My friends don't understand, Ornia said. My family doesn't either. Understand what? You. To them, all sorcerers are the same. They're all dangerous. I tried explaining that you're not like that. I told them about you. I told them what you were like. Oh, really? Omen said, trying not to smile. What did you say? I told them you were harmless. He frowned. Well, I mean, I'm not harmless. Harmless is like a puppy or a baby cow. It's called a calf. I'm not a calf. I mean, I'm no threat to you or them, but I'm... I didn't mean it as an insult. No, no, of course not. But I've done stuff, brave stuff. A few months ago, my life was in danger and I was fighting. I even broke a guy out of prison. Why did you do that? No, no, he was a good guy and it was a bad prison. My point is, I'm, I'm not... I don't want you to think that I'm boring. I mean, yes, most of the time I'm, I'm nothing. But I am capable of more. I've hurt your feelings. You haven't. I have. I'm really sorry. Omen shrugged. Don't worry about it. Really, I actually know some pretty important people. I could talk to them. I'm sure I can arrange something. And even if I can't, the cleavers aren't going to keep you confined forever, right? Once everything is cool, you'll be able to, like, go free? Ornia said. Well, yeah. Maybe we will, if we're allowed. It's really not like that, though. They're keeping you all in one place because it's safer. For who? We can't hurt you. You're sorcerers. But safer for you, then. I thought you said we were safe here. You are, but some people... They don't know if they can trust you. Just 
Give them time, I swear, and they'll realise that you're not a threat and everything will be cool. Ornia nodded slowly and stepped back. It was very nice seeing you again, said Omen. Yes. He didn't know what else to say. So he gave her a little wave and walked back to Shudder's gate. He took a tram back to school, but at the stop of the circle he saw his brother sprint past. Omen jumped up, squeezing through the doors right before they closed. Already Augur was disappearing round the corner. Omen ran after him, followed him into a side street and lost him down an alley. Omen chose a turn at random, then another, and was about to give up and head back when he heard the unmistakable sounds of fighting. Unable to think of any use he might actually be in a fight, Omen nonetheless followed the sounds down a narrow canyon of brick and cement, stepping through stagnant pools of water, his fists clenched, his heart beating madly. Suddenly there was a rush of footsteps, and then Mahala was there, her eyes glowing green, and she barged into him, and Omen hit the wall, and she sprinted on. She'd barely even noticed he'd been there. Omen! said Augur, limping up. What are you doing here? Omen scrambled up. I saw you, he said. I thought I'd come and see if you needed any help. Are you OK? I'm fine, Augur said. His shirt was ripped. Did you see Mahala? Omen nodded. Her eyes were doing that glowing thing you talked about. Augur sighed. Yeah, that's proving to be a problem. Case shuffled by, his face a mess of cuts and bruises. Hey, Omen. Hi, Case, Omen said, and Case shuffled on. Since you offered, said Augur, you mind helping me walk for a bit? I'm already healing, but I could use the assist. Sure, said Omen, and took his brother's weight as they made for the street. And hey, you know what you're doing and everything, and I don't want to intrude where I don't belong, but shouldn't you call someone? Like, not even Skullduggery or Valkyrie, but the city guard, maybe? We were going to, Augur said. I don't know if you've noticed, but the city guard are not the most thoughtful of people. This is Mahala we're talking about. It's going to take some pretty weird magic, a few more punches to the face and some good old-fashioned friendship, but we're going to help her and we're going to banish whatever's possessing her back to whatever hell it came from. Right, said Omen. Yeah, I can understand that. Do you need any help? Augur laughed. Toot, from what I've heard, you've got enough on your plate already. What do you mean? I heard about Axelia. Omen sighed. Of course you did. Augur smiled. She's a cool girl, a smart girl. Smart enough to turn me down. Hey now, come on, don't be hard on yourself. Ah, I'm okay about it. I knew she was going to say no. So you knew it was going to end badly, but you still had to try, huh? I will never understand people who say we're not alike. They emerged from the alley. Case was waving a green amulet about. It started to vibrate in his hand. She went this way, he said. Augur stood on his own. We gotta go. Are you sure you don't need my help? asked Omen. We've got this, said Augur. Case... You agree? We've got this, said Case. And what'll I say if the teachers start asking where you are? Augur grinned. Just tell them we're back where we belong, he said, and Case laughed and they started jogging away. Omen watched them go and didn't bother wondering what the hell Augur was on about. Chapter 32 Skullduggery called at a little after nine the next morning, shaking Valkyrie from a dream. Did I wake you? he asked. No, she croaked. It sounds like I woke you. Hold on. She grabbed the bottle of water from her bedside table, downed what was left. OK, she said. I can talk now. Abyssinia has case on. Valkyrie sat up. Damn it, she muttered. Five dead sorcerers, Skullduggery said. All connected in some way to Serafina were recovered in Italy yesterday evening. The private ambulance was empty. So she has him. Well, that's wonderful, Valkyrie sighed. What do we do now? 
we talk with China. Any idea why she's been avoiding us? A few, he said. If I can't arrange something by the end of the day, I'm kicking down doors until I get to her. Well, Valkyrie said, getting slowly out of bed. You have fun kicking those doors, OK? I'm still recovering from getting stabbed in the heart. You didn't get stabbed in the heart. Close enough. It was five centimetres away. She went to the mirror, examined the bandage. Five centimetres isn't very much when you're getting stabbed, she said. Anyway, today I'm recuperating and spending time with my sister. What if I require your assistance? Temper will help you. Temper has his duties. What if I require your assistance? If it's really important, give me a call. What if I'm bored and just want someone to talk to? Then you need more friends. Most of my friends are dead. And that's exactly the cheery start to the day I've been looking for. She hung up. Zena was waiting for Valkyrie when she went downstairs. She poured fresh food into the dog bowl and had her breakfast, then went walking through the woods that surrounded the house. Zena disappeared into the undergrowth, darting across her path every now and then on the trail of some mysterious scent. Valkyrie had a late lunch, got in the car and drove to Haggard, where she parked across the road from her old primary school and walked up to the gate barely resisting the urge to go in and take a look around. There'd been an extension built since she was a pupil here, which essentially tripled the size of the place. She wondered if her old classroom was the same, or if her old teachers were still there. More cars pulled up and parents walked over. The end of school was approaching. Stephanie! Valkyrie turned as Hannah Foley came forward, clad in yoga pants and a hoodie her blonde hair tied back into a ponytail. Valkyrie realised they were hugging a few seconds after it started. Oh, Valkyrie said. Hi. Hannah stepped back, hands on her stomach and a smile on her face. How are you? Chaney Mac, I haven't seen you in ages. Chaney Mac indeed, said Valkyrie. The way Hannah was patting her belly... It was like she was inviting Valkyrie to comment on the rather obvious pregnancy. Instead, Valkyrie said, So what have you been up to? Well, I'm pregnant, Hannah said, laughing. I know what you're thinking. Again? I just can't get enough of it. I didn't know you had a child here. I don't, said Valkyrie. I've got a sister. A sister? Hannah said, clearly astonished. What age is she? Seven. That's quite a gap. I suppose so. So tell me about you, Steph. What are you doing with yourself? Valkyrie kept her smile. Keeping busy? At what? Sure, you don't even need a job, do you? Don't you have your uncle's money? I remember everyone talking about that back in school. We were all so jealous that you were a millionaire. We couldn't understand why you kept coming in, though. <laughs> Valkyrie nodded along while Hannah laughed and said, Money can't buy friendship. Ah, now this is true, Hannah said. And it can't buy happiness either. Isn't that what they say? I've definitely heard it said. I mean, don't get me wrong. I imagine it was wonderful to suddenly be rich. But wait till you start having children, Stephanie. Then you'll find out what real happiness is. Yeah. I'm due to pop with this one in six weeks. Though knowing me, it'll probably arrive a few days early. She laughed again, like that was funny, and Valkyrie sneaked a glance at her watch. No engagement ring, I see, Hannah said, calming down. Is there no one special in your life, or has he just not bothered to get a claim in? I'm not looking to get married, said Valkyrie. Oh, you should, Stephanie, you should. Marriage was the best thing that ever happened to me, after becoming a mom, of course. Of course. Finding someone special. Sharing your life with them, bringing life into the world. That's true happiness. You can have all the money you ever wanted. You can have millions and billions, but if you don't have a family of your own, what's the point? Isn't that right? Valkyrie gave a tight-lipped smile and shrugged with her eyebrows. Hannah took in Valkyrie's car. Is this yours? A bit too flashy for me. You wouldn't fit a baby seat in the back. That's mine over there, the people carrier. We're determined to fill it, as you can probably tell. You certainly have a lot of children. 
It's hard work, believe me. On one level, I envy you. Your time is your own. You have no responsibility. You can head off on holiday whenever you want. But there is no way I would trade places. I just wouldn't. You look like you don't believe me. Valkyrie was pretty sure her expression was completely neutral. Anna continued. I didn't inherit millions, but I'm rich in kisses and hugs and smiles and laughter and love. Valkyrie blinked at her. Right then. The bell rang, signalling the end of the school day, and suddenly there were kids swarming out of the door. It was alarming. Stephanie! Alice squealed, launching herself into Valkyrie's arms. Valkyrie laughed, picked her up as easily as you'd pick up a doll. She turned to Hannah. Well, gotta go. Good luck with the pregnancy thing. Oh, thank you. Janie, I'm an old pro by now. Valkyrie hurried to the car before Hannah could invite her to meet her child. Who's that? Alice asked from the back seat as she buckled her belt. An old friend of mine. Is she a mummy? She is. Why aren't you a mummy? Because I don't want to be. Why did she call you Janie? Valkyrie smiled. She didn't. She meant Janie Mac. It's just something people say. What people? Irish people, Valkyrie said, pulling out onto the road. Why do they say it? I'm not sure. It's just something they say. Why don't you want to be a mummy? Because children are gross and yucky. Alice laughed. I'm a child. No, you're not, said Valkyrie. You're like 80. Alice giggled. I'm not 80. I'm seven. Are you sure? Yes. I could have sworn you were 80. I'm only seven. Then why do you look so old? I don't look old. Valkyrie pointed at an old woman they were driving past. See her. The old woman with the wrinkly face and all that loose and saggy skin. You look exactly like her. Alice gasped theatrically. Is that what I'm going to look like when I'm your age? Oi! Valkyrie said, and Alice giggled. And Valkyrie found herself struggling to keep her smile. In eighty years' time, Alice might very well end up looking like that, while Valkyrie wouldn't have changed one little bit. She shook the thought from her mind. Want to grab a milkshake on the way home? Alice cheered. Chapter 33 In the small room filled with cleaning equipment on the east side of the Lacuna underground car park, the wall rumbled and slid open, revealing the tunnel beyond. Tantalus peered into the darkness and frowned. This leads into the dark cathedral. Yes, it does, said Sebastian. The cathedral is full of secret passageways like this. And how did you know about it? Sebastian shrugged. I told you. I've had an interesting past. Tantalus turned to him. Oh, you're one of them. You're a disciple of the Faceless Ones. You're one of Creed's agents sent to take us down from within. Tantalus, come on, Bennett said. Why would Archcanon Creed even care about what we're doing? Tantalus glared. For one thing, we're about to break into his cathedral and steal one of his artefacts. For another... If Dark S returns, then everyone will turn away from his gods and start worshipping her, just like we do. I'm not working for Creed, Sebastian told him. And what does it really matter how I know that this tunnel is here? We have a way in, don't we? So why are we standing around talking about it when we could be finding the scythe? Tantalus raised his finger, pointed it right into Sebastian's face, so close it almost tipped against his mask. I don't trust you. You've got secrets. We all have secrets. Not like yours. You won't tell us where you're from or what you're after. I want to bring Dark Hess back, just like you. Guys, said Bennett, we don't have an awful lot of time here. Shut up, Bennett, said Tantalus. The beaked weirdo here may have won over you and your equally gullible friends, but I'm not so stupid. I've been watching you, Plague Doctor. I've been listening to you. You think you have all the answers, don't you? Not even remotely. And after all this time, you still won't let us see your face. Why is that? Tantalus, said Bennett, we've been through this. The plague doctor's uniform is a pressurised suit that keeps him alive. 
If he takes it off, he dies, OK? Now, if we're going to go through the tunnel like we planned, can we please do it before we're discovered and someone calls the city guard? What do you say? Tantalus glared again, then grunted and clicked his fingers, summoning flame into his hand. Bennett did the same, and Sebastian took out a torch and flicked it on. They walked along the tunnel, pushing the darkness ahead of them, watching it squeeze by and fill up the space behind. What are we going to do when we get into the cathedral? Bennett asked. I mean, we probably shouldn't split up, right? We're splitting up, said Tantalus. Oh, we'll find the side faster that way. Plus, we'll have less chance of being caught. But if we are caught, Bennett argued, staying together would make it easier to fight our way out. Tantalus scowled. We won't have to fight our way out if we're not caught in the first place. Bennett, I told you not to come. I knew you'd do this. Do what? I'm not doing anything. You don't want to split up because if you're caught, you know you can't fight. I can fight. Closing your eyes and flailing your fists is not fighting. I don't fight like that. Yes, you do. It's ridiculous. And so are you. Hey, Sebastian interjected. Hey, let's calm down. I'm not ridiculous, Bennett muttered. What was that? Tantalus said, stepping closer. What was that you said? I said I'm... I'm not ridiculous. Really? Tantalus said and laughed. So, out of everyone here, Bennett, whose wife left him for a hollow man, eh? Granted, we don't know if the plague doctor's wife left him for a hollow man because we don't know anything about the plague doctor. I'm not married, Sebastian said. But we know for certain that my wife didn't leave me for a walk and bag of green gas because I left her years ago. So that only leaves you, Bennett, as the most ridiculous man here. Bennett blinked quickly and said nothing. They carried on walking. Sebastian glanced at Bennett. His head was down and his lip was quivering. There was an unspoken rule in the group that nobody should mention what happened between Bennett's wife and the hollow man. A rule that Tantalus had just hurled to the floor and kicked to death. Ten minutes later, they came to a wall. All right, Tantalus said. How do we get through? Look for a switch, said Sebastian, moving his hands over the surface. Tantalus sounded surprised. You mean the all-knowing plague doctor doesn't know where it is? It'll be here somewhere. I am shocked, Tantalus said. My faith in humanity has been destroyed. Who will I believe in now that the omnipotent plague doctor has revealed himself to be just another... Will you stop? Bennett shouted. Will you just stop? Tantalus turned to him. What? I am sick of the sarcasm and the constant petty remarks, Bennett said. What are you, a child? No, forget that. My son was never as bad as you. OK, we get it. You feel threatened by the plague doctor's presence. Tantalus bristled. I'm not threatened. But you know what the rest of us are doing while you're acting out? We're getting on with things. Yes, we don't know what he looks like. Yes, we don't know much about him. But he has brought more purpose to our little group in the last seven months than we've had in the last seven years. So get over it, all right? Don't. Don't you speak to me like that. You can't order me around, Tantalus. You know why? Because we're about to go sneaking through a very scary place run by some genuinely dangerous people. If we're caught... Do you know what's going to happen to us? I don't. No one does. Because people who go sneaking through these kinds of places are generally never heard from again. Faced with this situation, do you really think I'm going to be intimidated by a bully like you? Bennett, you'd better. I'd better what? Bennett said, stepping right up to Tantalus. I'd better watch my mouth or you'll insult me again. You'll mock me. You'll bring up the fact that my wife left me for a hollow man. Go ahead. You know something? I'm glad Odetta is with Conrad because I was a lousy husband. He can at least give her the love and comfort that I never could. That's my fault. That's on me. But you don't get to use that against me. You understand? You ever mention them again and I would close my eyes and flail my fists. Yeah, it may not be the coolest way to fight, but I can guarantee you some of that flailing will actually hit you. So go ahead, Tantalus. Make my day. The tunnel was cold and quiet as Tantalus decided on his next move. 
He turned away. You're ridiculous, he said. Yeah, Bennett said. I'm ridiculous. You are. That's right. So ridiculous. Yeah. Sebastian waited until they'd finished, then said, I found the switch. They didn't say anything to that, so he pulled the lever and the wall parted like curtains. They stepped through into an empty corridor, the overhead lights flickering on as the tunnel sealed behind them. There was no more arguing. They were deep in enemy territory. Tantalus turned to them. You know what we're looking for? Lily said the sides on display with a bunch of other faceless ones junk. Once we have it, we send out a message and we all meet back here. If someone sees you, pretend that you're meant to be here. Act casual. Only run as a last resort. Bennett, you go left. Plague doctor, you go right. I'm going this way. Questions? Okay. He took a deep breath. Good luck. They split up. Sebastian found some stairs and followed them to a higher floor. The cathedral was quiet. He ducked back when people passed, clergy mostly. They wore red with black piping, stylish robes designed to attract potential worshippers, a stark contrast to the drab garments worn by the archcanon Damocles' creed. Stop! Sebastian froze. Turn round! Slowly! Sebastian did as he was instructed. Two cathedral guards approached, their black armour moulded to their pecs and their eyes glaring from beneath their helmets. Who are you meant to be? One of them asked. Um, I'm the plague, doctor, Sebastian said. How do you do? Take off the mask. I'm afraid I can't do that for health reasons. Are you meant to be here? Yes, definitely. Do you have a pass? They said they'd get me one, but they haven't yet. They told me to wait here. Who told you? Uh, Jimmy and Clive. The guards glanced at each other. Then the talkative one pressed a button on the wall and a security door slid down behind Sebastian, leaving him with nowhere to run. They came closer. Put your hands over your head. But that's where my hat is. Put your hands up. Hey! Another cathedral guard said, coming up behind them. What's going on? Who is this? The other two stood to attention. We caught an intruder, ma'am. We're bringing him in for interrogation now. I'm not an intruder, Sebastian said. I'm waiting for Jimmy and Clive. I don't know a Jimmy or a Clive, the female guard answered. You don't? Sebastian said. Jimmy's short. Clive's tall. Clive has a moustache and he walks with a limp. You're sure you don't know them? Pretty sure, she said, and gestured to the security door. Why is this shot? Uh, this is what we're meant to do if we find an intruder, said the talkative one. It's standard operating procedure. Oh, yeah, said the female guard. So it is. She kicked the guard behind her just spun and threw her leg up and whacked it into his head. She continued the spin, dropped low, swept the first guard's legs from under him. He fell and she swung her staff into his face so hard his helmet flew off and now both guards were unconscious. She straightened up, took off her helmet and turned to Sebastian. Now, said Tanith Lowe, just who the hell are you? Chapter 34 Sebastian did his very best not to wave. You can call me the Plague Doctor, he said. Tanith nodded. The Plague Doctor? Right. What's your real name? That's the only name you need to know, Sebastian said, and squawked a little when Tanith grabbed the beak of his mask and yanked it down low, bending him over. She started pulling him in a circle. I'm afraid that's not going to cut it, she said. I'll have to insist. Sebastian tried to pull her hands away, but she was twisting his mask and it was hurting his neck. Ow, stop! Please, I'm the plague doctor. You don't need to know my name. With her other hand, she battered the hat from his head and wrapped her knuckles on his mask. It echoed loudly in his ears. 
Don't try to tell me what I need, all right? Who are you? And why were you sneaking around? Why are you sneaking around? Sebastian countered, because it seemed like a good idea at the time. She twisted his beak again, and he cried out, again. I'm sneaking around because I'm here to do bad things, Tanith said. Why are you here? I have to steal something. What? I can't tell you. Why do you have to steal it? I can't tell you that either. He finally broke free, stood up to his full height, and readjusted the mask, glaring at her through the glass eye holes. I'm here, he said, on a secret mission. It looks like you are here on a secret mission too. I can't tell you what my mission is, just like I'm sure you can't tell me what your mission is. I'm here to kill someone. Sebastian blinked. Oh, it's, it's not me, is it? Well, I don't know, said Tanith. Maybe it is. What's your name? If it's not the name of my target, I'll let you live. Really? You think I'm that stupid? I'm not telling you my name, and that is final. He didn't know why he did it, but as he was speaking, he watched his hand come up, one finger extended, and as he said the word final, he prodded Tanith once in the chest. He immediately regretted it. He regretted it even more when she grabbed that finger and twisted, forcing him to his knees. Please! he cried. Don't break my finger! I needed to point at stuff! Your name. I can't tell you. Your name. Sebastian, he howled. Sebastian Tau. She released him and he cradled his hand. Hello, Sebastian, she said. Hello, Tanith, he moaned. You know who I am, then? He got up. Yes, of course, everyone knows who you are. And you're not going to ask why I'm here to kill someone. I don't have to, Sebastian said. I know you're a knife in the darkness. I know you went back to them after Desolation Day. If you're here to assassinate someone, I'm sure they have it coming. You seem to know a lot about me. Well, said Sebastian, shaking out his sore hand, I know a lot about a lot of people. It's one of my gifts. I promise you... We're on the same side. I'll make up my mind about that. Seeing as how you know so much, Sebastian, do you know how to get this security door open? I can crack just about any lock, but this door doesn't seem to have one. Is that where your target is? It will be. I think that's where I have to go too. Maybe we could team up? Yeah? You want to help me kill someone? Um, well, not quite, but actually I was thinking more along the lines of you protecting me until I find what I have to find. Then we kind of go our separate ways. Tempting, said Tanith. So tempting. Or I kill you. Sebastian frowned. What? Why would you kill me? Because you know who I am. You might tell someone. I won't, I swear. I want to believe you, Sebastian. I do. You have an honest mask. But look at this from my point of view. Life would just be a lot easier if I kill you before you have a chance to mess anything up for me. Unless I know how to open this door, right? Like, if I open the door, you don't kill me? I don't kill you. At all? Right now. Sebastian hesitated, then nodded. I'll open the door. Because I trust you. It's nice to be trusted. He went to the spot on the wall he'd seen the cathedral guard press and found the button. The security door slid open. Tanith put her helmet back on and marched in. Sebastian followed. What are you doing? Tanith asked. Coming with you, said Sebastian. I thought you wanted me not to kill you. Tanith, listen. I can't tell you what I'm after. Actually, I can. It's a scythe they have in their collection here, but I can't tell you why I'm after it. You just have to trust that I'm doing the right thing. The right thing for whom, exactly? I probably shouldn't tell you that. 
You're a man of mystery, Sebastian, in a completely non-alluring way. But seeing as how any alarm you raise would alert my target, you can stick with me until you find your scythe. Thank you. Then you get out of my way, she said, or I will kill you. Chapter 35 Valkyrie roamed around downstairs while Alice went to her room to pack a small overnight bag. She stopped at the mirror in the hall, pulled down her T-shirt to check the gauze, then chewed on a leaf to keep the pain away. She went into the living room, smiled at the framed family photographs on the mantelpiece. She came to one of her nana and suddenly missed her terribly. Alice ran in behind her, bag in one hand, sparkles in the other. Will you teach me how to do magic? she asked. Valkyrie turned slowly. What? I want to learn, said Alice. I'm good at learning. Miss Donahue says I'm her prized pupil. What, uh, what kind of magic do you think I know? Alice shrugged. Magic, magic. All right. And why do you think I can do magic? Alice laughed. Because he can. Mom and Dad are always talking about it when they think I'm not listening. But I'm always listening. What else have you heard? Skullduggery is magic, and he's a real skeleton, but I'm not supposed to say that to anyone except you and Mom and Dad. You get hurt a lot. Do I? That's what Mom says. And Dad tells her that you're big and strong and able to handle yourself. Sometimes Mom cries about it. I see. So will you teach me? Valkyrie hesitated, then sat. I don't know if I should. Some magic is dangerous. It can hurt you. I'll be very careful. I know you will. But some magic can hurt you even if you're the most careful person in the world. Then don't teach me that magic, Alice said. Teach me the safe magic. Sweetie, I don't know if I can. Maybe when you're older. When I'm eight? Maybe a little bit older than that. I was twelve when I first learned magic. But that's ages away. That's, she counted, five years away. You're very smart. I know, Alice said and grinned and then looked serious. But that's too long. I want to learn now. I can't teach you until you're twelve. Sorry, it's the rules. Then can you show me magic? Um, well, I suppose so. Valkyrie held up her hand and sent energy crackling between her forefinger and thumb. Wow! said Alice. Can I touch it? No, Valkyrie said. It had hurt a lot. You ready to go? Alice held up her bag. Yes. Is Sparkles ready to go? Alice held up Sparkles. Yes, she is. Valkyrie's phone rang. It was Skullduggery. Hold on just a second, she said, and answered. What's up? China's free for a chat in an hour, Skullduggery said. She can finally see you. She doesn't know it yet, but yes. Valkyrie stood up. You don't have an appointment, do you? No, but I took a look at her schedule and she doesn't have an appointment either. So what do you say we drop by unannounced? I can't, said Valkyrie. I'm with Alice. Bring her with you. Skullduggery responded. China hasn't met her yet, has she? It'll be a good icebreaker. We'll probably need one. There's no way I'm doing that. I need you there, Valkyrie. China actually likes you. I'm not going to get any answers if you're not there. Valkyrie smiled down at her sister. I don't have a babysitter. Alice will be fine on her own. She's seven. That's not old enough to be left alone. No, it isn't. Then can you drop her back to your parents? I'm in Haggard right now. I said I'd take her for the night, remember? It's their anniversary. Oh. Well, how about asking Fergus and Beryl to mind her? What? No, I would never do that to her. Isn't there anyone else? He asked, 
I need my partner with me. Valkyrie sighed. Unless you know of anyone offering a babysitting service, I can't think of... Valkyrie? She shrugged. I thought of someone. Oh, Skullduggery said. Me too. Chapter 36 Omen raised his hand to volunteer, and Mr. Peckant chose someone else. Omen put his hand down. He'd known the answer. It wasn't often that a teacher asked a question in class that Omen knew the answer to, so he liked to seize the chance whenever it cropped up. But teachers, like life, had a habit of passing him by. October Klein gave the wrong answer, which turned out to be the right answer, and Omen was glad now that he hadn't been picked, but still felt aggrieved nonetheless. He sank lower in his chair and deeper into despondency. Never had been right. Omen had been waiting for Skullduggery and Valkyrie to call him to adventure, and of course they were never going to do that. The last time was a fluke. They'd needed someone inconspicuous to spy on a group of students. That was a very specific set of circumstances, unlikely to ever be repeated. Omen had to face it. He'd had his adventure. It had been terrifying and exhilarating and brilliant and terrifying, and then it had ended. Skullduggery and Valkyrie and Augur were bottomless cups into which adventure could be poured and they would never fill up. Omen's cup had already spilled over, and as usual he was left with a soggy mess and a widening puddle. He turned to Never a few seats away and mouthed the words, you were right. Never frowned back at him and mouthed, What? You were right. I was white? You were right. About what? What you said. What did I say? About me wasting my time, waiting to be called on another adventure. Never stared. What? The stuff we were talking about last week. Use shorter sentences, Muppet. You were right. I got that much. About me. Yes. Wasting my time. Please hurry up. Waiting for adventure. You're waiting for adventure. 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 I was right about you waiting for adventure. Yes. Never frowned. I know. Oh. That's why I said it. I just wanted you to know that I agree with you. What? I agree with you. So? I wanted you to know that. Is that all? Yes. Can we stop doing this now? Okay. Never nodded and went back to paying attention to whatever Peckant was saying, while Omen thought a little more about what he'd been thinking about. When he'd finished, he tried to catch up with the rest of the class, but they were all scribbling furiously. Mr. Darkly, Peckant said. Omen looked up. Yes, sir? You look confused. No, sir. You're not confused. No, sir. So that's just your face then, is it? Yes, sir. That's good to know, Peckant said, and went back to whatever it was he was doing. Omen managed to not get in trouble until the bell rang for the end of school. He went to talk to Never, but she turned a corner and vanished, leaving him alone in the crowd. He saw Mahala approaching, and he shrank back, 
barged into some first years, finally stumbled to the bench along the wall. He sat, watching her pass, digging for his phone to call Augur. But then his brother appeared. Mahala didn't attack him. Come to that. Her eyes weren't glowing green. Omen watched them talk, very intently, and then Augur nodded, smiled grimly, and watched Mahala hurry away. If that had been Omen standing there, the crowd would have thrown him about like a leaf in a stream. But the stream parted for Augur. Augur saw him and raised a hand in greeting, then came over, sat beside him on the bench. I see you've got Mahala back, Omen said. Yes, said Augur, and a moment passed and he nodded. Yes. Um, how's she doing? She's good. She's doing okay. Back to normal, at least. She's blaming herself for everything she did when she was possessed, but I think that's only natural. And the thing that was possessing her, did you banish it back to the hell it came from, like you'd planned? Augur hesitated. Not quite. Oh. We got the spirit out of Mahala, which was great, but then it went into Case. So now Case is possessed, and he's like extra angry. So if you see him and his eyes start glowing, just run, OK? Just get the hell out of there. I'll do that. I'll take care of it, you know. I just need a little time to come up with a new plan. Any help I can give? I know, dude. Thanks. He shook himself out of his sombre mood. So, hey, who's this mortal girl you've been showing around the school? Omen sighed. Of course you heard about that. Her name's Ornia. Do you like her? She's very nice. You gonna see her again? I don't know. Hopefully. I, I mean, it can't go anywhere, I know that. Why not? Are you kidding? Omen asked and laughed. Can you imagine what'd happen if Mum and Dad heard about it? So what if they freak out? Don't listen to them, dude. She's still a person, right? You're allowed to like her. I don't think I am, though. When you fall in love with a necromancer girl, or you start to date a mermaid, they pretend not to notice. But if I tried to go out with a mortal girl from another dimension, they'd be terrified that it had tarnished the darkly name. Hey, Ogre said, holding up a finger. I never dated the mermaid. We just... hung out. I always meant to ask you about that, actually. Ah, Ogre said with a shrug. Don't. Omen laughed. You know something? I can't wait for you to face the King of the Darklands, because can you imagine what they'll be like once you beat him and the prophecy is complete? All those centuries of waiting and expectation will be over, and they'll no longer be the parents of the Chosen One. They'll just be normal sorcerers again. I can't wait to see their faces when they realise that. Augur nodded, but Omen noticed that the smile was gone. He softened his tone. Um, what are you going to do afterwards? He asked. After I face the king, Augur said, assuming I survive. You will survive, said Omen, frowning. You have to. They don't make prophecies about people who fail. They make them about heroes, heroes who win. I've been thinking about this more and more, said Augur, looking around. You know... I'm kind of invincible right now. I'm invincible for the next three years until I'm 17 and I go up against the king. Until then, nothing much can stop me. It doesn't mean that I'm not careful. I can still be hurt. I can still be injured. And hell, I can still be killed because as everyone knows, no prophecy is guaranteed. But in general, as long as I'm smart, I'm invincible. That must be pretty cool. It is, mostly. I've been wondering, what happens after? If I defeat the King of the Darklands, I'll emerge alive, yes, but I'll have lost that invincibility. Suddenly I can trip and fall off a cliff, or get hit by a bus, or get sick or something. Suddenly anything can kill me. You'll still have the talents you were born with, said Omen. You'll still be faster and stronger and smarter than most people. But none of that has kept me going, Augur replied. The one thing that has propelled me through all of these crazy adventures I've had 
is the confidence that I'll survive them. That's my secret. It's not power or ability. It's just, I don't know, pure belief in myself. That's who I am. It kind of defines me. I would love that. I know you would, dude. Sometimes I wonder what you'd be like if you had even a tenth of my confidence. That's what holds you back, you know. Omen waved his hand. We're not talking about me right now. So you think that once the prophecy has been fulfilled and the king is defeated, you'll, what, lose yourself? Maybe, yeah. I never thought about it like that. See, I know who I am right now. I've always known who I am, why I'm here, what I'm meant for. But I don't know who I'll be once it's over. Who do you want to be? Augur looked up suddenly. What? Omen blinked. Did I... Did I say something wrong? No, Augur said, staring at him. It's just... I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. His phone beeped, and he looked at it and sighed. <sighs> the call to action, he said, and stood. Good talking to you, bro. Be careful. He grinned. Invincible, remember? Augur hurried away, and the moment he was out of sight, Omen's phone rang. The screen lit up with Valkyrie's name, and he jumped to his feet. Hello, he said, his mouth dry. Omen, Valkyrie said. Hey. Hi, said Omen. Hi, how are you? Uh, what's up? Is anything wrong? He heard her hesitate. Would you happen to be doing anything right now? Nope. Omen said immediately. Nothing. Are you busy for the next maybe two hours? Three at the most? A teacher walked by and Omen turned away, keeping his head down and talking quietly. I'm free. I'm ready. What do you need? I need your help, to be honest. I'm a bit stuck. He froze. Oh, God! You're trapped? No, no, nothing like that. How are you with kids? Omen frowned. Like, fighting them? What? No, Omen. Minding them. I need a babysitter. You in? He sagged. Omen? The call to action. I'm in, he said. Chapter 37 Valkyrie got changed into her black clothes and zipped her jacket all the way up. On her way downstairs, she glanced through the window, saw Never and Omen standing beside her car. Never was looking irritated and teleported away while Omen was still talking. Valkyrie waited until Omen knocked before opening the door. She waved him in. Hey, she said. Thank you for doing this. Seriously. Of course, he said. Is everything okay between you and Never? He seemed annoyed. Is it me? I know he doesn't like me a whole lot. No, Omen said. No, it's definitely not you. OK, it might be. Just a little, but mostly... I don't know. He's been acting a little odd lately, that's all. Keeping secrets, maybe. We all have secrets. I suppose... Alice poked her head out of the kitchen. Alice, come over here, said Valkyrie. She's not usually this shy. Alice, this is my friend. His name is Omen. Alice hesitated, then hurried over, and Omen waved. Hi, Alice. Alice waved from behind Valkyrie's leg. There's food and drink in the fridge, Valkyrie said, grabbing her car keys, and probably some snacks somewhere in the kitchen. If you want a pizza or something, I think there's a menu floating around, but I'll only be gone for two hours or so. I'll be fine said Omen. We'll be fine. Just put the TV on, Valkyrie said. Or, I don't know, she might want to do homework. Could you help her with that? I think I can manage, Omen said, trying to sound confident. Right, said Valkyrie. OK. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't important, so thank you. No problem. Valkyrie bent down to Alice. I won't be gone long. Omen will take care of you. He's really nice. You'll really like him. 
Is he magic too? She asked. We don't talk about magic, remember? Yeah, but is he magic too? Valkyrie sighed. A little. Omen, don't show her any magic. He nodded. Probably wise. You're going to be nice to Omen, aren't you? You're going to behave and do what he tells you. Yes. When I get back, we'll go to my house and I'll show you your room, OK? That sound cool? Yes. And when you speak to Mum and Dad about this tomorrow... I'm not to tell them you left, Alice said. Good girl. That's very important. Valkyrie straightened up. Right, I'm off. Be good. She left the house, got in her car and drove to Roarhaven. She met Skullduggery in the High Sanctuary's lobby and together they slipped away from the sorcerers who were not doing a good job of keeping a surreptitious eye on them. Using their personal cloaking spheres, they passed between the cleavers standing guard and waited at the double doors to China's Room of Prisms. Skullduggery checked his pocket watch. Any moment now, he said. Valkyrie heard footsteps on the other side, and the handle turned and the left door opened. She dodged back, avoiding the man who came through. He went to close the door after him, but Skullduggery put a hand to it and Valkyrie slipped under his arm. The sorcerer frowned, but Skullduggery was already following Valkyrie in. The door closed behind them. They deactivated their cloaking spheres as they walked between the hundreds of thin columns of mirrored glass. China, reading through a file as she sat upon her throne, gave no indication that she saw their shifting reflections, until she closed the file and leaned back, a single eyebrow arched. Arbiter Pleasant? Arbiter Cain? To what do I owe thee, etc.? It's been a while, China, Skullduggery said. We were almost thinking you were avoiding us. China smiled and stood. Her dress was an extravagant affair, a low-cut thing of purple and indigo, tight everywhere but the sleeves, and studded with beading that slowly changed its colours. Her dark hair was longer than Valkyrie remembered, and arranged in deceptively simple braids. Nothing quite so dramatic, I'm afraid, China said, coming down the steps. I've just been busy. It's not easy running a city and overseeing practically every sanctuary around the world. Every hour brings fresh challenges, disputes, power struggles, even violence. And then we get challenges no one else could have prepared for, like those poor people from the Leibniz universe. Are they all through? Valkyrie asked. Thankfully, said China, kissing her cheek. Our technicians shut down the portal device this morning. Astonishing thing, apparently. Discovering how it works will be quite revelatory. What's going to happen to the mortals? Skullduggery asked. That has yet to be decided. I wish there were an easy option. I wish we could allow them to assimilate with the mortals of our world. But I'm afraid they pose a substantial risk to our continued safety. Come, she said. You look like you have things on your minds. I have to rush off to my next meeting, but we can talk as I get ready. She led them away from the throne. I've heard the first bank of Roarhaven is about to open its doors, Skullduggery said. Congratulations. I know you've been working at this for years. Valkyrie caught China's thin smile reflected in the mirrors. Thank you, China said. All my hard work is finally coming to fruition. I have to admit, Skullduggery continued, I didn't think Grand Mage Vespers was going to pull it off. The last I heard, the entire enterprise was floundering. Where did he find new investors at this late stage? There will always be people willing to take a chance on something they believe in. I heard some of the names of these investors, Skullduggery said. Familiar names, actually. People with 
shall we say, a history. The wall opened before them, and they stepped onto a raised platform. It slowly began to rise into the darkness. You went to Arch Cannon Creed for help, didn't you? said Skullduggery. The members of his church are some of the richest sorcerers in the world. The bank was about to fail before it had even got started, and he convinced his flock to invest and swooped in to the rescue. What did he get in return, I wonder? The Religious Freedom Act, China said, turning to face them. We'll be announcing it next month, but it's already in effect. I see. Can I assume that the Act allows people to practice whatever their faith demands, no matter how murderous it might be? It gives churches autonomy? Yes. Something new flickered behind China's eyes. Doubt, maybe. It makes the grounds of every church sacred, and according to our laws, sacred ground remains outside everyone's jurisdiction. Skullduggery finished, arbiters included. You've given him free reign to do whatever he wants. Actually, we're keeping a very close eye on him, China said. We have insisted that Grand Mage Vespers be allowed to oversee all church practices. Nothing happens without Vespers' consent. And you've got your precious bank. Roarhaven needs it if we ever want to reach our true potential. The platform came to a gentle stop and the doors opened. They walked out into China's chambers, a luxurious apartment on the very top floor of the high sanctuary. Is that why you wanted to talk to me? China asked as she walked towards the bedroom. Finance and investments? Actually, we want to talk to you about Abyssinia. She opened the clasps of her dress and let it fall just as she walked out of sight. Go on, she said. Skullduggery and Valkyrie stayed at the doorway. Abyssinia has spent the last seven months searching for her son, Skullduggery said. A man named Kason. He, in turn, has spent the last few hundred years being experimented on at Serafina's pleasure. Last night, we believe mother and son were reunited. There was no answer from the bedroom. Irritated, Valkyrie walked in. China stood with her back to her, looking at clothes in her vast wardrobe. Kason is the king of the Darklands, Valkyrie said, the one in the Darkly prophecy. Abyssinia's father was the unnamed. China, this is serious. And Skullduggery and I are the only people investigating. We need cleavers. We need you. China turned. Her face wore a slack expression Valkyrie had never seen before. Unguarded. He's still alive, she said softly. Valkyrie frowned. Who is? What? China stood taller, became more alert. She pulled an outfit from the wardrobe, threw it on the bed, began to dress. When the Diablery teamed up with the dead men, she said. Were you told about this? Yes, said Valkyrie. About ten years after Vile betrayed Abyssinia, she turned up alive, started killing people on both sides of the war. The Diablery and the dead men decided to cooperate, tracked her down and killed her. We killed her eventually, said China, pulling on trousers, after battling her for days. She had somehow become extraordinarily powerful in the intervening years. During the course of this battle, I became separated from the others. I didn't stand a chance against her alone, but she didn't kill me. I suppose, in our way, we had been friends. So, we talked. About what? China buttoned her top. Her son. I knew her well enough to recognise genuine love when I saw it. She may have been able to withstand our attacks, and maybe even defeat us. But the boy was vulnerable. 
I offered her a chance to spare his life. How? By sacrificing hers, said China. She would allow herself to die, and her son would live. A fair trade, I thought. Abyssinia, being Abyssinia, had a condition. Which was? China, what was the condition? China looked at her. That I raised the boy in secret, she said. Valkyrie stared. Skullduggery walked into the room behind her. China continued. Naturally, if I'd had any choice in the matter, I would have laughed and walked away. But my life was being threatened, so I assured her that it would be an honour to care for her child. I miraculously escaped her clutches. She told the boy what was about to happen, and he allowed himself to be captured. After which, Valkyrie said, Abyssinia surrendered, and Skullduggery cut out her heart. And I took Kason in, China said. I passed him off as my servant's child, but I was the one who raised him. I've never pictured you as a mother, Valkyrie said, as China put on her shoes. I can be nurturing. I nurtured you when we first met, didn't I? You forced me to do nothing when Serpine was torturing Skullduggery. I meant after that. I'm sure there were moments of nurturing. You might be thinking of someone else. Perhaps, said China. Did Abyssinia tell you who his father was? Skullduggery asked. China looked at him. She said it was Lord Vile, but I never believed it. The pain from Valkyrie's injury was starting to nag at her, so she took a leaf from her pocket and started chewing. What kind of a mother were you to Kason? A wonderful one, I should imagine, China said, crossing to the dresser to change her earrings. I was educational, informative, and succinct. All the hallmarks of a great mum. Thank you. What was he like? Skullduggery asked. China paused. Troubled? I was part of the group that killed Abyssinia after all, so there was a sustained period of adjustment. Nevertheless, he proved himself a capable young man, so I kept my promise, as dangerous as it was. If Meveland had known that the son of Abyssinia was in his own castle, he'd have had him killed without even thinking about it. But it was getting harder and harder to stop Kason from drawing attention to himself, and his hatred of Meveland was growing. So I took him away. We sneaked out under cover of night. I sent word to my brother, who arranged a meeting with Eakin Meritorious. It was agreed that I would provide the sanctuaries with vital information in the war against Mavalent, and I would be allowed to return to Ireland, under strict conditions, of course. Kason is why you defected? Valkyrie asked. Essentially. Huh. I never would have thought it'd be because of someone else. Someone that isn't you, you know? China nodded. Because I'm so legendarily selfish. Well, yeah. So it surprises you to know that I'm capable of sacrificing so much for someone else? It does. I'm actually impressed. China's smile dropped away. Don't be, she said. In this story, I may have come to love the boy, but I revert to my selfish ways eventually. What happened after you defected? China pulled on a jacket. Despite my very best efforts, Kason grew into an angry young man. He hated Mavalent, because he thought Mavalent had forced his father, Lord Vile, to attack his mother, and he hated Skullduggery for subsequently killing her. Sorry about that, Skullduggery. Understandable, he responded. Mavalent was beyond Kason's reach for the moment but Skullduggery proved an easier target. Or so he thought. Skullduggery tilted his head. He came after me. 
and you beat him. Easily and emphatically. You almost killed him, in fact. When was this? I doubt you'd remember. So many people have tried to kill you over the years. Kason would undoubtedly have died of his injuries if a woman named Solace hadn't discovered him on my doorstep and nursed him back to health. They fell in love. How sweet, said Valkyrie. China walked out of the bedroom. They followed. For a long time, I thought the love they shared was enough to heal them both. Not of physical wounds, but the invisible wounds we all carry around with us. Solace was, in her own way, as troubled as Kason. She had been one of Seraphina's handmaidens before fleeing that wretched place. I actually thought they had found their peace within each other. Almost a hundred and sixty years went by. I didn't see much of either of them. And then another one of Seraphina's handmaidens happened to glimpse Solace on a quiet street. A chance encounter that changed everything. They grabbed her? Valkyrie asked. China nodded and took her back to Mevelyn's castle, where Seraphina planned to torture her for her disobedience. Seraphina has a long memory and does so love to torture. And Kaysen went after them, of course. He'd spent his teenage years in that castle. He knew every secret it possessed. He sneaked in, intent on his mission to rescue his lady love. But I don't think he could resist the opportunity when it presented itself. What opportunity? Valkyrie asked, frowning. Kaysen killed Mevelent. Skullduggery said. He did, said China. Stabbed him repeatedly to weaken him and then drained his life force. Then he rescued Solace and they returned home. A happy ending. Until Seraphina came knocking on my door, full of questions and accusations. She thought it was Solace who had somehow killed Mevelent, you see, and demanded to know where to find her. I told her the truth, however that it had been Kason who'd done the dreadful deed, and I told her where to find him. You... you betrayed him, Valkyrie said. I warned you that I would revert to my selfish ways. But you raised him like he was your own child. But he wasn't my child, China said. Remember that. She looked at her watch. I have to go. She walked by them. Skullduggery had his head down, as still as a statue. He looked up suddenly. You're the supreme mage, he said. You don't have to worry about being late for an appointment. Who are you meeting that's so important? China smiled coldly. It was so nice to see you both again, she said. Do keep me updated, won't you? And... If you need any help, just ask. The doors slid open silently, and China stepped onto the platform and turned. You can let yourselves out, she said. The doors closed. Valkyrie and Skullduggery looked at each other. Say it, she said. You say it. She's changed. Yes, she has. They walked out onto the balcony, and Skullduggery took Valkyrie in his arms, and they dropped slowly down the side of the building to the street far below. I'm just thinking, Valkyrie said, her head resting on his shoulder. I did recommend more of that. There is a possibility, as weird and unlikely as it may be, that you and China are kind of... Parents, he finished. Yes, she may not be Kason's mother but you could definitely say she's his stepmother, a wicked stepmother, which I think would surprise no one. Does this change anything in how we go forward? It might, Skullduggery replied. China's emotional reserves may never have been overflowing, but they do exist. Her connection to Kason may affect her decisions in this matter. So we can't rely on her, if we ever could. 
And what about you? What about your connection? So we're believing Abyssinia now, are we? No, not believing her, but not not believing her either. I don't know, Valkyrie. I don't know what to think. They touched down on the street. Passers-by gave them guarded looks as they veered round them. Go home, he said. Spend time with your sister. Tell her I said hello. What are you going to do? Temper has promised me an update on the preliminary examination of the portal device. Ooh, Valkyrie said. That sounds like fun. I know you're being sarcastic, but I'm quite looking forward to it. Such a nerd. That's why you love me. She shrugged as she walked off. One of the reasons. Chapter 38 It wasn't easy entertaining a seven-year-old. For one thing, Alice flitted from activity to activity like a bright-eyed butterfly. At first, she seemed content to watch TV, but quickly grew bored. Then she wanted to play a game on her tablet. After that, she wanted Omen to play a game on her tablet and laughed as he tried to figure out what the rules were, what the controls were, and what the point was. Eventually, she asked him if he wanted her to put on a show. She sang two Disney songs, one of them twice, then bits and pieces of Ed Sheeran and a song Omen didn't know. It was cute, but got boring very fast. When Alice swung her arms wide and bowed dramatically, Omen clapped. Well done, he said. That was brilliant. Thank you, said Alice, nodding at his wisdom. What was your favourite part? The bit at the start, and then the middle, and that bit at the end. It was all great. It, it really... Do you want to play hide and seek? Uh, sure. Do you know how to play? I do. Did you used to play hide and seek when you were small? I did, yes, with my brother. Is your brother older or younger than you? He's older, but only by a few minutes. My sister is 18 years older than me. I know. Is my sister your girlfriend? Omen laughed. No, she's much older than me too. Do you have a girlfriend? He thought about it. I think so. What's her name? Ornia. She's very nice. Do you love her? <laughs> Not yet. How can she be your girlfriend if you don't love her? Because I like her a lot. Alice nodded. This answer satisfied her. So, do you want to play hide and seek? Omen asked. No, she said. Do you want me to uh, read you a story or something? Yes. Do you have any books? We keep half of my books in my bedroom. They're for bedtime stories and half in that bookshelf. They're for daytime reading. Well, OK, Omen said, wandering over to the bookcase and hunkering down. What one do you want? Jack's Amazing Shadow? Little Legends? Alice? Which book would you... Alice didn't answer. She was staring out of the back window. Alice, what are you doing? She pointed. There was a man there. Omen straightened up. Where? Outside the window, she said. He was looking in. Fear's cold fingers immediately started to tap their way down Omen's spine. He went to the window. What did he look like? He was old, said Alice. Have you seen him before? She nodded and he relaxed. Oh, good, he said. Where have you seen him before? She pointed behind her. At that window over there. The fear came back. It was probably nothing. It was probably a neighbour or maybe someone had broken down and needed to call a tow truck and they hadn't heard that everyone had mobile phones these days so there was no reason to leave their car. He stepped into the hall and froze. The front door was open. Omen backed away. Alice, he said softly. Alice, come here. 
She wandered over, and he took her hand and knelt down. I want you to be very quiet, he whispered. Can you be very quiet for me? She nodded earnestly. He took out his phone. This is a surprise. Omen cried out and whirled round. Cadaverous Gant stood by the stairs. I was expecting parents, Cadaverous said. Feeble mortal minds that I could command to deliver my message. Instead, I have the lesser of the Darkly brothers. I can't command you, can I? But what do you do when life hands you lemons? You make lemonade. What do you want with me? I don't want you, little boy. I want her. He smiled at Alice. Hello there. Omen pulled Alice behind him. You're making a mistake, he said. A huge mistake. Cadaverous smiled. You see, it's that kind of thinking that meant this has never happened before. Until now, no one bothered to follow Valkyrie home. No one bothered to find out where she lived, who her parents were, if she had any cute and adorable siblings. At first, I fully expect it was because to strike at Valkyrie Kane would be to incur the wrath of Skullduggery Pleasant. But that changed, I think, and suddenly it was the wrath of Valkyrie herself that frightened people off. But I'm not scared of Miss Kane, and I'm not scared of the skeleton. I'm not scared of anyone, now that I come to think about it. Not even Abyssinia. Not any more. Why do you want her? She's only a kid. There's no need for you to worry about the whys and wherefores. I was going to use her parents to deliver the message, but I can just as easily use you. Your corpse will make it even more dramatic, I dare say. Omen darted to the fireplace, grabbed the poker, held it before him in both hands. Stay away! I'm not one for fisticuffs, little darkly. But we both know that I'm strong enough and fast enough to whip that poker out of your hands before you can swing it. So please, have a little dignity in your final moments. Alice, said Omen, when I tell you to, you run to the neighbours, OK? Out of the corner of his eye, Omen saw Alice nodding. Run! Omen yelled and launched himself at Cadaverous. The old man batted the poker away and then slapped Omen so hard he spun and collapsed, his thoughts falling silent for a moment. Dimly aware of cadaverous speaking, when he blinked and looked up again, Alice was walking calmly back into the room. Good girl, said cadaverous. Don't be scared, Alice Edgley. Don't panic. Don't try to run. Omen looked around for the poker but couldn't find it. He clicked his fingers, doing his best to summon a flame into his hand. But all he did was attract Cadaverous's attention. Did you ever think, little Darkly, that perhaps magic just isn't for you? Omen got to his feet. Cadaverous walked towards him, backing Omen into the corner. You don't have to kill me, Omen said. I'll make it quick. You can tie me up or lock me away somewhere. Hush now, Cadaverous told him, and come here. Please don't kill me. Omen's back hit the wall. Tears ran down his face. Cadaverous reached for him and stopped. They stood there, frozen, while Cadaverous considered his options. I'm not going to kill you, he said suddenly. I was going to kill you. I still might but I probably won't. It might be more fun for Cain to come back and listen to your pathetic excuses. He held out his hand. Phone. Omen wiped his eyes. Sorry? Your phone, boy, Cadaverous said. Give it to me. Omen passed it over. Cadaverous dropped it and slammed his heel into it three times. 
Then he took another phone out of his pocket and tossed it to Omen. There is one number in that phone, he said. When Kane gets back, tell her to call it. When is she due home? Uh, half an hour, maybe? Perfect. You are to wait here. You are not to call anyone or alert anyone. You are not to step outside that door. Do you understand me? Yes. If the skeleton comes in with her, make an excuse. Do not let Skullduggery Pleasant know what is going on. Alice's life will depend on it. Okay, I promise. Sit on the couch there, like a good little boy. Sit and wait. Then he was gone. And Alice was gone with him.